So hello friends, this is Bfix. We are back with new fanfiction. So these days we are gonna see. What if Naruto was forgotten son of four? For authors I have given credits to author and starting of the video by. If the original author wishes to reclaim copyright or remove this video, I kindly request before giving copyright strike. Please contact us using the information provided in the pinned comment. We respect and acknowledge authorship rights. And I will delete that specific video by myself. Thank you. So without wasting your time let's move on to the video. I swear, this is the last time I'm letting you drag me to these stupid dances, said a 14-year-old boy with an annoyed expression on his face. The boy had spiky fire red hair, pale skin, three unique whisker marks on his cheeks, and electric blue eyes, along with being surprisingly muscular for his age, while also having several blue runic tattoos along his arms. With his attire consisting of dark reddish-brown steel tube boots, baggy black pants tucked into them, a sleeveless off-white tunic, opera-length fingerless black gloves with red-brown studded leather straps around them, and a blue-gray leather vest. With him currently pulling ribbons out of his hair and wiping lipsticks off his face, before giving his friend an annoyed expression when she kept giggling. It's not funny, Bianca this is already the third time, tonight. The boy said while muttering the latter part, not believing he's been swarmed by three groups of girls already, no matter what he does. It's kind of funny, Naruto, said Bianca, smiling in amusement at the whiskered redeed. Bianca was a 14-year-old girl with long, silky dark brown hair that went down to the middle of her back, an olive skin tone showing her Italian heritage, and dark brown, nearly black, eyes, with her wearing knee-high boots with laces going all the way up them, dark blue jeans, a long sleeve dark purple shirt, and a black tank top with a red skull over it. If you think it's so funny, why don't you go join the rest of the lunatics and surrounding some other poor guy? Retorted Naruto as he ran a hand through his hair, making sure he got all the ribbons out, along with checking if he got all the lipstick off as well. No thanks, it's much more fun watching. Bianca said, only for them to look at a third person snickering from their seat on the bleachers. The person being another boy and was 12 years old with messy and shaggy jet black hair, an olive skin tone, and the same dark brown nearly black eyes as Bianca, wearing black shoes, black jeans, a gray shirt, and a brown aviator's jacket, with him also shuffling several trading cards and a few figurines placed around him. Yeah, you only watch, because you just want to kiss Na said the boy, before Bianca quickly covered his mouth and glared at him with a light blush on her cheeks. Shut it, Nico Bianca hissed, giving her brother a warning look, only for her blush to intensify, when Naruto wrapped an arm around her shoulder and pulled her close. Oh, no need to be shy, Bianca. I already know you're much prettier than any other girl here, so no worries about losing my attention, said Naruto, smirking at her red face before she quickly pushed him. I, I am and not jealous why you see can kiss any G-girl you want. I won't care, said Bianca, crossing her arms while looking away. Does that include you? Naruto asked with his smirk growing, while Naiko laughed at his sister's expression. And Naruto sst stop t teasing me Bianca said, only for the redeed to wrap an arm around her again. Who's teasing? Naruto stated, now smiling at her, making the brunette smile slightly in return. Ugh, if you're both going to do that all night, I'm making a run for it. Naiko said while gagging at how close they were, causing Bianca's eyes to widen before she stepped away from Naruto again. Naiko said Bianca, glaring at her brother, before instantly glaring at Naruto when she he started snickering. It's not funny Bianca said, not liking it when they both tease her like. It's kind of funny, Bianca, Naruto said, making the girl pout at having her words thrown back at her. Before Naruto smiled at the siblings, glad for the chance to have met them after coming to Westover, when he was finally able to escape that place. Huh, it's actually been two years since then, hasn't it? Naruto thought in surprise, realizing it's been two years since he'd gotten away, and managed to hide himself from those people, having never really had any hope that he'd ever be able to escape them, but always looking for an opportunity on where he'd be able to get away. And the opportunity had finally come two years ago, when something big had happened. Something that took their attention off of him long enough to get away. With Naruto refusing to stop running, knowing if he was brought back, things would only get worse. I'm still not sure if I was lucky or not with how she was able to find me, even if she did give some protection. Naruto thought, placing a hand on the side of his neck, where a rune was placed to keep him hidden from anyone searching for him. He hadn't stopped running until he arrived in America, which would be the last place they'd look for him. 
especially this close to New York, but that never got rid of his nervousness that, eventually, they'll catch up and try to drag him back, or if that woman ever showed up and wanted payment for offering her assistance, with Naruto being unsure which would be worse. It had only been after that he met Bianca and Naiko that he started relaxing being able to open up for once, learning how they'd been enrolled into Westover Hall after being picked up by a lawyer in the hotel casino they'd been staying in for a few months, with their enrollment being paid for by a trust fund their parents left them. At least that's what they believed, but Naruto knew the truth, or what he was able to figure out on his own, knowing that whoever the lawyer was, likely wasn't human, and while the trust fund was one of their parents paying for their enrollment, it was most likely from whichever one of their parents that weren't human. And with the aura of darkness and death around them, Naruto could guess just who their father was. And I can only guess the hotel is owned by the Lotus Eaters, meaning a few months was more likely a few decades. Naruto thought when he first realized who Bianca and Naiko were. But despite the danger that had come from just associating with them, he didn't try leaving having come to enjoy being around them, along with the fact they were the first actual friends he's made in his entire life, enjoying how inquisitive Naiko can be about everything, always asking questions and learning new things, as well as his obsession with pirates and his Might the Magic game, something that Naruto still had no idea how it worked. Deciphering and understanding runes was easier than trying to figure that game out, thought Naruto, still feeling the headache he'd gotten when Naiko tried explaining the rules to him. Plus, the whiskered redeed would admit, his pride did take a major blow, when he had never once been able to beat Naiko at the game, which the younger boy never failed to let him forget. Which did end with Naruto hanging him up by his feet in the gym, in nothing but his underwear, something that did get Naiko to stop. Though the two still got along, with Naruto even helping Naiko find the rare Hades figurine he'd been looking for to complete his collection. While Bianca, Naruto couldn't deny that he really enjoyed being around her, along with helping her start coming out of her shell, and become more open and confident in herself, as well as being able to relax more with someone else helping look after her brother, leading to Bianca being able to enjoy more time to herself, rather than always looking after Naiko. So, despite Naruto's desire to not get dragged into anything related to gods, let alone the problems of the Greek gods, he wasn't going to abandon Bianca or Naiko. And with Thorn and Underwood here, I get the feeling more problems will be arriving sooner rather than later. Naruto thought in annoyance, being able to sense Thorn was a monster in disguise, and Grover Underwood, a new transfer student, who he guessed as a satyr. Though, Naruto was pulled from his thoughts when he felt three new people enter the school alongside Underwood, making him look towards the doors with a frown. Naruto, is something wrong? Bianca asked when she noticed his expression, with Naiko look at him as well both of them being confused at what he seemed to be looking at. Nothing, just a weird feeling I got is all, replied Naruto, with Bianca slowly nodding while glancing at where he was looking, not seeing anything out of the ordinary, before looking around the gym to see if something was wrong, having always had a strange sense to feel if something wasn't right. I'm gonna go get a drink. Either of you want one? Naruto asked, looking at the siblings, with Naiko shaking his head as he went back to shuffling his cards. No thanks, I'm good, said Bianca, shaking her head, with the whiskered redeed nodding before he began walking over to the snack table. All while never taking his eyes off the door, sensing Underwood and the three unknown signatures getting closer, having felt them encounter Thorn before continuing on their way. With it not being long before he saw them enter the gym, seeing Underwood with three girls. Reaching at the table, Naruto got a glass of punch while getting a feel for the girls' signatures. Let's see, one of them feels wild and free, like nothing would be able to hold it back if unleashed. I'd say that one is connected to the ocean. The second, that one's a little difficult, but it seems calm and focused as if they're thinking over every possible scenario that could happen the moment they entered the gym. So most likely a child of a war deity or one connected to knowledge and wisdom. And the third Naruto thought, pausing slightly as he felt the third girl's signature, scowling at the familiar feeling of it. The feeling of being in the middle of a storm, the feeling of every cell in your body lighting up with energy and power, the feeling of being in the presence of something truly unstoppable and without mercy, but not just the feeling. It was the scent of ozone that even from here he could smell clinging to the girl, the same scent he knew clung to him as well. Lightning, thought Naruto, 
hating the feeling and the memories it brought up before taking a deep breath, knowing he couldn't lose control of himself. Turning to face the now-identified demigods in Satter, Naruto saw the girls that felt like lightning, drag Underwood onto the dance floor, and tried blending in with the students. While the girl that felt like the sea and the calm girl remained off to the side, talking with each other. Crossing his arms, Naruto looked at the two girls, until the calm one soon caught him staring making the sea girl look at him with narrowed eyes, before he gave them a mocking wave causing their eyes to whiten even more so when he walked over to them, which also gave him a better look at them. Both of them looked to be 14 years old, with the first girl having long curly honey blonde hair that went down past her shoulders, tan skin, a slender and athletic body, and captivating storm gray eyes that shined with curiosity and intelligence. Her attire consisted of black boots, navy blue jeans, a dark red shirt and a gray jacket over it. She also had a necklace with several clay beads and a college ring on it, and the second girl having long black hair at the top that changed to violet tips at the bottom, large ocean green eyes akin to emeralds that shine through her pale skin, wearing a dark blue long sleeve jacket over a gray hoodie a violet t-shirt underneath, a blue skirt that hit her black sport shorts, and lastly violet socks, worn under a pair blue and white running shoes. Hello there, Naruto said in a similar manner to a certain GD master, while smiling at the two girls, who quickly shook off their shock at him coming over to them. Hello, said the blonde girl, looking at him with a calculating look in her eyes. H hi, the black-haired girl said warily. This may seem forward, but would either of you lovely ladies care for a dance? Naruto asked with a short bow as he held his hand out, surprising the girls again before they traded a look, with the blonde girl soon taking his hand. Sure, as long as you don't mind dancing with Andy, afterwards. The girl replied, causing the now named Andy to glare at her, with Naruto merely smirking. I'd be more than happy to dance with two beauties such as yourselves, Naruto said with a wink, with the two blushing lightly at the compliments, before the black-haired girl immediately scoffed. Yeah, not in a million years, Annabeth, though you're more than welcome to spend the night with the Casanova, Andromeda said with a scowl before stalking off into the crowd, with the duo staring at her, with the now-named Annabeth looking a bit guilty, knowing that she had been pushing a button, there, before Naruto guided the blonde girl onto the dance floor, placing one hand on her hip and taking her hand with his other, while her free hand went to his shoulder. Naruto Uzumaki. Naruto introduced as the two began dancing. Annabit Chase, and sorry about Andromeda, she's a good person. But she was betrayed by a guy we both had a crush on a couple years back, with the wound still being rather fresh. Replied Annabit, still having a calculating look in her eyes, as if she was trying to solve a new puzzle. Well, Annabit Chase, would you mind telling me what three demigods are doing here? Especially two of the big three's demigods, said Naruto, making Annabit freeze in shock before quickly shaking her head. You know, Annabit stated, not expecting him to be aware of the gods, given how Grover had just told them that neither Naruto nor the D'Angelos were aware of their heritage. But now the Yuzumaki's admitting he knows, even more so, he can somehow tell Andromeda and Thalia were children of the big three. I'm aware, it's also not that hard when none of you are suppressing your energy. I'm sure Thorne already knows about you as well. Naruto replied, surprising her again at his knowledge. How do you know Thorne's a monster? Why haven't you dealt with him? Yet, if you already know? Were you trained before? Have you been to camp? Questioned Annabeth, unable to help herself in getting answers about how he knows so much already. In order, it's not that hard to sense monsters when you know what they feel like, not help that he makes no effort to hide his distaste for demigods. I haven't dealt with him because he hasn't done anything, yet, and I'd prefer not revealing myself unless absolutely necessary. I have been trained before, and no, I've not been to any camp, said Naruto, with Annabeth nodding slowly. That makes sense, I guess, as there'd be no telling if he's working for someone if he's gone this long without making a move. It'd be good to see if he'd have any useful information or lead us to whoever he's working with, Annabeth said, making Naruto smile at her. Beautiful and smart, I'm guessing that means you're a daughter of Athena, Naruto stated, making the blonde girl blushing at the compliment. While she, Andromeda, and Thalia were some of the most beautiful women in Camp Half-Blood, that weren't children or descendants of Aphrodite. They had little to no experience with dating or being in a relationship, given Thalia's and Andromeda's status as the children of Zeus and Poseidon, respectively, made them practically unapproachable. While she was the considered one of the most intelligent of her mother's children, and the counselor of Cabin Six, 
putting her in a similar situation to Thalia and Andromeda, giving them rather low tolerance to flirting and teasing. The closest that any of them had to an actual relationship was Thalia's brief relationship with Luke, as well as her and Andromeda once having a one-sided crush on Luke prior to his betrayal. Only for Thalia and Luke's relationship to be very short-lived with Thalia being turned into a tree. Nor were they in a situation to really go anywhere with it, given how they were on the run from monsters and various gods. While whatever feelings that Andromeda had developed for Luke from him being her mentor and first true friend in Camp Half-Blood, immediately turned to hate. After he nearly killed her after the quest to reclaim the Master Bolt. With the pain and trauma from being betrayed by someone she was romantically interested in such a way caused Andromeda to develop a disdain for being in a relationship and a slight case of androphobia. The only exceptions being Chiron, Grover, her father, and her half-brother Tyson, once she warmed up to the latter. That was actually the reason why Annabeth tried to push for Naruto to dance with her, as well. Having hoped to use this dance as a form of shock therapy, while well, convince Andromeda to find a guy to dance with, before they noticed Naruto staring at them. Why yeah, I am. And do you know who your parent is? Annabeth asked, interested in learning who his godly parent is, unable to place who it could be. She'd almost say it was Zeus, given how similar his eyes were to Thalia's own, but couldn't be sure. Yes, I know the bastard, said Naruto with his smile dropping, making Annabeth frown at this, seeing he apparently didn't get along with his father, if she guessed right. Who is it? Questioned Annabeth, knowing it helped narrow down the list, but still couldn't see any defining features. Not to mention being confused at the tattoos he had. You really don't want to know. Naruto replied, with the daughter of Athena's frown deepening, but relented, aware that a lot of demigods didn't get along with their godly parents, only for her to suddenly freeze as her eyes widened. They're gone, Annabeth said, looking to where Bianca and Naiko were, only to see they were gone. With Naruto quickly letting her go and whirling around, but saw that both of them were gone, making him mentally curse at not paying more attention. You get your friends, I'll find them said Naruto as he took off running before Annabeth could say anything, leaving her to simply not, as she looked for where her friends were, but saw Andromeda was gone as well. By the god's seaweed brain, why do you always do that? Annabeth thought, groaning that Andromeda's likely run off to save Bianca and Naiko herself. Shaking her head, Annabeth quickly looked around for Thalia and Grover before running through the crowd to see where they danced off to. With Naruto. Naruto had run out of the gym and began searching for any sign of the Dai Angelos or Thorn, only to not find any trace of them in the school, before finding his way to the entry hall, scowling in anger when he saw a few black spikes that were about a foot long. The Yuzumaki grabbed one, catching the faint scent of poison coming off of it, along with one that had a few drops of blood. If he hurt them, I'm going to tear his fucking head off Naruto mentally swore before going outside, finding several tracks in the snow leading into the woods. Following the path, which was lit by old-fashioned lamplights, Naruto held up his hand, and soon heard the sound of an object flying through the air, not reacting as a war axe flew into his waiting hand, with the blade being a dark grey color with a golden inlaid silver edge with runes along it, a wooden shaft with golden designs reinforcing it, and a matching golden pommel. With his weapon in hand, Naruto ran down the path while sensing Bianca, Naiko, and thorn up ahead, along with the girl who felt like the sea, only to run faster when he also sensed the other two girls and Underwood moving towards them as well. Not doubting that Thorn will likely have called or summoned allies, if he'd taken Bianca and Naiko, before he soon entered into a clearing only for his eyes to widen at seeing Thorn. Now in his true form of a manticore, standing near a cliff with Bianca, Naiko, the other demigods, and the satyr. While hovering behind them was a fully armed, sleek black military-style airship, with what he guessed were rocket launchers. Fucking perfect thought Naruto, not believing that two children of the big three couldn't handle a single manticore. Spotting a discarded spear and shield, likely one of the demigods lost their weapon, Naruto already had a plan forming before he held his axe up, with the Yuzumaki immediately throwing it right at the helicopter's propellers before he ran towards the spear. The sudden projectile flying past them surprising Thorn, the demigods and the satyr. Even more shocking was when the axe embedded itself in the propellers, which soon became encased in ice, causing the helicopter to begin falling down towards the sea. With Naruto soon reaching the spear and grabbed it, before pulling his arm back and throwing it straight at Thorn. What? Who a thorn shouted in anger at the sight of his helicopter being destroyed, only to scream in pain when the spear stabbed right through his abdomen, shocking the demigods and Satter again. 
What just happened? Andromeda yelled in disbelief, wondering how they suddenly went from being surrounded to the helicopter being destroyed, and Thorn being hit by Thalia's spear. I just had to save your asses, that's what happened said Naruto, narrowing his eyes at the demigods, making everyone look at him. And Naruto? WHWH what what just happened? What is going on? What was that thing you threw? Bianca said, freaking out over what's happening. First being taken hostage by their vice principal, then a girl with a sword shows up and is then taken hostage to, before going on about demigods and monsters, only to be knocked down by some invisible girl, with another showing up with a spear and shield, along with the new transfer student who had goat legs. Now her friend Crush shows up, throws something at a helicopter that covers it in ice, before throwing a spear at whatever Thorn was. The brunette honestly wasn't sure if she's hallucinating or having some crazy nightmare, anymore. Hey Bianca, I'm really sorry I got here late, but I promise I'll explain everything. But first Naruto said turning back towards Thorn, grabbing the spear still stabbed through him, making the mandaker growl in pain and anger. You're gonna tell me why exactly you tried kidnapping my friends, Thorn, and please talk quickly, I get angry when those I care about are threatened, said Naruto crouching down and glaring at Thorn, with the monster returning the glare. Yuzumaki I should've realized you were one those fools I can smell their stench on you Thorn growled, making the whiskered redeed smile coldly, before twisting the spear again. If you know what I am, then you should know compared to the majority of my kind, even the half-bloods, I'm one of the very few nice ones. That can change very quickly if you don't give me what I want. Naruto said, the mandaker merely growling in anger while slowly lifting his tail up to strike the Yuzumaki in the back. Watch out Annabeth yelled, seeing Thorn's tail about to stab Naruto. Dai roared Thorn as his tail lunged forward, only for him to be shocked when Naruto's hand shot out and wrapped around the base of his stinger, before screaming in pure agony when he squeezed it tightly. That was your last mistake. Naruto stated standing up, before with single pull, he ripped Thorn's tail off, much to the shock of the demigods, while Thorn's screams grew louder. Before Naruto held out his hand, recalling his axe, shocking the group even further, that he could summon his weapon like that. That's so cool Thalia muttered, wishing she could summon her spear like that. Awesome you can throw your axe and then summon it. It's like in those comics of that guy with the hammer said Naiko in excitement and amazement, with Naruto resisting the urge to roll his eyes at the ironic comparison. The general will have your head boy Thorn growled, glaring hatefully at Naruto. Your titan masters can try and fail. Naruto retorted before bringing his axe down on Thorn's neck, decapitating the manticore which dissolved into golden dust. With the monster dead, Naruto turned towards the demigods and Satter, seeing Annabeth and her friends regarding him warily before he walked up to Bianca and Naiko. Hey, are you two alright? Naruto asked, looking them over, with the siblings nodding in response. We're fine, Andromeda tried helping us before Thorn grabbed her too. Where did you get that axe? And where did you learn to use it? Naiko asked eager to learn where Naruto got his axe and if he'd be able to get a weapon. He could summon too. Why yeah, we're we're fine. Completely freaking out and questioning what's even real anymore. But other than that perfectly fine said Bianca with a strained smile while trying to calm her continuously rising nerves. Right, that's understandable and sorry that you both had to find out about well all this, like that. But I will explain it all, I promise, said Naruto, making Bianca nod slowly and calm down a little, knowing if he made a promise, then he'd keep it. Naruto then turned towards the girls and sat her only to see Andromeda pointing her sword at him, Annabeth regarding him warily, Underwood holding a set of reed pipes with a nervous expression and the third girl reclaimed her spear and shield, holding them up as well. The third girl looked to be the oldest, being 15 years old with spiky black hair that went down to her shoulders, and two bangs on each side of her face, a blue highlighted bang, and a blue thunder hairpin that seemed to glow, all of which made her blue eyes stand out, like a couple of lightning-filled sapphires on her pale, but beautiful, face, while having a splash of freckles across her nose. As for her clothing, she wore a short sleeve black shirt, with blue lightning on the front, a sleeveless fishnet shirt, while having a black leather jacket worn over them, that also had blue lightning on it, along with having both a white interior and borders, all of which was short enough to expose her midriff. On her arms, she wore a pair of fishnet arm sleeves, that started her mid-upper arms, and stopped just short of her black fingerless, which has steel knuckled gloves, along with blue lightning on them, as well. On her lower body, she wore dark gray jeans with a belt that had a blue lightning lock, 
blue socks and black steel tooed hunting boots. At least the Olympians are capable of making something beautiful. Naruto thought looking at her, Annabeth and Andromeda, along with Bianca, seeing all four were already incredibly beautiful, and would only grow more so. Who are you? Questioned Andromeda suspiciously at who this guy was. Given how he not only approached her and Annabeth before, now with what he did and knows. The guy who saved your asses. After you all let yourselves be defeated like children Naruto said, narrowing his eyes at them, making the three frown. Hey we did our best how are we supposed to know Thorn had a damn helicopter retorted Thalia, glaring at him only to recoil slightly when he returned the glare. Well you're the daughter of Zeus, aren't you? God of lightning in the sky, why not bring a bolt of lightning down on top of the copter? Or control the wind to knock it off course? Or maybe do what I just did, before, and throw your spear at the monster, rather than charge at it said Naruto, with the ravenette flinching at his words, unable to come up with a response since he had a point of what she could have done. And you, daughter of Poseidon I'm guessing why didn't you use the weapons you had, said Naruto turning to Andromeda. I couldn't fight without Bianca and Nico getting hurt, and Thorn would have killed us if we tried jumping into the ocean, Andromeda said with a frown, not liking to be reprimanded when there was nothing she could do. What's on the ground? Naruto asked calmly, confusing Andromeda at the random question. W.H. Wa said Andromeda, only to fall silent when the whiskered redeed walked up and looked down at her. What is on the ground? Repeated Naruto, the daughter of Poseidon gulping at how close he was. S.N. Snow? Andromeda replied, with the Yuzumaki nodding at this. And tell me, what is snow? Questioned Naruto, with Annabeth's and Thalia's eyes soon widening in realization. Before looking down at what he's getting at. I I I it's you you you. Um, um, F F R F R F R. Frozen W Wa said Andromeda, only to fall silent in realization. Yes, it's frozen water. Last I checked, Poseidon can control water. So, unless you have zero training in your literal god given abilities, then you have no excuse. Remember that the next time you try making a pointless argument, kid. Naruto explained before turning towards Annabeth. I'm not a kid, Andromeda said, willing to admit her faults and that he did have a point, but refused to be talked down to like that, before falling silent when Naruto looked down at her again. Would you prefer little girl, instead? Asked Naruto, only for Andromeda to scoff. I don't know, would you like it if I called you, kitty, with those whiskers of yours? Andromeda asked, making Naruto become momentarily slack-jawed at the comeback, before regaining his composure, and deciding to continue with his lecture. Shall we go over your own mistakes or are you able to figure them out on your own? Naruto asked, the daughter of Athena shaking her head while covering her face. I could have attacked Thorn when I was invisible, possibly even killed him if I was able to get close enough. Or, I could have distracted him, giving Andromeda an opening to attack along with Thalia and Grover, or let her get Bianca and Nico out of harm's way, said Annabeth, being able to figure out what she could have done better after Naruto began listing their mistakes. Yes, you could have. All of you had several options to choose from to deal with Thorn and the helicopter before being surrounded and left helpless. But, instead, you choose to just rush in recklessly and fight head-on, completely forgetting about your own abilities. You're simply lucky I showed up when I did, otherwise it would have ended much worse. Naruto said, with the three demigods looking down at being reprimanded and unable to make any reports. We're sorry. Annabeth, Andromeda, and Thalia said, only to yelp when Naruto smacked each of them on their heads. Don't be sorry, be better, said Naruto, narrowing his eyes at them making the three nod in response, seeing it as a lesson they had to learn, while being thankful that nothing too bad happened. Uh, can we get some answers, please? Bianca asked, waving her hand at them, hoping to finally know what's going on, before Naruto rubbed his eyes while mentally groaning. Not yet, unfortunately, we still have a problem. Naruto said with Andromeda, Annabeth, Thalia and Grover tensing, while Bianca moved Nico behind her before looking around warily in case something else jumps out. All of you in the trees, come out, now shouted Naruto, turning towards the forest, with the others doing the same, the three demigods ready for what would come out, only for a dozen girls, the youngest being ten and the oldest being fourteen, to come out from the trees, all of them carrying bows, while wearing silver parkas and jeans, with them also having determined and suspicious expressions as they looked at Naruto, with a few even looking ready to even shoot him. The hunters? Annabeth said in surprise, not expecting the hunters to be here. Oh great, like things weren't bad enough, muttered Thalia, annoyed that she now had to deal with her least favorite group, as one of the girls stepped forward. The girl appeared to be 14 years old with her being tall, 
graceful, and gorgeously beautiful. She had brown eyes, a slightly upturned nose, copper-colored skin, and the silver circlet braided into the top of her long, dark hair gave her the impression of a Persian princess. Permission to kill. My lady? The girl asked, not hesitating in aiming an arrow right at Naruto's heart. Much to the demigod's shock and disbelief, along with Bianca's and Naiko's worry for their friend. Seriously, Nightshade? Can you call it for like five minutes? Thalia exclaimed in disbelief that, despite her grudge against boys, she'd try to attack Naruto, despite likely having seen what he could do. You should listen to her. Because if you don't lower your bow, you better pray that the first shot kills me. Naruto warned while holding his axe at the ready, with the axe head soon being encased in ice. Pizo, this is not a fight any of us would want. Another girl said, putting a hand on Zo's arm, lowering her bow. The second girl looked to be 12 or 13, had long silver white hair, held up by an icy blue headband with white swirling designs, while a few strands that framed her face moonlight pale skin, eyes that were a mix of pale blue, silver and periwinkle with narrow pupils. Her attire consisted of pale blue fur boots, bandages wrapped around her lower right leg and her left thigh, a dangerously short white kimono, with cloud-like designs along the edges, and held closed by a pale blue obi, a beaded necklace with a large blue stone on the end, bandages wrapped around her arms, pale blue fur gloves, and finally a white fur animal pelt draped across her shoulders, with her own bow looking as if it was made from ice. Very well, my lady, Zo said with a bow to the girl before stepping back, with the second girl then facing Naruto with a wary expression. And you must be Artemis then, stated Naruto, shocking Andromeda, Bianca and Naiko, while Annabeth Thalia and Grover were already aware of who the goddess was. You know who I am, Artemis said, with Naruto nodding in response. It's kind of obvious, plus your look reminds of me of the last hunter goddess I encountered, Naruto said, with the moon goddess raising a brow at this before looking down at herself. Yes, despite our differing beliefs, she has my respect for her skill in hunting prowesses, said Artemis, knowing who he was talking about, while the hunters and demigods were only confused at what or who they were talking about. Now, I'm sure you'll understand that you'll need to come with me and explain what you're doing so far from your own land and your own kind, Artemis said, narrowing her eyes at Naruto, with the whiskered redeed simply nodding while hooking his axe to one of his pants belt loops. As long as your girl scouts don't do anything to annoy me or try to attack me, the same goes for the rest of the children on that mountain of yours. Naruto replied, the hunters glaring at him for the insult, while Artemis's eye twitched before giving a short nod. Okay, Whiskers has definitely just gone up a notch in my book. Thalia whispered to Gover, Annabeth and Andromeda, with the former two rolling their eyes at that, not being the least bit surprised, given her distaste for the hunters. Then please, would you all join us at our camp? I'm sure all of us can be given some answers, said Artemis, motioning them to follow her and her hunters, with Andromeda, Annabeth, Thalia with her being rather reluctant, and Grover followed them. While Naruto looked at Bianca and Naiko, nodding and smiling reassuringly at them, before they joined the others and headed for the hunter's camp. Naruto gritted his teeth, suppressing a scream of pain as a massive stone column slammed into him sending the eight-year-old crashing through a tree. His eyes widening as he saw the tree about to fall on top of him, managing to roll out of the way in time before it did. Before he looked at what had hit him, a monster known as a troll. Trolls were massive creatures, with Naruto barely coming up to its knees, with large tusks on the edge of their faces. All trolls had massive strength, durability, and stamina, along with having higher intelligence than most monsters, making them more dangerous as they could think and plan. And if that wasn't enough, each troll also carried gigantic stone totems with runes carved into them, with the runes strengthening their abilities and granted them power over an element. The whiskered redeed quickly jumped back when the troll shot a blast of flames out of its hand at him, roaring as it charged him with its pillar held above its head. Weapon I need a weapon. Something, anything Naruto thought as he ran through the forest, looking around for anything that he could use against the troll before noticing the shadow descending towards him, rolling out of the way in time to avoid being crushed by the troll's totem, only to bite his cheek when a wave of flames erupted from the impact, burning his left side and throwing him back against a tree. Grunting as he forced himself to stand up, Naruto couldn't help but feel relief when he saw a sharp-looking rock sticking out of the snow. Thinking whatever God decided to show a little mercy, Naruto grabbed the rock before jumping out of the way of the troll's fist as it smashed through the tree. With the Yuzumaki rushing the troll, getting in close and began stabbing and slashing at its leg, 
The monster roaring at the attacks before raising its foot up to crush the demigod, only to roar in pain when Naruto took the opportunity to stab the rock deep into its foot, with it being buried even deeper when it stomped down. That should at least slow it down a little, Naruto thought before he took off running again, knowing while it may slow the troll down, it'll also make it even angrier. Unfortunately, Naruto didn't get far when something slammed into his back and sent him flying making him bite his cheek again to avoid screaming in pain. Though he did let out a grunt when he crashed into the ground, looking to see he's back in the clearing they started in, along with seeing what crashed into him when a large tree came flying out of the forest, towards him. Naruto's eyes widened at the sight before he tried moving out of the way, barely dodging the tree, as it crashed down where he once was. Though he was then forced to raise his hands, gritting his teeth as the troll's totem smashed down against him. The Yuzumaki felt the ground crack beneath, as the troll kept pushing the totem down to crush to him. With Naruto using all his strength to keep it from getting closer only to squeeze his eyes shut when the runes on it lit up with fiery energy, and began burning his hands. Come on, come on push it back Naruto thought, struggling to push the totem back towards the troll or away from him, knowing if he didn't do it soon then he'll either be crushed or burn alive, given he wouldn't be getting any help. That thought made Naruto growl in anger before his eyes snapped open, with them now glowing and sparking with electricity, as he glared at the troll. Before, slowly, he began pushing the totem back until he was standing up, panting in anger, only to shout and throw his arms up, sending the totem flying straight at the troll's face. The troll looking in shock at the sight before grunting in pain as its totem smashed into its face, sending the monster stumbling backwards. With Naruto jumping up and grabbing one of the troll's tusks, flipping around to land on the back of the troll's head, Naruto then began punching the troll repeatedly in the head, making it stumble around with each blow, until the troll managed to right itself, roaring as it tried throwing Naruto off, only for the whiskered redeed to hold on and continue punching it. Before with a final punch, Naruto jumped off as the troll went falling to the ground with a loud crash. The Yuzumaki panting as he landed on the ground, only to jump up and slam his feet right down onto the troll's back when it tried getting up, before he went over to the troll's head. Glaring at the monster, Naruto grabbed the troll by its tusks, grunting as he twisted the troll's head around, snapping its neck. Though Naruto didn't stop there, before he broke one of the troll's tusks off and began repeatedly stabbing it in the head and neck. You're nothing to me you worthless, brainless monster you're nothing die Naruto shouted as he kept stabbing the troll, not caring that it was already dead, only for the Yuzumaki to be pulled from his rage-induced state when someone grabbed his wrist, stopping his assault on the troll's body, gasping when the person lifted him up before tossing him onto the ground. With Naruto's anger instantly fading when he saw the familiar cold-blooded and serious expression on his father's face. I I I did as you asked father the troll's dead, Naruto said, bowing his head, while his father continued to simply look at him. I said no weapons, stated the god, making Naruto gulp before quickly tossing the broken tusk aside. I it was already dead when I broke its tusk off said Naruto, knowing if his father told him to do something. Then he had to do exactly as he said or else. With the god remaining silent before walking over to the troll's feet, Naruto paling slightly as he ripped open the troll's foot and grabbed the rock he used against it. Then explain this, he demanded, Naruto shaking a little since he knew he was in trouble before he gagged and clutched his stomach, when his father flicked the rock at him, holding back, otherwise the rock would've gone straight through him. But I suppose you did succeed in killing it with your own hands. So, you'll be walking back to the Temple of Tur after you find and kill three ancients? while bringing their hearts back as proof, said the god, causing Naruto to look at him in disbelief. THTH3A and an ancients, Naruto said, not believing he wanted to find and kill three ancients and bring back their hearts. Finding ancients was hard enough due to their bodies being made entirely out of rock, making them difficult to spot them if they're sleeping. But killing them was nearly impossible with how their bodies are basically indestructible, and his father is telling him to kill three. Would you prefer three soul eaters, instead, or perhaps three dragons? Demanded the god narrowing his eyes dangerously, the Yuzumaki quickly shaking his head. No no, I'll find the ancients and bring their hearts back. I swear Naruto said, knowing he shouldn't push his luck. Good I expect them by nightfall. Otherwise, we'll have to start your training from the beginning. If you can't handle such a simple task, the god said before vanishing in a bolt of lightning. Once he was sure his father was gone, Naruto collapsed to his hands and knees, spitting up blood while clutching his side.
feeling the broken ribs from his fight with the troll. Not helped, when his father flicked the rock at him, along with his burned hands. Having learned to suppress his pain and not let it show, as it'd only make things worse during his training. Only doing so, when he knew he was alone or only those he could trust were around. Coughing and gagging for a more moments, Naruto shakily stood up before leaving to track down three ancients, knowing he didn't have a lot of time left before nightfall. Present. Three fucking ancients, and what do I get after nearly dying against them to get their hearts in time? I expect you to be faster next time. Naruto thought as he and the others sat around the fire in the hunter's camp. With there being seven large tents, all of them made from silver silk, curved in a crescent shape around one side of a bonfire. While a dozen white wolves acted as guards around the camp, as well as falcons up in the trees. After they arrived at camp, Annabeth, Andromeda, Thalia, and Grover had begun explaining everything to Bianca and Nyko about the Greek gods, monsters, and everything else. Artemis having also sent a few hunters to collect their belongings from Westover. While Naruto remained silent for the most part, still listening as they explained everything, but, instead, felt his mind drifting back to being raised and trained by his father. So the gods the actual Greek gods, are real? That was really Artemis? Bianca asked, feeling her head spinning at all the information. Yeah, my mother's Athena, Andy's dad is Poseidon, Thalia's dad is Zeus, and Grover's a satyr, replied Annabeth, knowing it's a lot to take in for new demigods to learn the myths and stories they've heard about are real. This is awesome do you know whose kids we are? Questioned Nyko in excitement, not believing his Mytha magic game was actually real. We don't know, your godly parent is revealed when they claim you, but whoever they are, they must be important if Thorn wanted to take you both alive, Andromeda said, the brunette shivering at remembering what Thorn said about them either joining his army or being fed to monsters. That explains Nyko, you remember last summer? Those guys who tried to attack us in the alley in DC? Bianca asked while looking at her brother, suddenly remembering the last time they were attacked, realizing they were monsters. And that bus driver, the one with the ram's horns, I told you that was real, Nyko said with a smirk, pleased to know he'd been right. Yeah, and Thorn won't be the last monster you guys run into, which is why we're here to bring you to Camp Half-Blood, where you'll be safe and be trained to protect yourselves, Thalia stated, making the siblings look at Earth, Bianca looking unsure, while Nyko was excited at the idea of being trained. Will we get magic weapons, like Naruto's axe? Nyko asked, really wanting to get his own weapon he could summon, with his question making the girls frown. That really depends on who your parent is, and if they'll give you magical items. But I've never heard of any weapons that could be recalled like that before. Except Annabit muttered as she began thinking things over. And speaking of hey, Whiskers Thalia said, looking at Naruto, snapping her fingers to get his attention, with the Yuzumaki glancing at them. What? said Naruto. Naruto? Why don't you seem surprised by any of this? Did you know about all of this? Bianca asked as she and the others looked at him. Yes, I knew, I've known about the gods my entire life. Naruto replied, surprising them that he's known his entire life. And you've never been to camp? Grover asked in disbelief that any demigod could know about the gods and not have been taken to camp. You're under the impression, I'm Greek, stated Naruto, surprising them again before Thalia and Andromeda frowned at him. That doesn't make any sense, there aren't any other gods besides the Greek gods. You'd have to be related to one of them, Andromeda said, with Naruto rolling his eyes at words. And who told you the Olympians were the only gods? Do you honestly believe they alone rule this planet? No, there are more gods than you can even comprehend. Keep that in mind, as you never know when you may meet one and piss them off, kid, said Naruto, with Andromeda scowling at him. Why don't you take your own advice, kitty? Andromeda retorted. Well, if you aren't a child of an Olympian or a minor god, then which pantheon do you come from? Questioned Thalia, wanting to know what kind of demigod Naruto was. Norse, Annabeth stated, making the others look at her, with the daughter of Athena looking at Naruto in realization. That's the pantheon you're from, aren't you? Your father is a Norse god, said Annabeth, the whiskered redeeb looking at her with a raised brow before nodding. That's right. He's a member of the Aesir tribe, Naruto replied, not surprised she managed to figure it out. What are Norse gods? And the Aesir tribe? Bianca asked in confusion, not being familiar with different pantheons. Though they stopped when Zo walked over to them, looking at Naruto in distaste, before speaking. Lady Artemis wishes to see the Andromeda Jackson, Bianca Di Angelo, Thalia Grace, as well as you, man, said Zo, looking at the four of them. You it's you, how hard is that to say? Thalia said in annoyance before standing up along with Andromeda, Bianca, and Naruto. Hey Nyko, 
Why don't you show Grover how to play my the magic? Suggested Naruto, causing the younger boy to grin before he immediately began explaining the game to the satyr. Zo escorted the four demigods to one of the tents, opening it to show Artemis already inside. With silk rugs and pillows covered the floor, and in the center, a golden brazier of fire seemed to burn without fuel or smoke. While behind Artemis was a polished oak display case where her bow rested, along with numerous pelts hanging from the walls. Sit, join us, Artemis said, motioning the four to sit down, with them doing so. Though Thalia was more reluctantly than the others, if you try making the offer again, my answer's still no. Thalia stated, wanting to make it clear she wasn't joining the hunters. Understood, Thalia Grace. Though first I have business to discuss with the Aesir, said Artemis turning towards Naruto with narrowed eyes. Tell me, what are you doing in America? let alone this close to Olympus. Artemis asked, wanting to know what a Norse demigod was doing this far from their realm. This was the best place I could go to escape from the rest of my family, none of them would think or try to look for me here. Replied Naruto, the goddess frowning at this. You fled and decided to hide here? You could have gone anywhere else. Yet you seem to choose here, specifically. Why? said Artemis. Would you think to look for a giant hiding among ants? Naruto asked with a raised brow, with Artemis scowling in annoyance at this. Thou will said Zo, standing up only for Artemis to hold up her hand. Stand down Zo, as insulting as it is he has a point. Artemis said reluctantly, knowing that the Olympians weren't anywhere close to their original power before the decline in their worship. So, there actually are other gods, other pantheons? Why weren't we ever told? Thalia said in disbelief and anger not believing there were other pantheons of gods in the world, and none of them were ever told about it. Because of your dad, Naruto said, making the Ravenette look at him before turning back to Artemis, who nodded reluctantly again. He is correct again. Our father does not enjoy the idea of demigods learning the existence of other pantheons, believing it would lead to them losing faith in the Olympians, if they didn't believe we were the sole power in the world. And having forbidden it from ever being revealed, said Artemis, much to Andromeda's and Thalia's disbelief before they looked at Naruto. And you were told? How come you knew about other pantheons? Questioned Andromeda while frowning at this kind of information being kept hidden, being reminded of Zeus's refusal to believe Kronos was returning. Yes, I did say I've known about the gods my entire life. And why would other pantheons care if their children knew about the existence of other gods? They're secure in their power and stations, having no reason to fear being abandoned, and instead see it as making sure they're fully aware of everything the world. After all, a lot of gods wouldn't hesitate to vaporize you if you insulted them in any way or didn't show proper respect. Naruto replied, with Thalia and Andromeda frowning at this. So, is that everything or not? Questioned Naruto. Looking at Artemis, with the goddess frowning at him. Who's your sire? Artemis asked, knowing that was the most important piece of information. With Naruto clenching his fists tightly before they all suddenly heard a crack of thunder in the sky, making all the girls look up before Andromeda looked at Thalia. That wasn't me. Thalia said only to slowly turn towards Naruto along with the others, while Artemis's eyes widened and gained a hint of nervousness. Don't tell me said Artemis, mentally praying it wasn't who she was thinking of. I go by Naruto Uzumaki, the last name of my mother, to help hide my identity and hide in plain sight. But my real name is Naruto Thorson, Naruto said, with Bianca Thalia and Andromeda looking at him in shock, while Artemis covered her face, not believing what she just heard. Thorson, as in Thor, God of Thunder, magic hammer that only the worthy can lift, appears in a lot of movies, video games and comic books. That Thor? Andromeda asked, not believing Naruto was the son of Thor, with the Yuzumaki groaning and pinching the bridge of his nose. I swear I hate those stupid pop culture depictions, so much. First of all, Mjolnir can be lifted by anyone as long as they're strong enough. That whole being worthy thing is a load of crap. Secondly, how he's depicted in media is very different from how he really is, both in appearance and personality. And thirdly, yes Thor is my father, said Naruto, hating how his father is depicted as some muscular, good-hearted hero in media, when that couldn't be farther from who he is. But most of all it left him bitter at how he's depicted, especially in Marvel comics and movies being shown as a courageous and good-hearted deity, constantly showing him of something that could have been, something that he wished was how his father was really like, at times. While he's suffered years of physical, mental, and emotional neglect and abuse from the actual god, though, I'll admit, it's actually enjoyable whenever he's screwed over, thought Naruto, smirking since he did enjoy that movie where his father was banished and stripped of his power, and then ran over by a truck. And even if his origins are wrong, he also enjoyed how Loki is depicted as well, 
the trickster god being one of the few Norse gods he was on good terms with. However, the Yuzumaki will also admit, it was hilarious seeing Loki be treated as a ragdoll by the Hulk as well. Your father is Thor, and you had the brilliant idea to come here, Artemis demanded, knowing how dangerous things will get. If the Aesir found out he was hiding near Olympus, as I said, none of them would think or try to look for me, here, said Naruto, with Bianca, Andromeda, and Thalia looking between the two. Then thou should leave whilst you can, stated Zoe, narrowing her eyes at the whiskered redeed. Believe me, sweetheart, I'd love nothing more than to avoid getting dragged into another messed up pantheon. But Bianca and Naiko are now part of this, and I'm not going to abandon them. Naruto replied, making Bianca smile, happy that he was staying for her and her brother, while Zoe's face turned red in anger at the nickname. Sweetheart, I shall remove thy tongue you Zoe said, reaching for her hunting knives. Zoe said Artemis, giving her lieutenant a stern look, with Zoe scowling before crossing her arms. Yes, sit and pout, you already look like a princess with your pretty tiara. Now you have the attitude of one, Naruto said with a smirk, while Zoe glared murderously at him, only to glare at Thalia when she started laughing. He's not wrong, Nightshade maybe you should wear a dress to complete the look Thalia said, enjoying how Naruto was egging her on, with even Bianca and Andromeda laughing a little. Can you not antagonize my hunters any further? said Artemis, glaring at the Yuzumaki in annoyance at what he started. I'll think about it, but no, Naruto replied the mood goddess looking tempted to let Zoe attack him, before closing her eyes and taking a deep breath to calm herself down. Artemis then turned towards Bianca and Andromeda, wanting to get to the other reason she called them all in here. With Thalia's amusement vanishing, being replaced with a scowl, knowing what she was going to say next. Now then, there was one other matter I wish to discuss with both of you Andromeda Jackson, Bianca D'Angelo. But first I need ask both of you about the mandicure and anything it said as to why it was here and why it wanted you and your brother, said Artemis, wanting to know what Thorne's purpose had been to capture Bianca and Nico. Bianca paling slightly at remembering when Thorne held them captive, while Andromeda clenched her fists given how Thorne was working with Luke. He, uh, he said something about like something called the Great Stirring, that a lot of monsters were appearing, along with how someone called the General would explain things to us. Bianca said, remembering some of what Thorne had said, Andromeda nodding in agreement remembering as well. Artemis frowned gravely at this before looking at Zoe, seeing her lieutenant had paled at the mention of the general, and knew why. There was also something else he said, that soon they'd have the most important monster of all, one apparently able to bring about the downfall of Olympus, added Andromeda, with Artemis going completely still at hearing this. Then it seems I was right about the scent I had caught. Things I haven't hunted in millennia are coming back and one so old I'd nearly forgotten about it. Artemis said, realizing she's been too slow in noticing the signs about what's returned, and knew she needed to find the monster before the general did. What are you talking about? Thalia asked with a frown, annoyed that the goddess wasn't telling them anything. We came here tonight after sensing the manticore, but it wasn't what I was seeking. It was something else, something incredibly dangerous if the general got his hands on it, said Artemis, the daughter of Zeus's eye twitching at not getting a straight answer, with Naruto looking at her in Andromeda. Are all Olympians this cryptic and never give straight answers? Questioned Naruto, genuinely curious if the entire Greek pantheon was like this. Unfortunately, Thalia replied in annoyance, as even after being revived, she still wasn't told everything, and apparently there was even more being hidden than she originally expected. Aha, said Andromeda, remembering when she first arrived at Camp Half-Blood and everything that was kept from her. That's because we hide such information for good reason and tell you it when you are ready, Artemis said, the whiskered redeed raising a brow. And who exactly decides when they're ready you? Their parents who they barely know? Some oracle that speaks in even more cryptic rhymes? Keeping information like that is only a good way to make them distrust you. So is it really any wonder why so many demigods are starting to prefer the titans? If they can't even get a few simple answers from their parents? Naruto said, making the goddess frown in annoyance. See, kitty, here, gets it said Andromeda. Not wanting to agree with Naruto, but also knowing he had a point. Quiet kid, grown-ups are talking, said Naruto, the ravenette looking at him in annoyance before turning back to the goddess. Well, this information is better kept away from them, as the fewer who know about the monster the better, stated Artemis, Naruto now looking at her with an unamused expression. Now, as for what I wish to discuss with you, Andromeda and Bianca, I wish to offer you both the chance to join my hunters, to hunt by side for eternity, to remain maidens forever, 
and reject love for as long as you live. Artemis offered, surprising the two girls at the offer. It is a great honor, devoting oneself to Lady Artemis, living with your new sisters, and swearing off males. Thou would be granted eternal youth, to live forever and hunt. Added Zoe, hoping that they'll take the offer to join the hunters. You, uh, I, I don't think I'd really want something like that. Said Bianca, unsure about the idea of remaining young forever while hunting deadly monsters. Maybe she would have accepted the offer before, liking the idea getting to live her own life, rather than always being a parent to Naiko. But now she's had time to relax and grow with Naruto to help look after Naiko. Naiko, finally giving her the chance to enjoy some time to herself for a change, and swearing off boys and love forever no thanks. Bianca mentally added while glancing at Naruto, something that Artemis noticed, making her frown. Very well, and you, Andromeda, said Artemis turning to the daughter of Poseidon with Thalia mentally scoffing, highly doubting that Andromeda would ever consider joining the hunters and leaving camp. But the longer she didn't hear Andromeda reject the offer, the more Thalia started to worry before she turned towards her cousin. Only to see Andromeda had a thoughtful look on her face, much to Thalia's disbelief. Andy, Thalia asked, worried and hoping she wasn't actually thinking of taking the offer, before her hope was dashed, when the younger Ravenette looked at Artemis. There'd really be no interactions with any boys, at all? Andromeda asked, much to Thalia's disbelief, while Artemis nodded. None whatsoever. The only times you'd be around them would be the times when the hunt stays at camp. Otherwise, we're always on the move, tracking monsters and other prey, replied Artemis before she and Zoe smiled happily when Andromeda immediately nodded. Then I accept, I'll join the hunters, said Andromeda, liking the chance to not interact with boys ever again, and risk being betrayed like with Luke. And after what happened with him, she also had no interest in wanting to pursue a romantic relationship with anyone either. Are you kidding me? Thalia demanded, shooting up and looked at Andromeda in disbelief, anger and hurt, that she's actually joining the hunters. You're seriously just going to join them? What about the camp? Everyone there needs your help. Especially now, said Thalia, hoping to change her mind. No, they don't. The only time I was really needed was to find the Master Bolt. After that, I didn't do anything. Clarice was the one who got the quest to find the Golden Fleece, and I'm sure she would have been able to succeed, even if I hadn't snuck away to get it myself. And besides, you're a better leader than I could be. Everyone already looks to you for what to do, anyway. Andromeda said, muttering the last part a little bitterly. While she may like her cousin and admit Thalia was much cooler, stronger, and a natural leader compared to her. That didn't Andromeda couldn't help but feel a little bitter at how everyone instantly starts going to her for advice and help, that she's the one who always makes the plans, along with Chiron having even taught her to manipulate the mist, something he never did for her. A few months ago, I was a tree the rest of the campers barely know me, the only reason they'd follow me is because of who my dad is, but they do know you, they rely on you, and they are going to need your help Andromeda. We all will, Thalia said. Well, maybe I don't want to be the hero, anymore retorted Andromeda, standing up and facing her cousin. I didn't ask to be Poseidon's daughter, or to be a demigod at all. I definitely didn't ask to be accused of stealing some all-powerful magic glow stick or a stupid helmet. The only reason I went on that quest was to save my mom. I went to the Sea of Monsters to save Grover, and help save the camp. Both times I nearly died multiple times, all of which only happened because of someone I thought was my friend, someone that I loved well. Now I'm actually making a choice of my own, and not one anyone else decided for me, Andromeda said, letting out some of her frustration that's built up ever since she first learned she was a demigod, and only grew after Luke's betrayal. Then what about your mom? Are you just never going to see her again? Demanded Thalia, not caring if it was a low blow to bring up her mother. Not if it meant getting through to Andromeda. Feeling some hope that she succeeded when she flinched, only for Andromeda to look away. She'll understand, muttered Andromeda, with the daughter of Zeus looking at her in anger before scoffing. Do whatever you want then, we probably will be better off without your whining. Thalia said scathingly before glaring at Zoe, while Andromeda flinched at her words. And I hope you're proud Nightshade. You finally got a daughter of the big three to join your group of man-haters, said Thalia before storming out of the tent. While Naruto and Bianca had watched the exchange silently, before the Yuzumaki put a hand on her shoulder and tilted his head towards the exit. Nodding in understanding, Bianca got up and left, with Naruto standing as well, but didn't immediately leave and looked at Andromeda. 
What, you want to criticize my decision to Kitty? Andromeda demanded, hiding the hurt from Thalia's words before then leaving, with Naruto shrugging in response. No, you want to join the hunters, that's your choice, kid. But ask yourself this. Are you joining because it's what you really want or just an excuse to run from the pain? Naruto said as he exited the tent before Andromeda could respond. After leaving Artemis's tent, Naruto rejoined Bianca, Naiko, Thalia, Anabith and Grover. The latter two having downcast expressions, while Thalia still looked angered. The Yuzumaki guessing she and Bianca must have told them about Andromeda's choice of joining the hunters. With it not being long before Artemis came out with Zoe and Andromeda the daughter of Poseidon's skin now faintly glowing silver, and wearing the same silver clothes as the rest of the hunters. Before Artemis announced that they'd be heading to camp, much to the dismay of the hunters, even more so, when she revealed they'd be traveling there in her brother's chariot, leading to them all standing on a hill waiting for dawn to arrive, the hunters having taken down their camp just as quickly as they set it up. How are you not freezing like that? Bianca asked as she looked at Naruto in disbelief, as he didn't look the least bit cold. Despite his light clothing, the same being said for the hunters, who didn't look phased by the cold. While she, Nyko, Annabeth, Thalia, and Grover stayed huddled together in the snow. Niflheim is much colder than this, replied Naruto with a shrug, having had to deal with much colder temperatures than this. Wotelheim? What kind of place is that? Thalia asked with a confused frown at the name. That's the realm of fog and ice, right? One of the first two primordial realms in creation, Annabeth said, making the others look at her in surprise, with Naruto raising a brow at her. That's right, it's nothing but a barren and frozen wasteland, the warmest it gets is 40 degrees below freezing. That's not counting how it has 11 poisonous rivers running through it. So you also can't drink the water unless you want to die. And of course the poisonous mist that slowly kills you the longer you stay inside it. Plus anything there that manages to survive and wants to kill you. Naruto explained. Much to their shock and nervousness at such a place existing. And you've been there before? Why? Bianca asked in disbelief at why anyone would travel to such a place willingly. Part of my training. Spending a year in Niflheim with nothing but my own hands. I think that was a rare time my father was almost impressed with me. Naruto said, casually, which only increased their shock and horror. He spent an entire year there alone. Your dad sounds like a dick, stated Naiko only to yelp when Bianca smacked him on the head. Naiko Bianca hissed, even though she agreed that Naruto's father sounded like a bastard for forcing him into such a place alone. But that didn't mean she'd tolerate Naiko swearing. That's putting it mildly, said Naruto with a small, amused smirk, before looking at Annabeth. You also seem to be pretty knowledgeable about Norse mythology. Why? Naruto asked, since while he expected her to put the pieces together on what pantheon he's part of, now he's intrigued that her knowledge extended past that. I got bored after reading up on only Greek mythology, so I figured reading about other mythologies would prove useful, eventually, or just see how they compared to the Olympians. Annabeth replied with a shrug, having never considered any information as useless, even if it was about things she originally thought were genuine myths. Now it seemed like she had the chance to learn what was fact and fiction about what she researched. Annie, you really need a better hobby, said Thalia with a deadpan expression wishing her friend would get other hobbies than reading books or studying architecture. My hobbies are just fine retorted Annabeth, letting out a huff, before everyone's attention turned forward when the sky started lighting up. About time. He's so lazy during the winter. Artemis muttered in annoyance at her twin slowness. Have you considered having a giant wolf chase him? I'm sure Skull wouldn't mind chasing a different sun for a while. Though it'll probably be a much shorter chase, said Naruto, causing the moon goddess to look at him in annoyance. I see you have the same enjoyment of causing conflict as the rest of your kind, said Artemis, the whiskered redeed shrugging in response. Just part of my charm, kid too. Though, do you really have the right to judge me on causing conflict, given your pantheon's track record with causing it? Naruto asked rhetorically, with Andromeda now giving him an annoyed look as well. Go play with a ball of yarn, kitty Andromeda said. Sorry, what was that? I don't speak kid language, said Naruto smirking at them, further annoying the goddess and her hunter, only for everyone to see a burst of light on the horizon. Everyone, but the annoying one, look away until he parks said Artemis, with the hunters all quickly turning away, along with the demigods and Satyr. Hey, sorry, she said for you to not look away, Naruto said while looking in the direction of a certain hunter, causing said hunter to glare at him. Thou will be silent, boy the same goes to you. 
Grace Zoe retorted before glaring at Thalia when she began snickering. You're the one who responded, Nightshade. I guess that means you already know how annoying you are. Thalia said tauntingly, enjoying the chance to get under her skin. She's right. I was just looking in your general direction. So I could have been looking at someone else, but you assumed I was talking to you. Something you want to share, princess? Questioned Naruto with his smirk growing, while Zoe looked ready to shoot them both. Gods, it's like there's two of them, now, muttered Annabeth, not liking how similar Naruto and Thalia already were in annoying people, already feeling the coming headaches. Does this happen often? Bianca asked, looking at the daughter of Athena before glancing between Thalia and Zoe seeing how the two really didn't seem to like each other. Only when they're around each other, replied Grover. The bright light soon faded, letting everyone turn back to see a red convertible Maserati spider, with all the snow around it, melting in a perfect circle. With the driver stepping out, Naruto also noticing how Andromeda tensed when he did, and Thalia's amused expression from taunting Zoe turned into a scowl. With the driver was tall, looking to be 17 or 18 years old, with wavy, sandy blonde hair, tan skin, sunny blue eyes, and outdoorsy good looks, along with wearing simple jeans, loafers, and a sleeveless t-shirt. And now I'm angry again, Thalia stated, not liking how Apollo looked so similar to Luke, being reminded of why Andromeda joined the hunters again. I know a giant wolf that loves to eat gods, offered Naruto, the ravenette seeming to contemplate the idea. Don't even think about it, Annabeth said quickly, knowing who Naruto was talking about. Lil sis, what's up? You never call. You never write. I was getting worried, Apollo said, smiling brightly at his sister, with Artemis sighing in annoyance. I'm fine, Apollo, and right now and no mood for games because of him, said Artemis, pointing at the Yuzumaki. Not in the mood for Apollo's attempts to annoy her. Because of WHIS said Apollo only for the sun god to scream and recoil when he saw Naruto, surprising the demigods and some of the hunters at his reaction. What's an Aesir doing here? Are there more? Are they invading? Please tell me that soul isn't here Apollo said, looking around with a panicked expression before Artemis backhanded him across the face. Calm down, you idiot he's only a demigod, and the rest don't know he's here, for now, anyway. And no, Soul isn't around, but keep screaming like that, and I'm sure she'll happily come down here. Artemis said, glaring at her brother with Apollo slowly nodding, shakily. Are I right? Yeah, of course. So what did you need, sis? Questioned Apollo, still looking around nervously at Naruto. I need you to give us a ride to Camp Half-Blood. Then go straight to Olympus, and make it fast since I'm needed elsewhere, said Artemis, wanting to get her hunters settled at camp, then report back to Olympus before hunting the monster that's returned. Right, yep definitely need to get moving Apollo said, wincing slightly and rubbing his head, before pulling out his keys, and press the security alarm button. With the Maserati spider soon transforming into a large shuttle bus, big enough to fit all the hunters and the demigods. Everybody inside, we're burning daylight said Apollo as the doors opened, allowing everyone to file inside. It wasn't long before everyone was inside, with the hunters all moving to sit in the back together, making Naruto shake his head before looking at Artemis. Good job isolating impressionable young girls from the rest of society to the point they think everyone else is diseased, truly, bravo. Out of curiosity, would they choose dying over accepting help from Guy, or would they accept help from such lowly beings, kid too? Naruto asked, with Artemis growling lowly at him. There is nothing wrong with my hunters, and I am not a kid retorted Artemis, angered at the insult to her hunters. Sorry, like I told Kid One, I don't speak kid language, said Naruto before taking a seat beside Bianca, while Artemis looked ready to shoot him before taking a few deep breaths and sat behind her brother. Drive, now, Artemis ordered, Apollo quickly nodding in response before sitting in the driver's seat and started it, with the bus soon taking off into the sky. So what was that exactly? Back there, with the way Apollo reacted to you, Thalia asked after a few moments, looking at Naruto with a raised brow, curious about the sun god's reaction, along with wanting to distract herself from being high up in the sky. Yeah, it almost seemed like he was scared once he realized you were an Aesir. Did something happen between the Greek and Norse pantheons? Questioned Annabeth unable to help her desire to know what might have happened, with Bianca, Nyko, and Grover looking at him also interested. How much do you know about the god's power? Naruto said, getting confused looks from them. The god's power? Repeated Bianca unsure what he meant by that. Let me be more specific. Do you know what gives the gods their power? Naruto asked, which only confused them further. 
Aren't they just all powerful? Nothing gives them their power, Nico said, with the whiskered redeed shaking his head. While it's true all gods are extremely powerful, none of them are truly all powerful. After all, look at Selene and Helios. Both of them faded due to not being worshipped by the Romans, leading Kid 2 and Skirt Chazer Jr. being given the moon and sun. And that's really what it comes down to, faith and belief, that's what truly gives gods their power. It's what gives everything power, just by believing in something you give it strength, you make it real. Understand, explain Naruto, with the demigods and Saturn nodding slowly in response. That still doesn't explain why Apollo seems to be scared of you, or the Aesir anyway. Annabeth said, with Naruto looking at Thalia, the Ravenette frowning before glancing at the twin archers, before her eyes widened slightly. Because the deities of the Norse pantheon are stronger, aren't they? Thalia stated, making them look at her, while Naruto nodded in response. Yeah, they are, for now anyway. It wasn't always like that though. Back when the Olympians were still worshipped and seen as real. They were stronger than the Aesir. The only ones capable of rivaling them were my father, Odin, and potentially Baldur. But the latter is only because he possessed true invulnerability, making it impossible for him to be killed or injured for long, or even feel pain. But as time passed and their worship began dwindling, the Olympians' power dwindled as well. Now the only worship they get are from their demigods, legacies, followers, and cults, as well as drawing power from their domains. But even then, they're no longer at their peak anymore. Go ahead and tell me I'm wrong, god of truth. Naruto said, looking right at Apollo, with the others looking at the twin archers as well only to see Apollo frowning deeply while holding the steering wheel tightly, with Artemis crossing her arms and looking away, with their silence being all the confirmation they needed. But wouldn't the same apply to the Norse pantheon? No one really believes they're real anymore, wouldn't they have grown weaker? Bianca asked curiously. Normally, yes, but you don't necessarily need to believe something is already real to give it power. You just need to believe in it, and what can inspire more belief than a hero? Naruto said, making some of them frown in confusion. The comics, right? The comics, movies, shows, games, everything Norse gods have appeared in, stated Annabeth, the Yuzumaki nodding in response. Yeah, even if they aren't even close to being accurate and my father is the main god depicted, all of that still inspires belief in the Norse pantheon as a whole, which in turn gives them power. So while knowing many know they're actually real, they still believe in them, giving them power and making them strong. There are also still those that hold on to the old ways and worship the gods. The same can be said for a lot of other pantheons. People may no longer believe they're real, but they still have worshippers, said Naruto, the demigods looking at him with white eyes. Damn, Thalia muttered, feeling a blow to her pride with how far down the Olympians had moved on the food chain, wondering if any other pantheon would care she's the daughter of Zeus or brush her off. But what about how he reacted to Sol? Who even is Sol? Questioned Thalia, wondering who that was. The Norse goddess of the sun, except she's the personification of the sun itself, and wasn't simply given the title, making her much stronger. And the skirt Jazzer Jr. had the smart idea to try flirting with her. You wanna tell us how that ended, Sunspot? Naruto replied looking at Apollo again. No. Apollo muttered with a light whine in his tone as he lowered his head, while Artemis covered her face in embarrassment. Okay, Sol tricked him into believing she was returning his advances, and convinced him to turn into her which was just a trick as she was able to get Skull to chase after Apollo for a while. Except, he didn't have her experience in avoiding the wolf, so he was able to catch up pretty quickly. And when Skull caught up, he well, let's say got a new stick and balls to play with, said Naruto with a smirk, much to their shock before Thalia and Andromeda began laughing, with Annabeth and Bianca covering their mouths to stop their own giggles from escaping. The hunter's overall reactions being a mix of the two, while Grover and Nyko subconsciously crossed their legs in horror. It's not funny do you know how long it took it to regrow? Hell, that wolf is meant to eat gods. So I was lucky that it even grew back in the first place Apollo said, shivering at the phantom pains. Even worse, was that he became terrified to fly the sun chariot for a while, afterwards, not wanting to risk encountering soul or skull again. Father said you deserved it for trying to interact with another pantheon. You were honestly lucky that he was in a good mood at the time and felt that was punishment enough, said Artemis with an almost unnoticeable smirk. 
having enjoyed seeing her brother taken down a few pegs. If it's any consolation, she still remembers your screams fondly. Naruto said, the sun god giving him a dirty look in the mirror while muttering to himself. Oh, okay, okay, WH, what about Skull? Who's that? Bianca asked after taking a few moments to calm down, interested in hearing more about the pantheon Naruto came from. Skull and Hati, they're the sons of Fenrir, the grandsons of Loki. They chase after Soul and Mani the god of the moon, which lead to the creation of night and day. And they're destined to finally catch and devour them both in the beginning of Ragnarok, said Annabeth, with Naruto nodding in response. Right again. But that's only part of the story. Odin had known Skull and Hati were Fenrir's children, and Fenrir was destined to devour him during Ragnarok, so Odin had both of them chained up as pups to keep Fenrir at bay. Though, when Sol and Mani grew mutinous and stood still, refusing to drive their chariots across the sky, he used his ancient magic to cast the wolves into the heavens, and they began the chase. And long shall they chase, but not endlessly, for it is foretold that someday Skull and Hati will catch and devour their prey. And that day shall be Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods. Naruto explained, much to their amazement and confusion. Wadey knew that the wolves devouring the sun and moon would start Ragnarok, which is when he dies. Why did he release them? Thalia asked in confusion, wondering why anyone would set into motion the events of their own potential demise. And that's the question, isn't it? Why? And the answer is rather simple, it's about control. The wolves determine when Ragnarok begins and now he controls the wolves. Odin believes that a battle fought on his timetable is a battle he stands a better chance at winning, replied Naruto, the demigods frowning at this. What about the Nine Realms? You mentioned Niflheim, but are there eight more? Are they actually different planets? Naiko asked, excitedly at the idea of there being other planets, only for Naruto to shake his head. That's another misconception. The Nine Realms aren't really different planets. Think of them more as different dimensions, different layers of reality that are all layered on top of each other. As for what they are, there's Midgard, which is the one we all live in now. Niflheim the realm of fog and ice, on the opposite side of that is Muspelheim, the realm of fire and home of the fire giants, ruled by Surtur the Brave. Then there's Helheim, where the souls of the deceased go when they die, and is ruled by Hell goddess of death and daughter of Loki, along with Alfheim, the home of the light elves and dark elves, ruled by Freyr one of the Vanner gods, Vanaheim the home of the Vanner tribe, Svartalfheim, the home of the dwarves, some of the best craftsmen in the Nine Realms, Jotunheim the home of the Jotner, and Asgard the home of the Aesir tribe, and ruled by Odin with an iron fist. Naruto explained, that's the one you're from. I mean you were raised in Asgard, right? Annabeth asked, yeah, that's where my father took me after said Naruto before shaking his head, unconscious raising his hand to his left shoulder, where a specific set of runes were tattooed. You never said anything about your mother before, Bianca said hesitantly, guessing that something must have happened to her. I don't like talking about her, much. Naruto muttered, making the brunette wince. Well, what about the rest of your family? Any siblings? Asked Naiko to change the subject. I have two brothers and a sister, all of us having different mothers. I also have a stepmother, Sif the goddess of wheat, earth, harvest and family, replied Naruto. I'm guessing that it wasn't easy being around her, Thalia said with a frown, given how her own stepmother would likely kill her at the first opportunity. You'd be surprised, she's surprisingly nice when she wants to be, Naruto said, having managed to get along with Sif. While she wasn't exactly motherly towards him, she did at least consider him better behaved than his brothers, which wasn't saying much, but still something. Though Naruto figured it helped that he and his sister genuinely got along, making Sif be nicer for her daughter's sake. Now, if you don't mind me asking some questions, who actually was this guy that betrayed you and the kid? Naruto asked, looking at Annabeth and Thalia, the daughter of Athena frown along with Grover at the mention of Luke, while the Ravenette scowled. His name's Luke, Luke Castellan, a son of Hermes, and he was our friend until he betrayed us for the Titans, replied Thalia, with Annabeth nodding in agreement before sighing. Yeah, he was our friend. Thalia, Grover and I met him before we arrived at Camp Half-Blood. Thalia meeting him first, then finding me, and then we met Grover when he was sent to bring us to camp. But before that, we'd always been on the run from monsters, hunting us, mostly Thalia, due to her being the result of Zeus breaking the oath of the Big Three, and Hades wanting her dead. Annabeth said, Naruto nodding at this having heard of the oath the Sons of Kronos made while Bianca and Naiko looked confused. What's so important about Samoth? And would Hades want Thalia dead? Questioned Bianca, confused as to why Zeus breaking an oath would warrant Thalia's death. It's because they all made the oath on sticks, 
the most important oath anyone can make, since if you break it, then dying would be the best outcome. The big three, Zeus, Poseidon and Hades, made the oath back during World War II, swearing to not have any more demigod children, since their kids were just too powerful. Explain Grover, making Bianca and Nico look at Thalia before looking back at Andromeda with the hunters. I don't think it worked, Nico stated, seeing how they were traveling with a daughter of Zeus and a daughter of Poseidon. No, it didn't, which was honestly pretty stupid in the first place, given the fact that two of those gods basically have a scoreboard to see who can sleep with the most mortals, it was inevitable they'd break the oath. No offense, said Naruto, directing the latter part to Thalia who shrugged it off, aware her father was most known for his numerous affairs. That still doesn't explain why Thalia was punished. Her father is the one who broke the oath, shouldn't he have been punished? Instead, Bianca asked with a frown, only to look at Naruto when he scoffed. That would imply he's capable of taking responsibility for his actions. And who do you think is in charge of enforcing the oaths made on sticks? King Hypocrite himself. If another god broke an oath, he'd be all for punishing them. But when it's his own screw up, then nothing is done. And no one even does anything because they're all terrified of the Master Bolt being turned on them. Isn't that right? Said Naruto, looking at Artemis and Apollo. The twin archers frowning with the latter remaining silent. You do well to watch what you say. Boy, you have no protection in our territory. Artemis warned, with the whiskered redeed looking unfazed. What makes you think I had protection in the Norse Pantheon's territory? I went through years of training under my father, training that'd kill anyone else, including being struck by his hammer several times. I'm not scared of an overgrown man-child with a glow stick, Naruto said, with Thalia smirking in amusement, finding it a rather fitting description. That's still not fair, it wasn't her choice to be his daughter, said Bianca with her frown deepening. Who said the gods were ever fair? Now, back to Locke Naruto said, wanting to get back to the previous topic. Luke, corrected Grover, whatever, back to him. Would he join the Titans? Questioned Naruto, figuring it must have been really bad if he thought joining the Titans was the better option. I guess it started during the time we were on the run together. When it was just me and Luke, we weren't the biggest fans of the gods. Given how we were constantly chased by monsters and nearly killed dozens of times, it only got worse one time, after we met Annabeth and I was hurt. Luke took us to his mother's home for help, and she seemed pretty off her rocker. He also met his father for the first time after we arrived. We don't know what was said, but whatever happened between them, Luke wasn't the same afterwards, like he had something to prove, though I don't know if it's to himself or to Hermes. Thalia explained with a frown. It only got worse when Grover found us and guided us to Camp Half-Blood. Hades had sent an entire army of monsters after us to kill Thalia. Hellhounds, skeletons, cyclops, and all three kindly ones were there, said Annabeth, shaking slightly at remembering that night. What are kindly ones? Nyko asked, having never heard of any monsters called that before. The Three Furies, Hades' chief torturers, clarified Naruto with Thalia, Annabeth and Grover nodding in confirmation. Yeah, them. Thalia fought them off on her own, but eventually they overpowered her, Annabeth said, before Thalia put a hand on her shoulder as she looked at the Yuzumaki and D'Angelo siblings. They ripped me apart and would've dragged me down to the underworld to meet my loving uncle for even more fun and pain. But, instead, my dad turned me into a tree, one that created a barrier around camp that kept monsters out and keeping the demigods inside, safe. Thalia revealed, much to Bianca's and Nyko's shock. So back in the tent, when you said you were a tree your father did that, for how long? Bianca exclaimed in shock and horror at what happened. I was 12 and it was for 7 years, but I don't know how old I even am, now, replied Thalia hesitantly, since technically she should be 19, but she also wasn't frozen in the tree, and now looked 15, it made her unsure what age she even was, sometimes still feeling like a 12 year old only in an older body now. Were you aware? Nyko asked hesitantly, not sure what that'd be like to be turned into a tree, and then suddenly being revived in an older body. Not really. I don't even know how to describe it, but I guess like falling asleep for a really long time, but knowing you were dying only to suddenly wake up, Thalia said before shaking her head, not wanting to think about her time as a tree. After that Luke only became more bitter at the gods for what happened to Thalia, and stayed at camp year-round, training as much as he could, becoming the best swordsman at camp in the last 300 years, at least until Andy showed up. But when Luke was 17, he got his first quest straight from Hermes, himself, to retrieve a golden apple from the Garden of Hesperides. The same quest Hercules already completed, something Luke didn't want to do. 
doing a quest someone else already did, and the quest ended badly, with him being scarred by Leighton. I think that's when he was pushed over the edge and gave himself to the crooked one. Annabeth explained, looking down before continuing. It was after he joined the Titans that Luke stole the Master Bolt and Helm of Darkness, planning to start a war between the gods while staying at camp. That's when Andromeda arrived. Before we knew she was Poseidon's daughter, and when it was revealed she became an outcast, given it meant Poseidon also broke the oath. I admit I was one of the ones who avoided her, given the rivalry between our parents. Luke was the only one who didn't shun her, still training her and being her first real friend at camp. It led her to developing a crush on him. But then after she went on a quest to find and return the Master Bolt and Helm of Darkness, Luke tried killing Andromeda and revealing his allegiance to Kronos, said Annabeth sighing as she thought over everything that happened last year. Then, this summer, Luke poisoned Thalia's tree, weakening the barrier around camp, and framed Chiron for the poisoning. A quest was issued to locate the Golden Fleece, with me, Andromeda, and her Cyclops half-brother, Tyson, sneaking away to find it. Only, we were then captured by Luke, who revealed he intended to use the fleece to revive Kronos, and he tried recruiting us. But when we refused, he was going to feed us to a draken. We were able to escape, though, but we ran into Luke again, with Andromeda tricking him into revealing that he poisoned Thalia's tree through an iris message, with him ordering us to be killed until Andromeda challenged him to a duel, and nearly killed herself, again, if it wasn't for Chiron arriving with more centaurs to save us, said Annabeth, with Bianca and Nyko frowning at hearing all of this, the latter's excitement also fading the more he heard of what's happened, starting to see how the actual reality reality was nothing like his game, and it was much more dangerous than he thought. It was after they brought the fleece to camp, I was revived and learned about everything that happened. And yeah, I'm angry and hurt at Luke's betrayal, along with the fact he poisoned me. But it's hard to let it really get to me since the last time I saw him was before I was turned into a tree. Thalia said, only being able to get a little angry from what she's heard Luke's done, but not feel really betrayed and hurt at his actions, aside from him poisoning her. So, that's why Andromeda's so hurt, angry, and distrusting. Luke was her first real friend at camp, and I think the first guy she liked. Then for him to betray and try to kill her multiple times hurt her, said Annabeth before sighing sadly, understanding why Andromeda chose to join the Hunters. Part of her had even considered joining as well, simply to avoid the chance of ever seeing Luke again, and any chances he'd have to hurt them even more. But Annabeth knew it wouldn't solve anything, and that, logically, it'd only be her running from her problems. That's it? Seriously? Naruto asked with a raised brow, making the demigods and Satter look at him, with Annabeth Thalia, and Grover frowning, thinking he's dismissing Andromeda's pain. What are you talking about? Demanded Thalia with a warning look in her eyes. I'm not talking about what happened to you or the kid, it honestly sucks what happened to both of you. But this Castellan guy, honestly, sounds like a selfish asshole. He joined the Titans because his ego was hurt? Because daddy didn't give him attention? Said Naruto in disbelief at the childish reasoning. Luke was forced to go on the run as a child for years, nearly dying dozens of times his mom would randomly scream and scare him making him run away. He watched someone he cared about almost die, and be turned into a tree. Then failing a quest, Annabeth retorted with a light glare, as while she's angry at Luke's betrayal, she still felt the need to try and defend him. I watched my mother get killed right in front of me, when I was four. And trust me when I say, it wasn't a clean death, nor was it a quick and painless one. Naruto stated, causing the daughter of Athena to fall silent and look at him in shock along with the others. It was around the same time, when my father took me in. The first year of my training was basically don't die. The second year was learning to hunt things a lot bigger than me. The third year was when he sent me to Niflheim. Fourth year was learning to kill monsters before they killed me. Fifth year I was put against the most dangerous Einarjar he could find, and they're the souls of deceased fighters that reside in Valhalla, where only the best of the best are allowed entry, along with still training even in death to prepare for Ragnarok. For the sixth year, I moved up to fighting my brothers, who really enjoyed knocking me around until I started being able to hit back, then for seventh and eighth year, I had to fight Baldur and my father, sometimes at the same time, and neither of them are very good at holding back. And every day I trained until my bones cracked, if not outright broken or shattered, until every breath I took felt like fire in my lungs. And if I messed up or disobeyed him even, once, I had to start from the very beginning. There was only one, and I mean one, singular time, where my dad showed me the slightest bit of leniency, when I disobeyed him with my training. Only for it to be in a completely backhanded manner, 
when I was tasked with a near impossible, if not suicidal, quest to redeem myself in a specific amount of time. After I was nearly killed by a troll and had a rock flicked into my stomach by my father. Something that would have gone right through me if he hadn't held back, not that it did much, before being sent out while I was still injured and fatigued. Said Naruto, while making air quotes when referring to his father's leniency, making the group looking at him in shock and horror, to hear what he went through. If he had joined the Titans after Thalia was turned into a tree, that I could understand. Anyone would be angry enough to join the Titans after losing a close friend. But he only joined years later, after failing some stupid quest when he's the one that wanted to prove himself, but got angry because someone else already did it. He joined King Cannibal because his ego was hurt, and he didn't get to prove himself, his way. Naruto said, with Anabit Thalia, and Grover unable to come up with a response to that. And you want me to feel pity, sympathy, or sadness for some spoiled, arrogant brat? The only thing I feel is the desire to rip his arms off and beat him to death with them. Before mounting his head on a pike, said Naruto, not caring how cold or uncaring he sounded. As far as he's concerned, Luke was just a selfish brat that's throwing a tantrum because his father wouldn't give him the toy he wanted, and now is deciding that if he doesn't get what he wants, then he'll just let the titans destroy everything. With the demigods and Satter remaining silent at this, before Naruto looked at his hand seeing Bianca put hers over his, looking up at the brunette to see her smiling reassuringly at him, the Yuzumaki nodding in response while moving his hand to interlace with hers. Later, it wasn't long before the sun chariot arrived at Camp Half-Blood, Apollo, having it land on the shore of the lake. Ah, another happy landing all right kitties, we have reached our destination, all passengers please exit the vehicle, said Apollo smiling brightly as he opened the doors, with the demigods and Saturn exiting first, followed by Artemis, Apollo, and the hunters. Whoa, is that a climbing wall? Nyko asked as they got off the bus, looking around the camp in amazement. Why is there lava pouring down it? Bianca questioned warily at seeing lava pouring down the climbing wall. It adds an extra challenge. Come on, we need to get you two introduced to Chiron and Mr. D. Thalia replied, motioning them to follow her and Annabeth. Zo, take the girls to cabin 8, and get Andromeda settled in a bunk, said Artemis, since she and Apollo needed to go speak with Dionysus before going to Olympus. Yes, my lady, Zo said with a short bow. I'll show you the way offered Grover, with a lieutenant looking at him annoyance. We know the way, said Zo, not wanting to be around any campers longer than she needs to. Oh, really, it's no trouble. It's easy to get lost here, if you don't. Like my old daddy goat used to say come on Grover said, tripping over a canoe before getting back up. Just entertain him for a while Zo, said Andromeda, amused at her friend's behavior, with Zo rolling her eyes. Yes, entertain the goat, princess. After all, I'm sure some of you might have memory problems in your old age. Plus the kid probably needs an escort to avoid getting lost if you aren't holding her hand, Naruto said with a smirk. Silence boy Zo retorted in annoyance. Is that an order, your majesty? Asked Naruto, the lieutenant growling with her hands twitching towards her knives. Ignore the kitty, it's only trying to beg for attention by thinking it's cute. Andromeda said. Kid, I'm adorable, said Naruto. Yeah, so adorable it makes me sick. Retorted Andromeda, covering her mouth while fake heaving. Unless that's just some bad seafood you ate, that'd also explain your breath. Naruto said waving a hand in front of his face. Andromeda, please. Artemis said, rubbing her temples. Just making sure Kitty was declawed Lady Artemis. Andromeda said, rejoining the hunters as they headed for cabin 8. Yet who's the one walking away after mommy said so? Kid Naruto called out. The daughter of Poseidon, merely raising her middle finger behind her at him. Ah, oh, and it was getting good, muttered Apollo, flinching when his twin punched him in the arm. Does he do that often? Annabeth asked as they started heading towards the big house, while looking at the D'Angelo siblings. Get on people's nerves and enjoy antagonizing them? Yes, yes he does, replied Bianca, having learned Naruto always seemed to enjoy antagonizing people whenever he could. It's really funny he actually made a teacher at Westover quit once out of frustration, Nyko said snickering at the memory, with Thalia smirking at hearing this, while Annabeth shot him a dirty look upon learning that. Naruto smirked at their words, having always enjoyed getting a reaction out of people, by taunting them to see what they'll do, though part of him admits that it felt nice to have some control over others like that. 
Given how little control he's had over his own life until recently, he liked the chance to have some control over others, no matter how little it was. It wasn't long before they arrived at the big house, which was decorated with strings of red and yellow fireballs that warmed the porch, but didn't catch anything on fire. With the group going inside, where they found Chiron and Mr. D inside playing a card game, only for them both to look at the group, shocked when they saw Artemis and Apollo. Before Mr. D narrowed his eyes at Naruto, what's an Aesir doing here? Dionysus demanded, shocking Chiron further. A Aesir? said Chiron, worried and nervous at the idea of an Aesir being here. That's what must be discussed on Olympus. We must go now, Dionysus. Artemis said, the god of wine still looking at Naruto with narrowed eyes, before letting out a huff and stood up. At least I won't be blamed once it starts raining lightning, said Dionysus, knowing their father won't be happy to learn that someone from another pantheon is here. Like it'd even tickle me, Naruto retorted, causing Dionysus to pause before sighing in annoyance. Because of course you're the Thunder Lummox's spawn. Wonderful Dionysus said sarcastically, before he, Apollo and Artemis all vanished from sight. Uh, Chiron, these are the new campers. Bianca D'Angelo and Nico D'Angelo. Annabeth introduced, with the centaur shaking off his shock and smiled in relief. Ah, then both of you succeeded, wonderful, said Chiron, relieved they were able to bring in two new campers, after so many of them have begun defecting. Yeah, bringing two and losing one. Thalia muttered sadly, making Chiron's smile fall. Losing one? What happened? And where's Andromeda? Chiron asked, worried at what may have happened to her. She's not dead, thankfully, but but she decided to join the hunters after after everything that happened with Luke, revealed Annabeth sadly, with Thalia scowling and looking away, while Chiron looked down. Ah I see, Chiron said, saddened that Andromeda's chosen to leave camp, but could also understand why she chose to join the hunters. Well then, welcome Bianca and Nico. If you'll follow me to the den, we can get started on the orientation film, said Chiron, putting on a smile that didn't reach his eyes before he looked at Naruto. And I suppose that you may watch, as well, Chiron said before trailing off. Naruto Uzumaki and, no, I don't need to see any film. I've already learned everything I've needed to before. I'll just explore the camp myself, replied Naruto, intrigued to see how exactly demigods here trained. I can show you around, Annabeth offered, still having more questions to ask about what he knew. I'll come too, said Thalia, having her own questions she wanted answers to. Okay, I'll come find you both once you're done here, Naruto said, looking at Bianca and Naiko. Okay, see you, Naruto Naiko said before following Chiron into the den. Yeah, see you, said Bianca, hiding her annoyance at Naruto being alone with Annabeth and Thalia, before following her brother and Chiron. With Naruto, Annabeth and Thalia exiting the big house to start showing him around the camp. The moment Artemis, Apollo, and Dionysus arrived on Olympus, the moon goddess had called for a meeting, even requesting that Hades be summoned as well to attend. Given what she had to tell them would be important for all of the Olympians to hear. With it not being long before all of the Olympians gathered together, all of them in their thrones and Hestia tending to the hearth in the center. Artemis, why have you called for this meeting? Questioned Zeus. Looking at his daughter, knowing she wasn't one to ever request a meeting be held, let alone ask that Hades join them. That was enough for him to know that whatever it was she wished to tell them had to be important, and possibly dangerous to Olympus. It's a matter of great importance, father. Not long ago my hunters and I had been on the trail of a monster, one I haven't sensed for centuries. However, we ended up encountering a manticore that had attacked a group of demigods, consisting of Andromeda Jackson, Annabeth Chase, Thalia Grace, and the Satter Grover Underwood. They'd been sent from camp to find two demigods by the names of Bianca D'Angelo and Nico D'Angelo. Artemis explained, causing Zeus, Poseidon and Athena to all tense at the mention of their own demigods while Hades clenched his armrests tightly at the latter two names. Are they well? Poseidon asked, concerned that something might have happened to Andromeda. Did Jackson become monster food? Said Ares with an eager smirk, with the god of the sea glaring at him along with Artemis. No, she did not, and the rest of the demigods are well. Though uncle, I gave Andromeda the offer to join the hunters, and she accepted due to said Artemis, turning to Poseidon before trailing off and glancing at Hermes, who hung his head in shame fully aware of how Luke's betrayal affected Andromeda. I see. I'm sure she will make a fine hunter, said Poseidon with a small frown that Andromeda would join the hunters, but couldn't fault her for why she would. You just love to ruin everything for me, don't you? She had so much potential, and now it's gone, Aphrodite said, 
glaring at Artemis in annoyance for recruiting Andromeda, taking away her chance at finding love or breaking hearts. Aphrodite said Zeus, giving the love goddess a warning look, before turning back to Artemis. While I'm sure you were able to handle the manicure just fine daughter, I don't see how this required a meeting to be called. Zeus stated only for Artemis to frown gravely at them all. My hunters nor I were the ones who killed the manticore, neither were any of the demigods. There was someone else present. They seemed to be a friend of the D'Angelo siblings, but they weren't Greek, nor were they Roman they were an Aesir, Artemis revealed, much to the shock of all the Olympians, aside from Apollo and Dionysus. What? They dare try to invade into our land? Which of those barbarians dared to set foot this close to Olympus? Demanded Zeus, enraged at the idea of anyone from another pantheon, had entered their territory. Tell me where they are. I'll go after them, Ares said eagerly, refusing to pass up the chance to fight an Aesir, knowing nearly all of them lived for fighting and killing, making it, so he always could get a good challenge from them. I take it this person is only a demigod, stated Hades, making everyone look at him. He's correct. If it was one of the Aesir gods, we would already know and it's unlikely any of the demigods or hunters would have survived. The fact that they are close to these two new demigods only confirms they are merely a demigod themselves. Athena added an agreement, knowing that no Aesir god would care about any Greek demigod, let alone spare them. Even so, this is still a violation for any demigod from another pantheon to enter into our lands, is nothing short of an act of war Artemis, have you dealt with insolent Aesir? said Zeus, hoping that she eliminated the demigod before they could threaten Olympus or bring more of their kind here. I couldn't, Artemis said, much to their disbelief. You couldn't handle a single demigod? questioned Hermes with a raised brow. I don't know, as with who their sire is, I had no way of knowing how powerful they were, if a battle between us would endanger my hunters or the demigods, said Artemis through gritted teeth, not liking the blow to her pride at having no idea if she'd even be able to beat Naruto, who is their sire, Artemis, Hestia asked, looking at her niece, wondering who it could be that she'd doubt her own abilities to beat them. His name is Naruto Thorson, Artemis revealed while waiting the reaction she expected the name would get from them all with it taking a few moments for the name to register, before they all heard thunder and lightning exploding overhead. That fat, drunken fool dares send his spawn into my realm, yelled Zeus, now completely enraged that a child of Thor was here, despising the Norse god above all others. Not only for the fact he dared to have domain over the power of lightning and storms, but also the fact of how popular he's become among humans and their modern media, while he only saw Thor as nothing but a cheap imitation of his own image. I'll go deal with him Ares offered, shooting up to his feet, more excited than ever to go and fight Naruto at learning he's the son of Thor. If there'd be anyone he could get a challenge from, it's a demigod of the Norse god of thunder. Sit down now, Ares Zeus ordered, refusing to have his war-obsessed son do anything that would antagonize the Aesir tribe, as much as he hated to admit that Thor alone would raise Olympus if angered. With the war god slowly sitting down, torn between his desire to go fight the Aesir demigod, and his self-preservation at not angering his father further. Lovely, as if we needed another butchering bastard around, muttered Hera, annoyed at learning a demigod of Thor was here. Already not liking the Aesir for being a bunch of bloodthirsty, sadistic and arrogant murderers, with Thor being the worst of them all. Now they had to deal with his son being in their territory, and she didn't doubt he's no different from his father. Along with the fact that Thor could be considered her husband's counterpart, in terms of their powers at least, it's as if she now had to deal with another one of Zeus's demigods. HMPH, those Norse are nothing but trouble always drinking, fighting and eating nothing but meat. Perhaps they'd be more dignified if they put some cereal in their diet. Maybe their demigods have a chance, but I doubt they're any different. Stated Demeter while crossing her arms with a huff, not having a high opinion of the Norse pantheon with how violent they are. Did he have a weapon of his own? If so did you get a good look at it and how it was made? Hephaestus asked, being more curious of the weapon Naruto would have, knowing that Norse gods tended to get dwarves to make their weapons. And if there's one race the smith god respected as much as his cyclops workers, it's the dwarves and their creations. With Hephaestus having always desired to meet them or at the very least study their creations, but knew with his father's paranoia, he'd never get the chance. He used an axe and no, I didn't get a look at it but I would guess it was made by dwarves, just as his father's hammer was, replied Artemis, having not really bothered to focus on Naruto's axe, being more focused on an Aesir being in their territory, and with what she learned from Bianca and Andromeda. 
How strong was he? What did he look like? Did he seem really violent? Aphrodite questioned eagerly, wanting to know the details of Naruto's appearance, and how strong he could be. As while most of the Norse gods might not be pleasing to look at, Aphrodite couldn't deny the appeal of how rough they could get, which would make time in bed even more fun. She just wanted to make sure he wouldn't end up hurting any of her daughters, or if she needed to try him out herself first. I wouldn't try it Dite the Aesir are evil. Apollo said hauntingly, hoping he never has to go near a Norse god again, after what happened with Sol. Do you believe he could be a threat sister? Athena asked, unable to deny her intrigue at the chance to observe a demigod from another pantheon. Even if he is an Aesir, it'd be interesting to see how different they are compared to their own. I believe he would only be a threat, if anything is done to anger him or harm those he cares for, replied Artemis, given how Naruto said the only reason he's staying is for Bianca and Naiko. I believe the more important questions are what are his intentions and why is here. Did this Naruto tell you anything, Artemis, said Poseidon, making most of the Olympians look at her. He did, he says that he came here to hide from the rest of the Aesir, as what little he did reveal is that he doesn't care much for his family, and wanted to escape them. As for his intentions, it seems that his only intention is protecting those he cares for, which at the moment is only the D'Angelo siblings, and perhaps the demigods sent to recruit them. Artemis said, with Hades relaxing slightly on his throne. Does that mean you brought him to camp? Hermes asked in concern, with most of the other Olympians that have demigods tensing, at the idea of their children being around an Aesir. Yes, as I believed it'd be better for us to keep an eye on him there, than allow him to roam around freely, and risk drawing the other Aesir here, replied Artemis, with Zeus nodding at this. Good, very good. You made the correct decision, daughter. We can't allow any outsider to move freely in our realm. But we also must ensure the Aesir doesn't step out of line, so he will be watched and eliminated, should he try threatening Olympus. Zeus said, refusing to let anything threaten his power, especially not the child of that halfwit Thor. Don't look at me. I already have enough brats to look after. Thanks by the way for taking Ashley off my hands the brat can't handle the pressure, I guess, said Dionysus, muttering the last part to himself, having no intentions of watching a demigod he didn't need to. I'll do it I won't let the runt out of my sight Ares said, hopefully with a wicked grin. I'd happily keep a close eye on him. Even make sure he doesn't even think of going against Olympus, Aphrodite offered eagerly. I would be willingly to observe the Aesir, father, Athena said, seeing it as a good chance to study him more closely. I have already decided that Artemis will be the one to watch the Aesir. She is the one who found him and brought him to camp, so she will have the responsibility of watching the boy and eliminating him, should he be plotting against Olympus, Zeus said, making Ares scowl in annoyance, while Aphrodite pouted at the missed opportunity. With Artemis also being annoyed that she's being sent to basically babysit Naruto, especially since she had other business to deal with. Father, I ask that you please choose another to watch the Aesir. I can't with the monster I must hunt down, along with investigating what Andromeda and Bianca learned from the Manticore, of more monsters rising up, and even the general being said Artemis, only for Zeus to slam his fist down on his throne, releasing a boom of thunder. Enough I will hear no more talk of the titans they are gone and imprisoned, while the general remains trapped under the sky Zeus said, still in denial that the titans were rising, that the chance of Kronos returning was a possibility. Even if they aren't, this monster is one that needs to be dealt with if I'm right. Then the bane of Olympus has returned, and if it's found, then all of us are doomed no matter what Artemis argued something that shocked and concerned the Olympians that the bane of Olympus could have reformed. Then someone else can track the monster down and deal with it. But you will be the one to watch the Aesir, and that's final, said Zeus in a tone of finality. I could track it down, it wouldn't take long for me to find where it's hiding under the sun. Apollo offered, willing to hunt down the monster in his sister's stead. Though the sun god didn't mention his other concern of wanting to check on his oracles, as after seeing Naruto, his visions of the future have started getting blurry, as if they were changing or disappearing. Something that really concerned Apollo, as he couldn't even see the great prophecy clearly anymore, showing that either the future was changing, in which case he'll hopefully get visions of it soon, or the more concerning option is that he's no longer able to see anything that's going to happen, with him hoping it's just the former, so he hoped to check on the oracles to make sure nothing was wrong with them as well. Then it's settled Apollo will go after whatever monster Artemis sensed, and Artemis will remain at camp half-blood, to ensure the Aesir stays in line, Zeus said, much to Artemis's chagrin. Though before he could call the meeting to be adjourned, 
Hestia gasped as she looked into the fire of the hearth, getting everyone's attention. Only for the goddess of the hearth to have the fire flare up and display an image of Camp Half-Blood. With all the Olympians being shocked to see Bianca and Nico, both of them having black and gold holographic helms over their heads. It is decided. The god of the dead and riches, lord of the underworld. Hail Bianca di Angelo, daughter of Hades hail Nico di Angelo, son of Hades declared Chiron as the assembled demigods bowed to the di Angelo siblings. Hades you dare break your oath, demanded Zeus, glaring at his eldest brother for breaking the oath, Demeter doing the same that he cheated on her daughter twice. Only for Hades to give Zeus a dark look as the shadows flared within the throne room, angered that he dare accuse him of breaking his oath. I have broken nothing, brother. Bianca and Nico were both born before the oath was made, kept safe and secure within the Lotus Hotel, safe from you trying to blast them again. Like you did their mother you remember, Maria Di Angelo, you remember what you did, right? Because I most certainly do Hades hissed, bitterness and protectedness lacing his tone, while Zeus's fury turned into meekness and at his brother's anger. Yes of course. Then this meeting is adjourned said Zeus, vanishing in a bolt of lightning, with the other gods soon leaving as well. Artemis sighed as she prepared to return to camp only to stop when she saw Poseidon approaching her. I take it you wish to ask about Andromeda, Artemis stated, with the sea god shaking his head. No, she has made her choice, and I won't argue against it. If joining the hunters is what she truly desires, she'll have my support, said Poseidon, not upset at Andromeda's decision, as no matter what she's still his daughter, and he can't deny the perks she'll have from being not only his daughter, but now having the blessing of the moon goddess as well. All that I ask is that you take care of her, and that if Andy ever decides that being a hunter isn't what she wants, you don't hold it against her for wanting to leave. Poseidon said, knowing Andromeda was like the sea, unable to be restrained or held down to any one thing. Of course, uncle, as long as Andromeda is one of my hunters, I will do everything in my power to ensure no harm befalls her. And should the time come she wishes to leave, I will let her go freely to follow whichever path she desires, replied Artemis, with Poseidon nodding in gratitude. She actually reminds me of Sally a little, especially her temper and tendency to backtalk a lot to anyone, especially those that annoy her. Artemis added with a small smirk at how similar Andromeda was to her mother, making Poseidon chuckle and not in agreement. She is her mother's daughter after all, stated Poseidon, remembering how Sally always was when they first met, and that Andromeda could be just as much of a spitfire as her. With that the two Olympians left, Poseidon going back to his kingdom and Artemis to camp half-blood. With Naruto, Meanwhile, after leaving the big house, Anabith and Thalia began showing Naruto around Camp Half-Blood, with the whiskered redeed taking in the side of the camp once they were outside and couldn't help but find it all rather lacking. They're training to be heroes and fight monsters, yet this barely different from a human summer camp, they'd be nothing but fresh meat for a few wolvers, thought Naruto, unimpressed with the training he was seeing being done. So, you both had questions you wanted to ask, Naruto stated as they walked through camp. Yeah, for starters, what kind of monsters have you gone against? Questioned Annabeth, wondering monsters existed in the Norse pantheon. Better question would be which ones I haven't I gone against. I've killed practically one of everything I could find, Draugr, trolls, ogres, ancients, wolvers, hellwalkers, berserkers, even a dragon, replied Naruto, much to Annabeth's and Thalia's shock, which only grew at hearing he's fought a dragon. Whoa, whoa, whoa you fought a dragon, Thalia said in disbelief that he fought a dragon. I've killed a dragon, but it wasn't easy. They're some of the strongest monsters around, but if you know how to kill them, they get easier. My Uncle Baldur actually has a dragon as his mount, helps him get around faster. Naruto said, with their eyes widening that his uncle basically had a pet dragon. What what about those other monsters? What are they like? Annabeth asked, wondering if any of the other monsters were less dangerous compared to a dragon. Well, Draugr are the most common type of monsters you'd find. They're undead warriors that refuse to be brought to Valhalla by the Valkyries, fighting them to stay on Midgard while becoming burned from the battle, and driven by hatred and a desire for revenge. They're pretty easy to beat, but they make up for it with appearing in large numbers and different types that use different weapons, shields and magic. While being either really strong or fast, trolls can be a real problem as they're smarter than your average monster, along with being very strong. They also usually carry around stone columns as a weapon, sometimes even having control over an element. Ogres are basically just smaller, dumber versions of trolls, think of them like really big, angry gorillas. Naruto explained before taking a breath and continuing. Ancients are also very dangerous and strong, not to mention nearly invincible, as their entire bodies are made of stone. 
making it impossible to actually hurt them, with the only vulnerable part being their heart in the center of their bodies, which is only exposed when they attack. So if you want to hurt them, then you need to be fast enough to dodge their attacks. Wolvers, I guess, are kind of like werewolves, but the difference is they aren't nor were they ever human, they're more like ancient spirits, but they're fierce and deadly too even experienced warriors. Hellwalkers are like Draugr and are native to Helheim, which makes them immune to the cold. So usually whenever I encounter them, I have to use my hands, since my axe only has ice powers. And Berserker's Naruto said, only for Anabit to interrupt him. I, I have heard of those, but how are they monsters? Aren't Berserkers just Norse warriors that dress up in animal skins and bones, believing it helps them channel that animal's power and fury? Said Anabit, only for the Yuzumaki to shake his head. You're partially right, Berserkers do wear the skins and bones of bears wolves and boars, to gain their strength, speed, endurance and fury. Berserkers are malevolent spirits that will fight and kill anything that moves. They don't hesitate in their attacks, nor do they feel pain. You could cut off their arm, and they wouldn't even flinch and simply keep attacking. The only thing that'll make them stop is to instantly kill them, otherwise they'll ignore any other wound, and not stop until either you die or they do. That had been one of my tests, killing a berserker. The bastard nearly cut me in half, so I made sure to return the favor, replied Naruto, with boat girls looking at him in shock and disbelief. How are you not dead? Thalia asked, wondering how it's possible for anyone to survive what he's been through. I'm too stubborn I guess, Naruto said with a shrug, not mentioning how his father could also use Njolnir as a defibrillator to restart a person's heart, if necessary, with it having been necessary more than a few times during his training. Clearly, stated Thalia, not sure if she should admire that or feel sorry for what he's gone against. What about your family? You mentioned you had two brothers and a sister. Those are Magni, Modi, and Thrud, right? Annabeth said, with the whiskered redeed nodding in response. That's right, Magni and Modi are my brothers, and complete assholes. Both of them are just as sadistic, bloodthirsty and arrogant as the rest of our family. The only positive thing I can say about Magni is that he's the less impulsive and immature of the two. Having his own twisted sense of honor, but still prefers battling strong opponents. As for Modi nobody likes Modi, and probably wouldn't care what happens to him. Naruto said, making the girls frown, especially Thalia. Seriously? He is your brother, there has to be something good about him. Thalia said, given how she looked after her own brother. Modi is nothing but a bully with powers, he never fights anyone that's stronger than him, always preferring to fight those he knows are much weaker than him, opponents who wouldn't even be able to scratch him, along with taunting and insulting people to make them angry. He said Naruto before stopping and clenching his fists in anger, with the two looking at him in concern. What did he do? Thalia asked only to subconsciously tense when Naruto opened his eyes, showing they were glowing with electricity. He insulted my mother once, so I took his mace and beat him within an inch of his life with it, breaking every bone in his body, and ripping out each one of his teeth, and swore that if he ever said anything about her again, I'd make him eat his own heart. He was at least smart enough to know that I would, Naruto said, causing the girls to shiver and not doubt he would carry out that threat. Seeing their reactions, Naruto took a few deep breaths to calm himself down before looking at them. Sorry, I just get really angry when anyone talks about my mother the way Modi did. But together, he and Magni are a dangerous team, and both of them are driven by their desire to impress our father. To be the one he chooses to inherit his hammer, said Naruto, with Anabit and Thalia nodding in response. It's it's fine. I guess anyone would get angry if their mom was insulted, said Thalia. What about Thrud? That's Thor's daughter with Sif, right? Questioned Anabit, making the whiskered redeed nod with a small smile. Yeah, that's her. Thrud is the one member of my family I'm the closest to, helping me whenever she can, and always being there when I need her. She was the first person to fully welcome me when I was brought to Asgard. She's also a born warrior, being one of the strongest fighters I know. But she's also got a temper. If you get on her bad side, then you're liable to be hit by lightning. Naruto said, making Anabit smirking slightly at Thalia. Sounds familiar, doesn't it, Thalia? Anabit stated. The daughter of Zeus rolled her eyes, but still smiled and shoved her lightly, before she looked at Naruto's axe hanging from his back. Is she the one who gave you that axe? Asked Thalia while motioning to it, making the Yuzumaki turn his head before grabbing it. The Leviathan axe? No, Thrud would have preferred giving me a sword, probably. This was actually given to me by Loki. Naruto replied, surprising them. Okay before we say anything or assume what Loki's like, what is he like? Anabit said, doubting Loki is like how he's depicted in pop culture. 
Well, for starters, Loki isn't Thor's adopted brother, I honestly have no idea where humans got that idea from. He is a Jotun though, of Frost Giant specifically, but that doesn't mean he's an actual giant though or that he has control over ice and snow. But he is good at magic and understanding languages, some that even the Allfather can't read. He also doesn't use daggers. He uses a bow instead, along with a sword called Ingrid. But one thing that's right is how he and Heimdall despise each other, said Naruto, with Annabeth and Thalia nodding in response. And I'm guessing he's good with an axe if he's the one who gave you that, stated Thalia only for Naruto to shake his head. Not really, while he's good with using an axe, it's not a weapon he uses a lot. The Leviathan axe actually belonged to his mother, Lofi, with his father then inheriting it when she died, and then Loki inherited it afterwards, before then giving it to me. Naruto replied, surprising them that he'd give Naruto an axe that both his parents used. Why is it called the Leviathan Axe? And how is it able to freeze things? Annabeth asked, curious at where the name came from and its powers. The dwarves who made it named it after Jormungandr, and infused it with the echoing screams of twenty frost trolls. And if what Loki told me is true, it's as powerful as my father's hammer. Revealed Naruto, much to their shock. That thing is as powerful as a god's weapon. Thalia said in disbelief, along with feeling a little jealous that he had such a powerful weapon. I don't know, I've never tested it out, and I'd prefer not giving my father any reasons to stop holding back during my training. Naruto said, unsure if it's true, and didn't want to risk even more pain by attacking his father with it. Before the whiskered redeed frowned as they arrived at the divine cabins, where all the demigods stayed, seeing that all of them looked different from each other. I'm guessing these are where you all stay, here, stated Naruto, motioning to the cabins arranged in a large U-shape. That's right, each of the cabins corresponds with each of the twelve Olympians. Cabin 1 is obviously Zeus's cabin, Annabeth replied, pointing to the cabin at the very front. The cabin was made entirely of white marble and looked like a mausoleum, with heavy columns. The big bronze double doors were polished in such a way to provide a holographic effect of lightning bolts passing across. And you stay there? Naruto asked, looking at Thalia with a raised brow, as the ravenette nodded with a sigh. Yeah, but don't think it's all great having a cabin to yourself, it honestly sucks. There's nothing in there except a giant statue of my dad. That feels like it's always watching you. I actually had to put my stuff in the only corner where it's not constantly watching me. Thalia said, honestly hating staying in the cabin by herself, feeling like she's back in her tree. So just another monument to his overinflated ego, of course, thought Naruto while shaking his head, having heard of Zeus's arrogance and high opinion of himself. Then I guess that one there is Hera's cabin. Why does she even have one? Naruto asked, looking at Hera's cabin next to Zeus's. It's another marble, formal-looking building, graceful with slim columns garlanded with pomegranates and flowers. It is done similarly to Zeus's cabin except smaller, however, Hera's cabin is more graceful, having slimmer columns with pomegranates and flowers around them. The walls also have images of peacocks carved on them, as well as the doors. Yeah, that's Hera's, and it's only to honor her since as the goddess of marriage, she doesn't have any demigods or affairs. Annabeth replied, making Naruto sigh tiredly. And then Cabin 3, Poseidon's Cabin, which is now empty after Andromeda chose to become a Girl Scout, said Thalia with a scowl as she looked at Poseidon's Cabin. Rather than looking like a temple or mausoleum, Poseidon's Cabin is a long, low building with windows facing the ocean. The cabin being made from rough sea stone, pieces of coral and seashell embedded into the outside walls, and a trident with a big bronze number 3 over the door. So, since the kid is a hunter now, does that mean she can't stay in there anymore? Naruto asked curious of how that worked, since Poseidon is her father yet now she's a hunter of Artemis. It depends on her I guess. I doubt Poseidon would refuse to let her stay there, but Andy will likely stay with the other hunters in Artemis's cabin. But only during the times they come to camp, as usually they're always on the move, replied Annabeth, frowning sadly at the idea Andromeda will hardly ever be at camp now. The less they're here the better, then. Thalia muttered bitterly. Is that cabin's roof actually made of grass? Said Naruto, changing the subject along with genuinely being confused by the next cabin. The cabin was a light brown color and covered in flowers, and tomato plants grow on the walls and doorway. Wild flowers and roses grow on the porch, while the roof itself seemed to be made entirely of grass. Yep, that's Demeter's cabin. Don't ask how the roof can be real grass. It's better for your sanity to just accept it, said Thalia, shaking her head, having chosen to just blame magic for anything she hasn't figured out, 
while Naruto nodded slowly in response. After that is the Ares's cabin, Annabeth said, looking at the next cabin in annoyance. The cabin was badly painted red, and has a large boar's head over the door with barbed wire on the roof. There have been mentions of the cabin being lined with landmines, while the three could hear loud rock music constantly blaring from it. I already don't like it. Naruto stated in annoyance at the loud music, before turning to the next cabin. The cabin itself didn't have anything special about it, being the most simple looking as grey building with plain white curtains and a design of an owl over the door. And that must be Athena's cabin, where you stay, said Naruto, looking at Annabeth, the daughter of Athena nodding with a pleased expression. That's right, and it looks way better on the inside, it's filled with thousands of books and old scrolls to read 3D models of buildings, blueprints, old war maps and armor cupboards filled with materials to build things, as well as smart boards to write down anything we need. And I'm the head counselor of the cabin Annabeth said, puffing her chest out in pride, making Naruto smile at her enthusiasm while Thalia rolled her eyes fondly. Has anyone told you? You look very cute when you're excited, Naruto said, causing the blonde demigod to blush, even more so when Thalia patted her head. He's not wrong, Annie. You always look so adorable when talking about books and buildings, said Thalia, laughing when Annabeth smacked her hand. S.H. Shut it. Both of you, and I'm not cute said Annabeth crossing her arms in annoyance, only for her blush to return when Naruto leaned in close to her. Then what about beautiful, said Naruto, laughing as well when she quickly pushed him back and turned away to hide her red face. WH whatever the next one is Apollo's cabin Annabeth said, motioning to the next cabin, with the Yuzumaki squinting his eyes when he looked at it. Given the fact that the entire cabin is made of solid gold and was made to glow during the daytime, it's hard to tell if the gold is reflecting light or generating it. Either Skirt Jazzer Jr. needs to turn down the light on that thing, or I'm throwing it right at his damn chariot, said Naruto, smirking happily when the bright glow instantly faded away. Nice, Thalia said, smirking as well at the sight before scowling again as they turned to the next cabin. It was an all-silver cabin with silver curtains, decorated with paintings and carvings of wild animals, but mostly the stag. I take it that's Kid 2's cabin. At least it's not glowing like a disco ball, said Naruto. It does, but only at night, otherwise during the day it looks like a regular cabin, Annabeth said with a small frown, making Naruto nod before looking to the next one. Looking at the cabin in surprise at how it looked more like a small factory, with brick walls and smokestacks like the forges and lots of gears around the entrance. That looks like a dwarf's dream shop, thought Naruto, knowing dwarves would enjoy having a shop like that. That's Hephaestus's cabin, they're the ones in charge of maintaining the weapons and armor for campers, Annabeth said. I'm sure they'd fit in with the dwarves if they're good in the forges, Naruto said before gaining a blank look at the next cabin. It was a wooden cabin with a painted blue roof pillars, checkerboard deck with steps and gray walls. It also has a pink door and potted carnations by the window. And even from here, Naruto could smell the perfume coming off of it. What is that thing? Questioned Naruto. Not sure if it could even be called a cabin, making the daughter of Zeus snicker. That's Aphrodite's cabin or, as I like to call it, the Barbie house. Do yourself a favor and ignore it, though do be on guard. Knowing Aphrodite's children, once they see you, they'll probably want some alone time, said Thalia turning to Naruto and looking him up and down, knowing they'd be after him with his looks and physique. Enjoying the view, Naruto said with a smirk. Yes, Thalia said shamelessly. Thalia said Anbeth in disbelief she'd say that. Don't pretend you weren't looking too Annie. I know you were, said Thalia, making the daughter of Athena blush again, but did glance at the whiskered Redeed a few times. I don't mind, look all you want. Or take a picture, whichever you prefer. Naruto said, winking at Annabeth who looked at him in annoyance, which was ruined by her growing blush. Are you sure you shouldn't be in that cabin? Annabeth said, letting out a huff as they went to the next cabin. With it looking to be the largest, oldest and most worn looking peeling brown paint, and a caduceus over the door. What happened to that cabin? Naruto asked with a raised brow, wondering why it looked so rundown, while Thalia and Annabeth frowned. That's the Hermes's cabin, where the unclaimed demigods go since Hermes welcomes them given how he's the patron of travelers and roads. But it's really crowded, Annabeth said, making Naruto frown. Let me guess, either because the Olympians don't care enough to claim their own kids the moment they show up, forget about them, 
or don't care enough to actually claim them, or their parents don't have cabins, said Naruto, not doubting most of the unclaimed demigods are children of minor gods and goddesses that don't have cabins, all of the above, but mostly because their parents don't have cabins, so they don't bother, said Thalia with her frown growing, while Naruto shook his head. Do any of the Olympians even claim their kids the moment they show up? Or do they have to risk their lives just to be acknowledged? Naruto asked, wondering if any Olympians even cared enough to claim their children when they arrive. Some of them, Apollo, Demeter, Hermes, Aphrodite and my mom. They all claim their children the moment they arrive. But for the rest said Annabeth. Ignore you and probably don't even remember if someone is their kid or not. Said Naruto, with Annabeth sighing and nodded in response. Well, what would you expect? They're gods, they're probably too busy to care or notice. Thalia said with a shrug. Having accepted that most gods don't care about what the person they slept with did, after all said and done, nor when their children are forced to run from monsters for years, that's no excuse, if they can't be bothered to care enough about their kids to even claim them, then they shouldn't have kids at all. They only care enough when you can do something for them. Naruto said coldly, for how much he hated his father, at least he showed up not even a day after his mother was killed and brought him to Asgard making sure he still had a home and family. Even with how things turned out for him, it was still better to be acknowledged than ignored until he was useful. Annabeth and Thalia didn't have anything to say to that, knowing there wasn't anything they could say since he was right. Their parents only acknowledged them when they needed something, with it being incredibly rare when they did actually give any assistance. And the last one is Dionysus's cabin, said Annabeth as they went to the last cabin. It looked like a regular log cabin with the roof and walls lined with grapevines, making it look like the simplest out of the cabins. Looking around, Naruto frowned when he didn't see any other cabins, making him look at the girls. Shouldn't there at least be a Hestia cabin and a Hades cabin too? Naruto asked, figuring those two, more than any other god and goddess, would have cabins. Hestia doesn't have a cabin, since she gave up her throne as an Olympian to Dionysus in order to prevent any infighting on who would give up their throne to him. And Hades he's not exactly welcomed, and I don't think his kids would be, said Thalia said, knowing how terrified everyone is of her uncle and any kids he had likely wouldn't be welcomed. Wow the eldest of the Olympians and the eldest of the big three, both without any cabins. Yet Hera has one that will never be used, while the kid two's cabin is only used when the girl scouts are here. There must be a joke in there, somewhere, Naruto said with a humorless smile. Though he wasn't really surprised, knowing the reputation Hades had, not helped by how he's constantly portrayed as the villain in pop culture, an unfortunate fate that most deities associated with anything considered evil suffers. Ironic, how the ones portrayed as heroes are usually the worst, while the ones portrayed as villains are actually pretty nice or at least neutral, and keep to themselves, thought Naruto, shaking his head before he spotted someone standing by the hearth and tending to it. They were a beautiful and petite girl with a youthful appearance. She has blue eyes that glowed from the fire, and mid-thigh length black hair tied into two twin tails, which reach down to her mid-thighs. Her hair is tied with hair accessories that feature blue and white petals, along with bell-shaped ornaments. She also possessed a small frame which was emphasized by her surprisingly large breasts. Her attire consisted of a white mini dress with a blue ribbon around her neck, and one tied under her breasts around her arms, a pair of white gloves, along with being barefoot. Looking at the girl, Naruto already knew she wasn't human from the power she possessed, but more than that the calming aura she seemed to exude, along with the feeling of tranquility, something he hasn't felt in a long time. Hestia, thought Naruto, knowing exactly who it is, and that only one Greek god could feel this peaceful and kind. As if hearing her name, Hestia looked towards Naruto and smiled at him, making the whiskered Redeed smile slightly at how warm it was. You can see Aunt Hestia, then, Thalia said, leaning in close to Naruto, who looked at her in surprise. You can see her too, said Naruto, making the ravenette nod in response, giving her aunt a small smile and wave. Yeah, I've seen her appear a few times to tend the hearth and even talk to her. Since after after I came out of the tree, I really wasn't sure what to do. Not helped that the moment I came out I was put in my dad's cabin, and had to deal with that creepy statue. So, I'd usually come out in the middle of the night just to get some space and alone time and she helped me relax while I was easing into everything, said Thalia, thankful for Hestia's help in feeling more at peace when things started getting too stressful. It always helped having someone to talk to, or just having them be there, Naruto said, understanding the feeling. Indeed it does, and no you'll be welcomed by my hearth anytime, Thorson, 
Hearing the voice in his head surprised the Yuzumaki for a moment, but managed to not react, and instead nod to the petite goddess in thanks, with Hestia's smile growing before she disappeared from their sight. The three then continued the tour, with the girls showing Naruto the dining pavilion, the amphitheater, the camp store, the armory, the archery field, and the sword fighting arena. And next we have the Pegasus stables, and a bit said as they approached the stables, where the Pegasi were kept. Speaking of, do Valkyries actually ride Pegasi themselves, or do you just call them winged horses? Asked Thalia. The Valkyrie don't have winged horses, that's another misinterpretation. They only ride regular horses through the sky over battlefields, collecting the souls of the dead. However, the strongest Valkyries do possess their own wings to fly around with. Naruto replied, making the girls nod. How exactly are Valkyries chosen? Are they handpicked by someone or can anyone become a Valkyrie? Annabeth asked. Anyone can train to become a Valkyrie. First they have to train to be the best they can be, then hope they get Auden's attention, and earn the chance to join the Valkyrie's ranks, said Naruto as his mind turned to his sister, as well as her friend's comrades, Hildra and Ortland, with the trio making up one of the best Valkyrie teams among the Norse Pantheon's ranks. Thinking of trying to get your own wings Annie? Thalia said teasingly, making the daughter of Athena scoff. No thanks, I'd rather not have to go die in battle just to get a chance to be picked up by a Valkyrie, though, I'm sure you'd fit in perfectly with them. High up in the sky, seeing everything down below, said Annabeth, smirking at the Ravenette, with Thalia being unable to help but pale and shiver at the idea of that happening. Before she narrowed her eyes at Annabeth, you were nicer when you were seven, Thalia said, though she did feel some pride at how sassy Annabeth's become. I learned from the best, didn't I? Annabeth stated before they arrived at the stables finding someone else already there, with Naruto unable to help but pause when he saw them. It was a 14-year-old, maybe 15, girl with fair, pale skin, dark black hair that fell past her shoulders, and bright, sky-blue eyes, with her attire consisting of an orange camp half-blood shirt, a dark pink winter jacket with fur lining the collar, dark blue jeans with pink trimming, and black riding boots, along with a dagger strapped to her right hip. Naruto was also surprised at how developed the girl was, much more so than Bianca, Annabeth, Thalia, and Andromeda, with her looking even better by the aura around her, which made her seem like the most beautiful girl he's ever seen in his life. Yet despite that he could feel she was strong as well. Strength and beautiful, my kind of girl, Naruto thought, looking her up and down before blinking when Thalia punched his shoulder. Hey snap out of it before you start drooling said Thalia in annoyance at the dazed expression he got at the sight of the new girl while well, said girl had approached them with an amused look on her face. While I usually don't mind being looked at, it'd be nice if I knew the name of a new admirer, first, said the girl, smiling in amusement, making Naruto blush lightly and mentally curse himself. All right? Sorry about that. I just felt hypnotized by your beauty. And that's not a pickup line, I swear Naruto said, adding the last part quickly, making the girl giggle, while Annabeth and Thalia couldn't help but feel slightly annoyed for some reason. It's fine and expected. Actually, most people have trouble even speaking around me when I'm not controlling myself. Better, said the girl, with Naruto no longer feeling the same draw towards her, at least not as strongly. Yeah, so, going by your looks and abilities, I'd say you're a daughter of Aphrodite, said Naruto, figuring that's the only deity she could be related to. Yeah, she is. Naruto, this is Selena Borgard, the head counselor of Cabin 10. Selena, this is Naruto, which do you prefer? Annabeth asked, looking at him, unsure if he'd prefer Yuzumaki or Thorson. Either's fine. It's nice to meet you, Selena. I'm Naruto Thorson or Yuzumaki, said Naruto, not minding either name, as he wants to honor his mother by still using her name. And no matter what, he is a son of Thor. You too, Naruto, and Thorson, that's a unique name, said Selina, shaking the whiskered Redeed's hand, curious of a name like before looking at Thalia and Annabeth. Is he one of the new campers you were sent after? Selina asked, confused when they shook their heads. Nope, but we did pick up two new ones. Whiskers here, though, isn't even Greek. Thalia revealed, much to Selina's shock. What? But then what are you? Cause I doubt you're completely human, said Selina, looking him up and down, being able to feel the power coming off him. I am a demigod, just not a Greek one, replied Naruto, not really caring who learns who he is, given the Olympians will know soon enough, if they don't already. 
That still doesn't make much sense. There are other gods besides the Olympians, Selena asked in disbelief, while Annabeth and Thalia nodded in response. Yeah, just something else we weren't told, muttered Thalia, still annoyed something like that was kept secret. Did none of you really suspect, even a little bit, that other pantheons existed? Said Naruto, wondering how they could accept the existence of the Greek pantheon, but doubt that other pantheons could exist. I was running from monsters for two years since I was ten, and then in a tree for another six years, questioning the existence of other gods, wasn't exactly a priority for me, Thalia said, crossing her arms in annoyance. I just didn't think about it, admitted Annabeth, realizing she should have at least suspected the possibility. I thought that it may be possible when I first learned the truth. Given that if the Greek gods were really, then what else could be real too? Selena said, having considered the possibility, but brushed it off since no one else seemed to consider the chance other pantheons existing. Keep that mindset. It's better to believe that there's at least a possibility that's the case and be prepared if you encounter something that wants you dead, said Naruto, knowing it'd be more dangerous for them to doubt something exists, only to end up coming face to face with it. With the girls nodding at his words, realizing that anything really is possible in the world they live in. So what pantheon do you come from, and who's your godly parent? Questioned Selena, curious of where he came from and whose son he is. The Norse pantheon, and I told you who my father is when I introduced myself. Naruto replied with a small smirk, making the daughter of Aphrodite frown slightly before her eyes widened. Wait, you said your name is Thorson? As in Selena said in surprise. Yes, his father is Thor, said Annabeth, much to Selena's growing surprise. And no, he's not like he's depicted in modern media, he's apparently a giant asshole, added Thalia, causing her to frown slightly. Oh, does that mean he's not said Selena before trailing off, unsure how to ask? He's not a muscle-bound superstar like Chris Hemsworth? No, no, he is not. Well, he's strong. He looks nothing like that, said Naruto, knowing that's not even close to how his father looks. Huh. Well, I'm sure my sisters and some of my brothers will be disappointed by that, Selena said. And are you? Naruto asked with a raised brow, only for the Ravenette to smirk and look him up and down. With you around, not in the slightest, replied Selena, making the Yuzumaki smirk. Glad to hear it, said Naruto, before he was grabbed by Annabeth and Thalia who started dragging him away. Okay, let's go Romeo. Thalia said unsure why she's feeling annoyed only that she is. You don't need to drag me, I'd happily follow two beauties such as yourselves. I'm sure the view of you two in front of me is amazing. Naruto said with smirk causing both girls to blush, while Selena giggled at the sight. Hope to see you around, Naruto said Selena giving him a wink before returning to tending to the Pegasi. Later, Naruto saw more of the camp as Annabeth and Thalia showed him around, while also asking more questions. Though he still couldn't shake his disappointment at how lackluster a camp full demigods was, having expected more. Even the forest that's filled with monsters isn't all that impressive, given campers shouldn't go in unless they're armed or with a companion. If they wanted to actually get stronger, they should go in with nothing but their own hands, and not leave, until they've killed something that'd be more likely to kill them. Well, that's about everything there is to see, Annabeth said once the tour came to an end at the amphitheater. So, do you have any questions for us? Said Thalia as she and Annabeth sat down. For the two of you? Not at the moment, but the person that's been following us, just one. You finally gonna come out or keep hiding in the shadows? Said Naruto, causing both female demigods to tense and reach for their weapons at learning they've been followed, only to freeze when they saw someone rise out of the shadows, paling slightly at who it was. Though while only Annabeth had seen them in person, Thalia could guess for herself who it was. All three of the demigods knowing they were standing before a god. They were very tall, imposing and very muscular god with albino white skin. In, that looked like it had never seen the sun, intense black eyes that looked like either the eyes of a genius or a madman, shoulder-length dark black hair with bangs hanging over his forehead, with him wearing long, flowing black robes that looked to be made of shadows and tortured souls that were trying to escape, while floating just above his head was a crown made entirely of black flames. You must be Hades, then, Naruto said, making Thalia and Annabeth look at him like he was crazy, wondering how he could look so relaxed and calm. You know who I am, and could even feel my presence despite my helm's power, stated Hades in intrigue. It's not that hard to guess who you are, 
Given all the other Olympians are rather flashy in what they do, if Sunspot and Kid 2 are anything to go by, as for sensing you, I've simply gotten good at being able to tell when there's something dangerous is nearby, replied Naruto, with the Lord of the Dead nodding at this, before glancing at Thalia and Annabeth. Be at peace, niece. If I still sought to bring you harm, I'd have done so by now. My business is with the Aesir, Hades said before turning back towards Naruto. So you all know. I'm actually surprised I didn't have to return any lightning bolts to your paranoid brother, Naruto said, having fully expected Zeus to try blasting him at least once. Give it time, I'm sure he'll do so eventually. But no. Instead he's given Artemis the order to watch and kill you, if you prove to be a threat. I would also be ready for Ares, despite what my brother has said. He'll likely be looking for an opportunity to try fighting you. And there's Aphrodite I'm sure you can guess her intentions, said Hades, making Naruto sigh in annoyance. Great, dealing with Kid 2 even more and being targeted by a god of war, thought Naruto, annoyed that he now had to deal with Artemis as a babysitter, but Ares wanting to fight him as well. He wasn't even surprised at the mention of Aphrodite, knowing she wasn't the first love goddess he's had to deal with, and likely won't be the last. Well, thanks for the information, but I'm guessing the real reason you're here is because of Bianca and Naiko, Naruto said, causing Annabeth's and Thalia's eyes to whiten in shock and realization, before frowning at learning that hate had broken his oath as well. Yes, and before either of you even try thinking of accusing of me of breaking my oath unlike my brothers, I don't break my word lightly. My children were born long before it was made and kept safe with the Lotus Eaters, to ensure you father didn't kill them, like he did their mother, Hades said, giving Thalia a dark look, stopping them before they could say anything. I have already claimed them as my children, and knowing how the rest of this camp views me, I doubt they will be warmly welcomed. So, I ask that you ensure they are looked after while you're here, said Hades, with Naruto nearly nodding. You don't even need to, I'm not going to let anything happen to them, replied Naruto, the king of the underworld nodding in response before they felt the ground begin to shake. The demigod's attention then turned towards the cabins, when they saw the ground split open beside the Hermes's cabin, as another one rose up from the ground, accompanied by the wailing of tortured souls. With the new cabin being made entirely of solid black obsidian with no windows, Heavy columns on the portico with skulls lining the top of it, torches on either side of the top of the stairs, burning with green Greek fire, a horned skull above the doors, and a bident in the middle of them, with a bronze thirteen in between the two prongs. Before Hades snapped his fingers, causing Naruto to be surrounded by a black aura. There, you are now allowed to enter my cabin, said Hades, surprising the girls while Naruto nodded in thanks. Is that even allowed? questioned Annabeth, motioning to the new thirteenth cabin wondering if it's even allowed for gods to create their own cabins. Is anyone going to try stopping me? Hades retorted, making the daughter of Athena full silent. One last thing. This is your one and only warning. If you ever do anything to hurt Bianca in any way at all, remember that I've spent millennia torturing souls while thinking of thousands of new ways to make the afterlife an unending nightmare. Remember that and use your imagination to think on what I'd do to the person that hurt my daughter, and know that anything you can imagine will be nothing to what I will do to you. Do you understand, Thorson? said Hades with a mad and demented gleam in his eyes, making the female demigod shiver at what he had in store for the whiskered redeed. That will never happen, whether it's unintentional or not, I would never do anything to hurt Bianca. And if anyone tried, then they can try it without the benefit of a spine, Naruto said, making Hades smirk in approval, along with seeing the resolve in his eyes. Good, Hades said before his body dissolved into shadows as he returned to the underworld. Once he was gone, Annabeth and Thalia breathed more easily, relieved at no longer being in the presence of one of the big three, before they then turned to Naruto. How could you remain so calm, like that? questioned Thalia, wondering how he didn't even flinch the entire time Hades was there. I've learned to get a good hold of my emotions, to not show what I'm actually feeling. And when you spend most of your life around gods that live for fighting, especially those you have no way of knowing what they'll do, you learn to get used to the presence they have, replied Naruto before he left the amphitheater to go find Bianca and Naiko. Since if Hades had claimed them, then by now nearly the entire camp would know, and he wasn't going to let anyone do or say anything to them, just because of who their father is. With Thalia and Annabeth following him, 
guessing where he was going and despite their own issues with the Lord of the Dead. They also didn't want Bianca and Nico think they were alone, even more so for Thalia, since they were her cousins. It didn't take long to find the Di Angelo siblings, finding them with Grover by the cabins, before they saw the three demigods approaching them. Naruto guess what happened? After we saw the orientation film, Chiron and Grover started showing us around camp. They have everything here from my game well, almost everything since the monsters are kept in the forest, and Chiron said we couldn't go in without any weapons. But it's still so cool being here and then me and Bianca were just claimed. Our dad is Hades that's cooler than anyone else. It could have been said Nico. Amazed and excited that his father is also his favorite Might the Magic card. Then it just means you have a lot to live up to, and a lot of training to do to master the power you have. Naruto said with a smirk, patting him on the head, before he looked at Bianca, who wasn't as excited as her brother. You alright Bianca? Questioned Naruto, with the brunette nodding in response. Yeah, just a lot to take in is all. Learning our dad is Hades of all people. And not everyone seemed excited when we were claimed. Bianca replied, having noticed how when they were claimed plenty of campers looked either scared, nervous or wary at the sight of them. Yeah everyone did seem like they were scared of us, said Naiko with a frown, his excitement lowering at remembering the reaction from their claiming. Unfortunately, that's to be expected, given his domains Hades doesn't have the best reputation, which also extends to any kids he has, said Naruto, making the siblings frown at hearing this, along with worrying Bianca, at how they'll be treated by the other campers. But if anyone tries giving either of you trouble, just let me know and I'll deal with them. Naruto added, making Bianca smile while Naiko grinned at this. Are you going to hit them with lightning? Naiko asked, only to yelp when Bianca smacked him. Naiko he shouldn't hit people with lightning said Bianca, not wanting him to sound so eager at the idea of Naruto striking anyone with lightning. You can also come to us too if you're having any trouble. I can even be the one to help you get all caught up on Greek history and everything else you need to know. Though we may have to expand the lessons given that there's now a lot more information I need to know. Annabeth said with a thoughtful frown, given with the knowledge other pantheons existing, she had a lot more research to do. Annie's right, aside from giving yourselves headaches by reading too much. If you have any problems we can help, we're cousins after all. And I will hit someone with lightning, said Thalia with a smirk. Why yeah, I'm here if you need anything too, since I am the one who found you both. Added Grover, wanting to offer his own help despite his nervousness with them being Hades' kids. I can help too, if either of you ever need it, someone said, making the demigods and Satyr look to see Andromeda walking towards them, making Thalia scowl. Oh really? You can help them? Here, I thought you'd be too busy with the other girl scouts. In fact, shouldn't you go back to your new cabin? Said Thalia, with the daughter of Poseidon frowning at her words. I've already gotten settled into the cabin, and Zoe said I'd start training tomorrow. But that doesn't mean I still won't help when I can. Said Andromeda, with Thalia scoffing at this and crossing her arms. Help? And how will you help when you all leave to go running around the country? Why would you even want to? I thought you didn't want to be the hero anymore? Or was that a lie? Thalia demanded, causing Andromeda to clench her fists. Just because I won't be at camp, doesn't mean I won't still help. I'll be out fighting and hunting monsters, and clearly a lot are going to start showing up if Thorne was telling the truth. Andromeda retorted, killing monsters, wow, such a big help. Like none of us can easily do the same. No we need the great hunters to do it for us. Thalia said sarcastically, with both girls looking at each other with narrowed eyes. Annabeth and Grover looked between the two nervously, worried they may start fighting each other. Something Bianca noticed and moved to stand in front of Naiko, despite his efforts to keep trying to watch and see what'll happen. While Naruto frowned as he looked between Thalia and Andromeda, sensing the growing tension, making him not even feel the desire to taunt the hunter. Thalia, I actually wanted to ask, since we both have control over lightning and storms, what can you do? Naruto asked, looking at the daughter of Zeus, wanting to change the subject and being genuinely curious, of how her control over lightning measured up to his own. With it thankfully working as the ravenette smirked and held up her hand, which sparked with electricity. I'm pretty good if I do say so, myself. I can sense lightning and electricity wherever I am, create blasts of static shock strong enough to knock someone off their feet and through the air, even fry someone's eyebrows off if I want to. I can also create even stronger bolts of electricity and focus my electricity into a shield whenever I'm hit to blast someone back. And I'm able to bring down lightning bolts from the sky that can be strong enough to stun or vaporize someone, and focus them enough to channel the electricity through a building's wiring, 
without damaging the building itself. As for storms, I can create a storm of lightning around me when I fight, said Thalia with a proud smirk at how strong her electrokinesis is, while Naruto nodded at what she can do. Very good for a beginner, said Naruto with a smirk, causing Thalia's smirk to vanish glare at him in annoyance. Beginner, I've been able to control lightning since I was 10 and turn dozens of monsters into dust with it. I am not a beginner, Thalia retorted, refusing to let her abilities be called those of a beginner. To me you are. I learned how to bring down lightning before I turned 6, and I've only gotten better. Everything you can do, I can do better. While my control over storms is clearly superior, if all you can do is create a storm of lightning around yourself, Naruto said as his smirk grew, along with the daughter of Zeus's annoyance. Thalia growled an annoyance that he thought he could do everything she could and was better at controlling their shared elements. Before the Ravenette soon smirked, wanting the chance to show him who's really better. Okay, then prove it. You against me, and we'll see who's better at using storms and lightning, said Thalia, with the whiskered redeed smirk growing even bigger. You're on, just don't get too upset when you lose, replied Naruto, feeling eager at the chance to see how she measures up. As long as you don't start crying when I knock you on your ass, whiskers, Thalia retorted, fully intending to take him down. Should should we be worried? Naiko asked as Naruto and Thalia walked away to prepare for their match. Probably, yes, said Annabeth dryly, hoping that whatever they end up doing, the camp is still standing at the end. Later, it wasn't long before Naruto and Thalia arrived at the arena with all the campers, hunters, satyrs and nymphs having filled the seats. Word having spread that Thalia would be fighting someone, making everyone curious to see who'd challenge the daughter of Zeus to a fight. With several girls and a few boys all looking at Naruto eagerly when he appeared. Though everyone, aside from those who were already aware, had been shocked when Dionysus returned along with Artemis, none of them expecting the moon goddess to be staying at camp with her hunters. But everyone also quickly noticed the fact Andromeda was sitting with the hunters and was dressed like them. Much to their disbelief, sadness and anger from a few at seeing she joined the hunters. Heroes today, we welcome two new campers, Chiron declared before looking at Dionysus, who rolled his eyes and sighed before standing. Yeah, yeah, please welcome the new brats, Brandy, Dakota and Nikki Dangler, said Dionysus, only for Chiron to whisper in his ear. I mean, Bianca D'Angelo and Nico D'Angelo. Also, we now have this kid to deal with, who's thankfully not another camper NATO Yukij, Dionysus said, with Chiron whispering in his ear again. It's Naruto Force and get it right next time, Daphne said Naruto, glaring at the wine god in annoyance. Yeah, yeah, whatever, Naruto Force and the son of Thor Dionysus declared much to everyone's shock, before they all looked at the fight in renewed interest and excitement. While they were shocked at suddenly learning the existence of Norse gods, they were now excited to see a fight between two children of lightning gods, even more so with the reputation Thor has. Ready to go down, whiskers, Thalia asked tauntingly while bringing out her spear and shield. As long as you can make this entertaining for me, said Naruto, grabbing his axe with it being coated in ice. Not a moment later, Naruto threw his axe straight at Thalia who quickly raised her shield, grunting when the axe impacted it. The Ravenette feeling her arm vibrate from the blow before she smacked the axe aside with her shield, and rushed at the whiskered redeed. Thalia thrust her spear at Naruto, only for him to immediately sidestep the thrust, before then bending backwards, when she swiped her spear towards him. Before she instantly dropped into a crouch, dodging the leviathan axe when it came flying at her back, returning to Naruto's waiting hand, with the Yuzumaki giving a shout and bringing it down onto her. Acting fast, Thalia raised her shield, blocking the axe, which also released a burst of electricity and ice from the collision, sending both demigods skidding away from each other. The daughter of Zeus was then forced to jump to the side when Naruto slammed his axe into the ground, creating ice spikes, before then ripping out towards her, sending a wave of ice at Thalia, which she quickly avoided. Rolling across the ground, Thalia threw her shield at Naruto, who smacked it aside with his axe, giving Thalia time to close the distance between them, delivering a long sweeping strike with her spear, which Naruto blocked with the back of his axe, only for Thalia to smirk and spin her spear around to slam the end of the shaft into his chin, only to be surprised when his hand shot out, grabbing the spear before it hit him, smirking at Thalia, before he slammed his foot into her chest, making her gasp as she was knocked back, gritting her teeth from the strike, Thalia stood up and saw Naruto toss aside her spear, 
No weapon, no shield. What are you going to do now? Naruto asked with a smirk, while Thalia quickly glanced around for her shield and spear were, seeing the former wasn't far from where she was standing. Make you beg me to go easy, retorted Thalia, with the son of Thor shivering dramatically. Before to Thalia's shock, he held his axe in both hands, as it began glowing before a beam of pure ice and frost was shot at her. Jumping at out of the way of the beam, Thalia ran too towards her shield, shivering slightly from the feeling of the icy beam following her. With her feeling a sudden brush against her back, making the ravenette dive to the ground, managing to grab her shield. Raising it, Thalia grunted as the beam hit the shield, and began encasing it in ice before she held up her free hand, as it sparked with electricity. Glancing over her shield, Thalia thrust her hand forward, releasing a blast of static shock at the Leviathan axe, breaking the ice covering it and stopping the beam. Not stopping there, Thalia channeled electricity into her shield before slamming it into the ground, releasing waves of electricity across the ground towards the Yuzumaki. Doubting that it'd do much, if anything, to Naruto, Thalia rushed towards where her spear was lying, only to come to a stop when the Leviathan axe came flying past her. Acting on instinct, Thalia raised her shield, gritting her teeth as she skidded back when Naruto slammed his fist into it. The Ravenette dug her feet into the ground, coming to a stop, before thrusting her shield to slam into Naruto's face, only for the whiskered redeed to grab the shield before it could hit him but grunted lightly when Thalia slammed her foot into his chest, knocking him back, before she then quickly recovered her spear and aimed it at him, firing a blast of electricity at him. With Naruto raising his hand and stopping the electricity, while Thalia moved out of the way of the Leviathan axe as it returned to him, you actually managed to hit me. Shame it only tickled, said Naruto with a smirk, which Thalia returned as her spear sparked with electricity. Give me a minute, you'll be feeling a lot more than a tickle, Thalia said before swinging her spear at him, unleashing an arc of electricity. With Naruto holding his hand out, absorbing the electricity when at him before channeling it into his axe, which he then launched at Thalia, making her dive out of the way only for the Ravenette to be surprised when the moment the Leviathan axe hit the ground, it released a blast of electricity. The blast hitting Thalia and sending her flying back as she skidded across the ground. What do you think? Did that tickle or do you want me to go even harder? Naruto said as his axe returned to him, while Thalia got up and rolled her shoulders. Bring it, I'll take anything you can give, said Thalia, smirking eagerly as storm clouds began gathering in the sky. Returning the smirk, Naruto began spinning the Leviathan axe, charging it with electricity before launching it at Thalia, making her eyes widen. At how much faster it was coming at her. Raising her shield, Thalia grunted from the impact before releasing a burst of electricity from her shield, sending the axe flying away. But before she could retaliate, Naruto clapped his hands together, unleashing a boom of thunder and shockwave, forcing nearly all of the spectators to cover their ears at the loud boom. Thalia having the brunt of it as the shockwave sent her crashing into the arena wall, gasping for air as she hit the ground. What the Tartarus was that? Thalia said as she stood up on shaky legs, not believing what just happened. God of Thunder, remember, maybe it's not as powerful as lightning, but having a clap of thunder and the resulting shock waves that hits you can definitely be more painful, not to mention loud, said Naruto before clapping his hands again, releasing another shock wave. Though rather than throw Thalia back, it just forced her to cover her ears, with Naruto summoning the Leviathan axe back to him and rushed her. Jumping into the air, Naruto held his axe up and shouted as he brought it down towards Thalia. Gritting her teeth at the ringing in her ears, Thalia managed to focus enough to raise her spear, calling down a lightning bolt straight on top of her and Naruto. Sensing and seeing the lightning coming towards them, Naruto stopped his attack and threw the Leviathan axe, shocking everyone when it actually cut the lightning bolt in half. Even more shocking when Naruto held his hands out, calling both halves of the lightning bolt towards him, and held them in his hands. With the whiskered redeed unable to help but grin at the feeling of the lightning rushing through his body. Before he slammed his fists down onto Thalia's shield, the Ravenette managing to raise it in time to block his attack. The resulting collision unleashing an explosion of electricity that engulfed the arena ground, with Artemis and Dionysus putting up a barrier so it didn't end up injuring anyone. With Thalia gritting her teeth, surprised that her aegis hasn't already broken from the damage done to it, while also feeling the ground beneath her begin cracking. Before she gave a shout and thrust her shield forward, pushing Naruto back, releasing a ball of electricity that slammed into him, knocking him away from the Ravenette. 
Not stopping there, Thalia raised her spear into the air with bolts of lightning jumping in between the storm clouds, before she cut her spear through the air, towards Naruto, causing multiple lightning bolts to shoot down towards him. Seeing the lightning bolts coming down towards him, Naruto recalled his axe, and began spinning it around above him, with the storm clouds beginning to swirl around right above him. Before the Yuzumaki began pulling the clouds down and wrapping them around Thalia's lightning bolts, much to her shock. With it not being long before a tornado of thunderclouds and lightning was above the arena, much to everyone's shock, while Thalia felt a slight nervousness at getting hit by that. Only for the Yuzumaki to then swung his axe through the air, causing the tornado to disperse, confusing the daughter of Zeus. This is just a sparring match, not a death match. Naruto said at her confused look, not intending to do anything that'd end in her being seriously injured or killed. I said I can take anything you can throw at me, Thalia said in annoyance, with Naruto nodding in response. I'm sure you can, but it is your first time. I don't want to scare you away by getting too rough, said Naruto with a smirk, which Thalia returned. Shame, because I like it rough, said Thalia before shooting blasts of electricity at him, with Naruto's smirk only growing, as his eyes glowed brightly, while his body began emitting lightning. Before the son of Thor seemed to actually teleport from where he was standing, before Thalia's blasts even got close, with the Ravenette then quickly spinning around on instinct to block an attack with her spear, only to be shot when a whip made of pure lightning wrapped around her weapon. Then I hope you don't mind the pain that comes with it said Naruto, holding the lightning whip before jerking it back, sending Thalia up into the air. Recalling the lightning whip, Naruto condensed it into a ball of lightning which he threw straight at Thalia, with the ball expanding and surrounding her. Before he then threw the leviathan axe, causing the lightning to be frozen, trapping Thalia in a ball of frozen electricity. Naruto then summoned his axe back and began spinning it above his head again, with dark storm clouds beginning to form around the ball until it was soon completely hidden within them. Once that was done, Naruto slammed his axe into the ground, bringing the ball crashing down as well, releasing a loud clap of thunder, followed by an explosion of ice and lightning. Once the smoke cleared, everyone saw Thalia lying on the ground, much to the worry and concern of her friends, only being relieved to see she's still breathing. Ooh, Thalia moaned with Naruto going to stand over her. Still wanna keep going or are you done? Naruto asked, resting his axe on his shoulder with Thalia glancing at him, not even having the strength to move her head. I wanna say I can keep going. But yeah, you weren't kidding about getting rough. And looks like I'm the one knocked on my ass and on my back, said Thalia, smirking at him, making the whiskered redeed chuckle before offering her a hand up. I can help with that, said Naruto, the ravenette just barely managing to lift her arm and grab his hand before gasping in surprise, as she felt electricity running through her body. Feeling her exhaustion and injuries fading away until she felt herself feeling perfectly fine. Whoa, how did you do that? Thalia asked as she stood up, looking at herself, not seeing even a single bruise or scratch. Lightning and electricity can be used for more than just destruction. It can also be used to heal. You charge either yourself or someone else with electricity, focusing it on the cells to accelerate the healing process. I do it to myself passively, making it so any injuries I get heal in an instant. Naruto replied, much to Thalia's amazement that something like that was possible. That's I honestly didn't know something like that was possible, said Thalia, wondering what else electricity could do. That's not surprising, hardly anyone with our powers think beyond just firing blasts of lightning, and that doing that is enough. But me, after refining and mastering my electrokinesis and atmokinesis, I began thinking of everything else I could do beyond what I was taught. You just have to imagine all the things you could do and see the only limits are the ones you believe exist, said Naruto, the daughter of Zeus looking eager at the chance to see what else she could do. Would you be able to help me with my training, then? Thalia asked, wanting to learn everything he can do for herself. Sure, replied Naruto, not seeing a problem with helping her training, especially if it means having an even better fight next time. Awesome and maybe I'll show you some of my own moves. Whiskers, said Thalia with a smirk while looking him up and down, before Bianca quickly walked up to them, followed by the others. Could I join the training, Naruto, since I will have a lot to catch up on and it'd be nice if you could help. Bianca said, smiling at the Yuzumaki, which he returned while Thalia's eye twitched in annoyance. Yeah, you can join Bianca, but that also means you'll need a lot of training. If you want to get caught up, Naruto said. 
I don't have a problem with that, it'll be nice spending time together, said Bianca, standing close to him while giving Thalia smug smirk, much to her annoyance. With the brunette having seen over the course of the fight, the growing tension between Naruto and her cousin, and not just from the fight, with how the trash talking kept sounding more and more like flirting, much to her annoyance, and hearing Thalia's offer to show Naruto her moves, Bianca wasn't going to take any chances of the two being alone for an extended period of time. I want to shock her, and I don't know why, I just do, thought Thalia in annoyance at Bianca butting in, but wasn't sure why she felt annoyed, unaware that with the fact her father is Zeus, she had a desire for power, no matter what it was, and Naruto's certainly both powerful and strong, making her already developing attraction towards him from his good looks and what she's seen of his personality, grow even more upon seeing that he had the strength to go with them. Great, and Naiko, you're welcome to join since you'll need training too, said Naruto, looking at the younger boy. Yes, I wanna train too, Naiko said eagerly, excited after seeing how strong Naruto is, and wanted to learn what powers he inherited from his father. Could I join too? Annabeth asked as while she didn't have control over an element, she knew it'd still be good to see what she could learn from the whiskered redeed. Sure, though just so you all are prepared. If you train with me, then you will give me everything you can, and then some, because I won't be holding back. Naruto warned, wanting to make it clear he wouldn't be going easy on them. If he trained them, they would be learning to actually fight and be prepared for what they'll be going against out in the world. With the four nodding in response, expecting that he wouldn't be taking things easy on them. Well, I believe that's enough for today. Everyone is relieved of training for the day, and may relax as they wish until dinner time, said Chiron, feeling that there's been enough excitement for one day. You heard him, all of you scram and go do whatever it is kids do, nowadays Dionysus said, while shooing all the campers out of the arena, with everyone slowly leaving while talking amongst themselves at what's happened. Hunters, with me, said Artemis, motioning her hunters to follow her back to their cabin. Though the moon goddess glanced back at the son of Thor, thinking over everything she saw him do in the spar and what he said, unable to deny her curiosity on just how he's developed his powers, as well as feeling worried at just how much he may have been holding back. What kind of powers do you think Naruto has? Asked Naiko as everyone began sitting down in the arena, eager to see the demigod that'd be fighting Thalia. Well, Thor is the god of thunder isn't he? So he has control over lightning. What else would he have? Bianca said, figuring that having control over lightning would be enough of a power. He's also the god of strength, storms, consecration, and fertility. It's likely Naruto would have control over storms too, along with being very strong, said Annabeth, intrigued to see what Naruto is capable of aside from what they've already seen and heard of his training. Would he really be that strong? Questioned Bianca, unsure just how powerful Naruto could be with the abilities he inherited from his father. I honestly have no idea. There are times when demigods won't inherit all the abilities that their godly parent have, but it's clear he does have power over lightning. But I don't know what else Naruto could have, not counting that he was personally trained by his father, which likely means he has far more control over his power. Annabeth replied, having no idea what level Naruto could be at when compared to Thalia. Given how Thalia had always been a natural fighter, even by demigod standards, along with getting experience during their time on the run. And after being freed from her tree, she also showed to be a quick learner, especially with her control over the mist. While Naruto, on the other hand, had years of training with his divine family, and with what he told them of his training, he's been thrown into dozens of dangerous and life-threatening situations, giving him not just training, but experience against things none of them have faced before, including gods that lived for fighting and killing. The daughter of Athena wanted to have faith in her friend, but even she wasn't entirely sure Thalia would be able to beat the whiskered redeed. Across from where the demigods were sitting were the hunters and Artemis, with the hunters unable to deny their interest to see a fight between the daughter of Zeus and the son of Thor. Are you still angry at what the kitty said? Andromeda asked while looking at Zoe, who had been scowling since they arrived at the arena. I couldn't care less what that boy has said, no matter how grating. I am annoyed that Lady Artemis is being forced to remain at this camp, rather than hunting the monster she has been tracking, said Zoe, not liking how their mistress is being reduced to essentially babysit someone, especially when it's a boy of all things. Let it go Zoe. What's done is done, and nothing I can do will change it. Besides, Apollo is aware of the danger this monster brings, and will ensure it's dealt with. And while I may not enjoy my new duty, 
I do enjoy the chance to help in training my hunters without worry of any attack, as well as getting Andromeda caught up, said Artemis, smiling at her hunters, knowing it will be a good opportunity to train with them some more, and helping Andromeda in her own training. With her words making the hunters happy for the chance to spend more time with their mistress outside of hunting. Before a few looked down into the arena curiously then back to Artemis. Lady Artemis, do you know for? One of the hunters asked, wondering if she's ever encountered the god of thunder before. While the moon goddess inhaled sharply before releasing her breath. No, not personally. I only ever know of him through his reputation and he doesn't have the best reputation. What's known to everyone is that he loves fighting and killing, having done it enough that he's widely regarded as the biggest butchering bastard in the Nine Realms. Though it's meant as an insult, I'm sure he'd consider it a compliment. He's also known to drink a lot, far more than even Dionysus, said Artemis, much to some of the hunters' shock and the disgust of others. Then he's no different from any other man, only knowing how to kill and destroy, said Phoebe, several hunters nodded in agreement perhaps, but he has also earned a reputation to be feared and revered. Regardless of his personality, the god of thunder isn't one to be trifled with, unless you desire a painful death, Artemis said, causing some of the hunters to shiver, while Andromeda frowned before glancing down in the arena. What do you think he's like compared to his dad? Questioned Andromeda, making Artemis frown in thought. I don't know, I can only go off what we have seen of Naruto Uzumaki. Aside from his desire to be a constant annoyance and antagonize anyone he pleases, he seems at least slightly tolerable. But there's no telling what he was like with the rest of his kind. Artemis said, willing to admit the Uzumaki seemed like a good person with how he cares for his friends. But given her knowledge of the Aesir, Artemis doubted that's all there was to him, combined with being trained by Thor and the rest of his family. The moon goddess was sure he had the same love of battle and bloodlust his father is known for, but was good at hiding it. And if what he did to the Mandaker is any indication, he can be cruel when he wants to. Artemis thought while frowning slightly, wondering what it'd take to make him lose control. While in their own booth Chiron and Dionysus looked down into the arena in interest for the match, the former more than the latter, with the god of wine giving more attention to his can of Diet Coke, occasionally glancing around the arena. Mr. D, what do you think of this boy, a child of Thor? Chiron asked, unable to help but feel a little nervous at an Aesir being in Camp Half-Blood. The trainer of heroes was aware of the existence of the other pantheons, even having some friends among them, including the Norse. Having met Mimir the Norse god of wisdom and knowledge, before he was imprisoned by Odin. So Chiron was aware of the reputation of the Aesir tribe, their bloodlust, arrogance, cruelty, and even the sadism of the more twisted ones. And even if Naruto is just a demigod, he was a demigod of Thor himself, who wasn't only the second strongest and physically strongest of the Aesir, but the one everyone feared and wouldn't dare challenge. Well, no one's died yet, so I suppose that's a positive, said Dionysus, knowing if he was the same as his father, he would have already started killing everyone. And should he prove to be like his father and go after someone? Said Chiron, making Dionysus look at him with a rare, deadly serious expression. Then they better hope they die quickly. Dionysus replied as that'd be the only mercy they could hope for from an Aesir, a quick death. Everyone's attention then turned towards the arena as Naruto and Thalia arrived, getting several girls and a few boys to look at the Yuzumaki eagerly. Oh my, it's been a while since we had such a handsome guy show up, Drew Tanaka, a daughter of Aphrodite, said while eagerly taking in Naruto's appearance and physique. Don't even think about it Drew, Selena said, giving her sister a warning look, doubting that Naruto would be the kind of guy she could make fall in love with her, and then break his heart and not expect him to retaliate for being manipulated. Not to mention how she saw the way Annabeth and Thalia both acted when they came by the Pegasi stables, along with how close he already seems to be with Bianca. Plus, Selena already intended to stake her own claim, and while she was nicer than some of her siblings, she also had the same possessiveness when it came to seeing a guy she's interested in, and she had no intentions of letting any of her siblings try anything. Too late, I'm already thinking of a lot of things, and as far as I can see, the new cutie is available, Drew said with a smirk only to suddenly feel a shiver go down her spine and someone looking at her. Looking at where the feeling was coming from, Drew couldn't help but gulp at seeing Bianca, giving her a friendly smile, as the rises of her normally brown eyes turned a sulfuric golden yellow with pitch black sclera. No, he isn't, stated Bianca, being able to guess the kind of girl Drew was just by looking at her, and refused to let some petty popular girl, even think of manipulating her friend crush. You're doing it again Bianca, Nico said with a small smirk, 
having seen Bianca act like this before, whenever another girl got too friendly or close to Naruto, and always enjoyed teasing her about being possessive over him. Doing what, Neko? Bianca asked turning to her brother with her smile still present, causing the boy to instantly lower his head, and know nothing, muttered Neko, knowing she can be scary when she wants to be. That's why you shouldn't try anything Drew, Annabeth said giving the daughter of Aphrodite a dry look, while Drew shivered and quickly looked away, not wanting to risk angering the daughter of Hades further. Though everyone was shocked when Dionysus made the announcement of Naruto's parentage, everyone aside from those who already knew being shocked his father is Thor. Even more so, at the knowledge other pantheons exists, given if the Norse gods are real, then what other ones were? Before the fight then started, much to everyone's amazement as Naruto and Thalia began fighting, even more so with how Naruto could recall his axe after throwing it, only for several to become confused when he slammed his axe down, and ice spikes emerged from the ground. How did he do that? Is creating ice some power that Thor has? Andromeda asked with a frown, having never heard anything of Thor possessing cryokinesis. It's not him creating the ice. While Thor is a god of storms and cryokinesis is an aspect of atmokinesis, the boy isn't the one creating the ice himself, said Artemis frowning while looking at the leviathan axe, sensing how the ice came from it. Is it the axe, my lady? Zoe asked while looking at the moon goddess, with Artemis nodding in response. Yes, whatever kind of weapon that is, it possesses a large amount of power within it. A cold and frozen power. Artemis replied, wondering where he could have gotten a weapon like that. As the fight continued, Bianca couldn't help but feel her eye begin twitching as Naruto and Thalia kept bantering, even flirting with how they were talking. They don't even seem to realize what they're doing, Selena said, smiling in amusement, making Annabeth glance at her before turning back to the fight. Doing what? Questioned Annabeth unable to help but feel annoyed for some reason, which only made the Ravenette smile grow more. I think I'll let it be a surprise. Use that big pretty brain of yours Annie, said Selena fully aware of the annoyance Annabeth and Bianca were feeling, and loving it. Whoa, Nyko muttered as they saw storm clouds begin covering the sky, with lightning and thunder going off in them. Only for everyone to quickly cover their ears when Naruto clapped his hands together, which sounded more like a clap of thunder and released a shockwave that threw Thalia back, with them covering their ears again when he did another clap, which thankfully wasn't as loud as the second one. Gods is that boy trying to deafen us all, said Zoe in annoyance at the loud sound. What? Phoebe said, only able to hear the ringing in her ears at the moment. It'll fade after a while girls, said Artemis, but would admit it was annoying having a clap of thunder go off like that, along with it being surprising that he could even do something like that. Though, when Thalia brought a bolt of lightning down towards Naruto, only for him to throw the leviathan axe, everyone was shocked to see the lightning bolt be cut in half. Even more so, when he grabbed both halves and absorbed the lightning. Did he just Chiron muttered in disbelief at seeing lightning be cut in half, while Dionysus idly waved his hand putting a barrier over the arena, with Artemis doing the same. Cut lightning in half, grab it, and then absorb it. Yes, yes he did, Dionysus said boredly, though raised a brow at the unexpected feat. It only became more shocking when Thalia called down more lightning, only for Naruto to seemingly take control of it from her and create a tornado of thunderclouds and lightning, making more than a few campers nervous that he was going to bring it crashing down on top of them. That's honestly unbelievable, said Annabeth in disbelief and nervousness, unsure if this really how strong Naruto is, or he's just making a statement about how useless it is to use his own power against him. That's so awesome, Naiko said, grinning in amazement that the whiskered redeed was capable of manipulating the weather like that. Wow Bianca said, not believing how easily Naruto could do something like that, then just as easily disperse the tornado. Artemis narrowed her eyes as she saw Naruto's body began emitting lightning, before he seemed to teleport away from Thalia's attack, reappearing behind her, creating a whip of lightning that he wrapped around her spear. Did he just teleport? Andromeda asked with wide eyes, wondering how he could teleport like that. The boy didn't, Mladi? said Zo, turning towards Artemis knowing he didn't teleport, but couldn't figure how he was able to move that fast. None of you would be able to follow it, he was using his lightning to augment his speed to the point that it looked like he teleported, but was moving faster than anyone could comprehend. It also seems like he mastery of lightning to the point he can shape and manipulate it however he pleases, said Artemis with frown as Naruto condensed the lightning whip into a ball, which he threw at Thalia as it grew and surrounded her. Everyone being able to tell the fight was over after this, 
but couldn't help but be worried when the ball was brought crashing into the ground, exploding in a blast of lightning and ice. With Thalia being seen lying on the ground, much to the concern of her friends, only being relieved to see she's still alive. He can use lightning to heal too, Annabeth said in disbelief when Naruto offered Thalia hand up, seeing electricity sparking off their hands, as the daughter of Zeus's injuries faded away. He keeps getting more and more interesting, stated Selena with a small smirk, causing Bianca's eye to start twitching at her words, along with seeing how close Naruto and Thalia were, before she quickly made her way down into the arena, being followed by Naiko and Annabeth. Selena was tempted to join them at hearing Naruto's offer of training, but first wanted to see for herself how the training would go be she joined. Though Claris is really going to be upset that she wasn't here, thought Selena, knowing her best friend will hate how she wasn't here to see this, and try challenging the son of Thor, herself. Everyone then began clearing out of the arena, all the campers eagerly talking amongst each other about the fight, along with how strong Naruto is. Later, Princess Andromeda. Meanwhile, on the Princess Andromeda cruise ship, the primary living space for the Titan army, Luke had just called a meeting, after getting some news from his spies in Camp Half-Blood. News that made the son of Hermes nervous at what was to come. There's been news from Camp Half-Blood. We've learned that two new demigods have arrived, the ones the Manticor had been sent after. They've been claimed as the children of Hades, revealed Luke, something that made the demigods nervous at having two more children of the Big Three to deal with. But that's not all, there's also another demigod, one that's already claimed, but not by an Olympian or a minor god. Instead, they come from another pantheon, a Norse demigod and son of Thor the god of thunder, and more than that he's stronger than any other demigod there. Having already defeat Thalia Grace the daughter of Zeus in a fight, Luke said, which really shocked the demigods, while a few minor gods tensed and looked nervous at this new development, given how several of them were either old enough to know of Thor's reputation or heard of it the power he possessed and the fear he could inspire. Knowing that even when the Olympians were at the height of their power, he was capable of rivaling Zeus the strongest of the gods. But now with the decline of their worship Thor was now much stronger, making him even more fearsome. It honestly made some of them start to wonder if joining the Titans was a good idea, if it meant there was a chance they would go against the son of Thor or worse, if his father got involved. While the demigods were nervous with the knowledge they had of Thor in pop culture, given how powerful he's been depicted, it made plenty of them nervous at how powerful the real Thor could be compared to how he's portrayed in modern media. And now his son was at Camp Half-Blood, even more so that he was able to defeat Thalia, who was one of the biggest obstacles in their way, given her potential role in the Great Prophecy. Luke was also shocked to learn of this, not only at the existence of other pantheons, but that Thalia had been defeated. Having seen firsthand how strong his old friend was, even he's never been able to defeat her before. But now learning she's been defeated seemingly with little effort from the son of Thor, it's concerning how powerful this new demigod could be. So what if there's a son of Thor? It just means we have some wannab superhero to deal with now, too. Said Alabaster C. Torrington a son of Hecate, not seeing the issue of having one more demigod to deal with. You would be wise to watch your mouth, demigod, as well as who you underestimate. Said a voice behind Luke, making the demigod freeze already knowing who it is. Before he slowly turned his head to see the general of Chrono's army, Atlas the Titan of Endurance. All of you would be wise to not underestimate a child of the Thunder God. Despite what mortals believe him to be like, the true Thor is far from some noble hero. Atlas sneered as he walked forward. To Thor, all of you would be little more than insects to be crushed. He wouldn't even need a reason. He would simply kill all of you because he could. The Olympians are even less to him. All it would take is a single swing of his hammer to bring Olympus crumbling down around them. He has slaughtered thousands, reveling in the destruction and death he has unleashed over the millennia. The only mercy you could ever hope for from him is a swift end. He is a destroyer, and anyone foolish enough to get in his way, don't tend to live long enough to realize what a stupid mistake it was to challenge him, said Atlas, looking around the gathered forces, seeing the demigods looked even more nervous at learning what Thor is really like, until the titan looked directly at Alabaster, who no longer looked confident at the idea of going against the son of Thor, if he's even half the destroyer his father is. Yet you believe his son does not pose a problem? Then by all means, return to that camp to deal with him yourself. Perhaps there may be enough of you left to bury once he's finished, Atlas said, making Alabaster lower his head under the general's cold and evil eyes. 
Personally, Atlas wasn't too concerned about the whiskered redeed, confident in his own unrivaled strength and power as a titan to deal with him. But it had been intriguing to learn how strong he already was, enough to defeat the daughter of Zeus, who was already a powerful demigod. But if the Olympians desire to get help from outsiders, then perhaps we will get our own allies, Atlas thought with a wicked smirk, knowing there were plenty of others who either hated the Olympians, or would enjoy seeing them brought down from their mountain. Even better. They could use this weakened Zeus, with how his daughter and only living demigod in the modern era, had been defeated by a foreign one. Yes, this will certainly be useful, thought Atlas, knowing that the Titans will soon retake their places as rulers of the cosmos. With Naruto, after his fight with Thalia along with offering to train her, Bianca, Nico, and Annabeth, Naruto and the Di Angelo siblings, went to the Hades's cabin to get settled inside, finding that the inside of the cabin looked much bigger on the inside. The first room they saw upon entering, looked to be a lounge area with a grey carpet, black leather sofas and chairs, around an ebony wood coffee table, bookshelves, and even a TV, while a long hallways lead to the rooms, each of them having a single black four-poster bed a desk and their own bathrooms, with there also being empty shelves and bookcases for them to use, however they wanted. So, what do you two think? Naruto asked once they'd all chosen their rooms and gotten settled in them before they returned to the lounge area. This is awesome said Naiko, sitting in one of the chairs, liking how their cabin looked so far, and that they had their own rooms. It's definitely not what I expected, said Bianca, not thinking the cabin would look like this, but wasn't complaining especially at not having to worry about sharing a bathroom. That's good. Though have you decided which of you are going to be the cabin counselor? Questioned Naruto, figuring each cabin had a counselor, but wasn't sure how it was decided. If it was the oldest demigod, if they were chosen by their parents or cabinmates, or inheriting a certain ability. This made Bianca and Naiko share a look for a few moments before turning back to the Yuzumaki. Well what if we wanted you to be our cabin counselor, said Bianca, much to Naruto's surprise. Me, Naruto said, not expecting them to want him to be counselor if that's even allowed, given how he's not only a foreign demigod but's not even a camper. Yeah you know more than either of us about all this, and are a lot stronger, Naiko said, with Bianca nodding in agreement and smiling at the whiskered redeed. You would be a much better choice than either of us, since we're still learning about being demigods. Being a counselor seems like it'd only distract us from everything else we'd have to learn, added Bianca, making Naruto look between them with an unsure expression. And you're both sure about this? Said Naruto, with the siblings nodding in response making him sigh. Okay, I'll be the cabin counselor, but only temporarily, once the two of you have gotten caught up on everything and gotten some training done, it'll be your responsibility, Naruto said, willing to be their counselor until one of them is prepared to take over, since it's still their cabin, that sounds fair, Bianca replied, with her brother nodding in response, good, now how are you both feeling, really, with all of this and then learning who your dad is, Naruto said, sitting down, while Bianca and Naiko frowned at the question, I feel like I'm still processing everything. It all just seems to be going so fast. One second we're at a dance, then we're being attacked by a manticore, almost kidnapped and are killed. Learn that gods and goddesses are real. A lot of gods apparently. We meet a goddess and her followers then her twin brother. And now we're at some medieval style summer camp that teaches us how to fight monsters. Then we learn our dad is Hades the actual Hades and king of the underworld, said Bianca, feeling physically and mentally tired from everything that's happened in such a short amount of time. Yeah, it's certainly a lot to take in all at once. Even just learning about a single pantheon is hard to believe, but learning the existence of all the others can be pretty crazy. It'll get easier though, just take it one step at a time, and don't forget that I'm here if you need anything or have any questions, Naruto said, smiling at the brunette which she returned. What was it like, when you learned who your dad is, how strong and important he is, said Naiko looking at his Hades figurine before looking at Naruto, wondering what he felt after learning Thor was his father. Naiko Bianca said while frowning at her brother, doubting that Naruto wanted to talk about his father only for Naruto to raise a hand. It's fine and understandable. If your dad was someone like Apollo or Hermes, it wouldn't be an issue since they have plenty of kids. But learning he's one of the big three, the eldest of them, and that he's a king, it kind of puts you on a pedestal, as though you now have something you need to live up to, said Naruto, causing Bianca to frown, unable to help but nod, while she's still processing everything. It did make her nervous to learn their father is Hades. Remembering what Andromeda said of how everyone started looking to Thalia for answers when she showed up, 
just because her father is Zeus. And then everything Andromeda went through since learning the truth, due to her own father being Poseidon. Now they learn their father is Hades, who doesn't have the best reputation given his position and the domain he rules over. Is that what it ws like when you learned who your father is? When he brought you to Asgard, everyone put you on a pedestal and expected you live up to his reputation. Bianca asked, with the Yuzumaki shrugging in response. The truth is, I always knew who my father was, my mom told me when I was old enough. So, it wasn't the biggest shock when he finally showed up, to me it was just the chance to meet him in person. But then he took me to Asgard, and that's when the pressure came, the expectations that came with being the son of Thor. Naruto replied while looking up at the ceiling. I wasn't born a god like my siblings, that alone set me apart from them. And what lead to my training, I wasn't only expected to live up to his reputation but be even better since I was only a demigod. The ironic part is before my training began, I was excited about it. I wanted to prove I could be just as good if not better than my siblings, to show everyone I was worthy of being my father's son. And look how that turned out, said Naruto, smiling bitterly, with the siblings frowning before he shook his head and looked at them. Anyway, when it comes to trying to live up to the reputation of your parents, don't worry about it, and don't let anyone try pushing you to be better just to satisfy them. Be as good as you want to be, train the way you feel suits you the best, and never let anyone make you be something you're not, be who you want to be. Naruto said while giving Naiko a look at end, making the younger Dai Angelo squirm slightly. Though I'm sure neither of you will have to worry about Hades placing any unreasonable expectations on you, since he's known to be one of the more fair and understanding gods. And while he doesn't show it, he cares about his children and accepts them no matter what. The only thing he'd want is what's best for both of you. Added Naruto, causing Naiko to relax while Bianca put a hand on his shoulder, smiling reassuringly at her brother. He did make this cabin just for us, and claimed us the moment we arrived at camp. So that seems to show he cares, Bianca said, knowing what her brother is worried about. Naiko smiled slightly at them, before he soon perked up with an eager expression. Do you think dad would let us summon Cerberus? Naiko asked, excited at the idea of being able to summon their father's guard dog, only to yelp when Bianca smacked him on the head while looking at him blankly. You're not going to talk about a monster that's likely the size of a building like it's a puppy you can take for a walk, said Bianca, not even wanting to imagine what Naiko would do if their father did let him take Cerberus out of the underworld. She's right, Naiko start off small with regular hellhounds, those usually only grow to the size of a grizzly bear, and are much more manageable. Naruto said with a smirk, making Naiko grin. Don't encourage him Bianca said, giving the Yuzumaki a warning look. What? I'm just helping him learn responsibility, a pet seems like a good start, said Naruto, his smirk only growing. Yeah I can handle a pet Naiko added, wanting to have his own hellhound. Then get a normal pet. Not something from the underworld said Bianca, only to blush when Naruto grabbed her and pulled her to sit next to him, while wrapping an arm around her. Relax Bianca, nothing bad would happen. You know I wouldn't let anything happen to you. Naruto said while looking at her, making her blush intensify at seeing how close they were. Why ye yeah, Bianca replied, with the whiskered redeed smiling at her. Then you'll know I would never do anything that'd endanger you or Naiko, I guess, said Naruto, smirking at the son of Hades. Hey Naiko said in annoyance. So, trust me when I say that nothing will happen to either of you when I'm around. That includes if any of the campers start giving you trouble just because of you your father is. Okay, Naruto said. Oh okay, said Bianca, nodding in response, while a smile slowly appeared on her face. If you two are going to start kissing, I'm leaving, stated Naiko, before quickly ducking and running to his room, laughing, when Bianca threw her shoe at him. I swear, I'll send you to meet our dad, myself, Bianca said while blushing brightly with Naruto chuckling lightly. You're feisty when you're angry, Naruto said in amusement as he stood up only to be surprised when Bianca pulled him back down, and laid her head on his shoulder. Uh, Bia said Naruto not expecting her to do that. Ah, ah, you started it when you pulled me down. Now you get to be my pillow until I say so, said Bianca, blushing at her own action, even more so when Naruto wrapped an arm around her. I can live with that, Naruto said, smiling at the brunette, which she returned, enjoying the moment of peace after such a chaotic day. Later, with the hunters. Meanwhile, after night had fallen over the camp, Artemis brought her hunters to the archery range to start their training and help get Andromeda started on her own. Given that her hunters were at their strongest during the night, it made it the perfect time to start their training. 
How do you feel? asked Artemis as she looked at Andromeda, who'd been surprised when they went outside and felt so much better in the moonlight, but now was smiling and waving her hand around with a ball of water in the air, one that she had actually managed to pull out of the air. Stronger, a lot stronger. Like I just jumped into the ocean and could fight Ares again for an entire day. I even feel like I could lift up the entire canoe lake, if I wanted, said Andromeda before focusing, causing the water ball to dissolve back into the air, making Artemis smile and nod. That's understandable, becoming one of my hunters doesn't just grant you my blessing, but you'll find your power over water is even greater at night. Given the symbiotic relationship between the ocean and the moon, as one thing mortals got right, is that the moon's presence helps affect the tides, making them stronger on the side of the planet the moon is facing. It's why outside of my father and brother, your father is one of the few males I'm on good terms with, Artemis explained, much to Andromeda's surprise before she smiled in amusement. That sounds like something from Avatar, said Andromeda, with the moon goddess nodding in response. A few times mortals can make a decent show with such accurate details. Now, let's see your archery, Artemis said, motioning Andromeda to stand with the other hunters who were practicing with their bows or hunting knives. Nodding in response, Andromeda stood in front of a target before grabbing her bow and knocking an arrow, yet the ravenette felt nervous. Given all her other attempts at using a bow usually ended with her shooting everything and everyone but the target. I really hope that blessing extended to being able to use a bow. Andromeda thought, releasing a breath and shooting the arrow, smiling happily when it actually hit the target. Though it wasn't anywhere near the center, Andromeda was happy at finally hitting the target for once. Looking back at Artemis, the moon goddess smiled and nodded at her, making her smile grow before she began more shooting arrows, feeling more confident with each one. The next day after Naruto's fight against Thalia, the Yuzumaki sat with Bianca and Naiko at the dining pavilion for breakfast, with there now being another table present for the Hades's cabin. Once they'd finished, the three met up with Thalia and Annabeth, before Naruto lead them into the forest to begin their training. Naruto, are you sure it's a good idea to be in here? There are supposed to be monsters, said Bianca, feeling a little nervous at entering the forest after learning it was stocked with monsters. That makes it the best place for training. As now you'll also need to be prepared for any sudden attacks and learn to react without warning. And it's better you get that experience in a semi-safe location than out in the world where you'd be more likely to be killed. Naruto replied, believing it'll be good training along with what he'll be teaching them. What'll you be teaching us? Naiko asked eagerly, wanting to know what they'll be learning under the whiskered redeed. Mostly the basics. Hand-to-hand -hand combat, using weapons, using your abilities, and survival training. Once you've got a good grasp on all that, then we'll be moving on to more advanced stuff. You'll also be free to train on your own, said Naruto before they soon reached a good spot, with him then looking at the demigods. All right, we'll be training here every day after breakfast, only stopping when you two need to have your other lessons with Annabeth. Then after those, we'll be back here again, understood. Naruto said, looking at the four, with them all nodding in agreement. Good. Now, before we begin, Annabeth what can you do? Question Naruto, turning to the daughter of Athena, causing Annabeth to blink at the sudden question. What can I do? Annabeth asked. Yes, as in any abilities you inherited from your mother. The training you have so far. Everything you're capable of. I already know what Thalia can do from our fight. But I want to know what you can do. Naruto said, wanting to know their current skill sets and abilities. So he knows what he's working with. I'm a pretty good fighter, both with weapons and in hand to hand. I'm also stronger, agile, and more durable than regular mortals, since my mom is a war goddess. I know how to communicate with Morse code, and I have some knowledge and skill in first aid. The abilities I inherited from my mom are an affinity for the arts and music, but not to the same extent as children of Apollo control over weapons, and I'm proficient with a knife, a bow, and swords, along with being able to disarm almost any one of their weapons. And obviously I'm really intelligent which helps me strategize and outsmart opponents with my planning, whether it's before or during battle. I also know everything there is to know about craftsmanship, especially architecture. Annabeth explained proudly, only to flinch when Naruto flicked her on the forehead. Watch your pride. That'll get you killed faster than anything, warned Naruto, making the blonde demigod frown and rub her forehead. Yeah, I know, said Annabeth aware that her fatal flaw is her hubris, but she can't help it sometimes. Well at least you acknowledge your own weaknesses, just make sure you keep it under control, Naruto said, with Annabeth nodding in response. But there's no denying that even if you don't have any flashy abilities, 
you do have potential to become a very skilled and dangerous fighter, even more so than the demigods with abilities, said Naruto, much to their surprise, with Annabeth unable to help but smirk at this. Uh, no offense to Annie or anything, but how can she do that? Thalia asked, fully aware Annabeth was talented and strong in her own right, but the Ravenette had trouble seeing her becoming that strong. Because she has very unique abilities that alone won't do her much good, but combine them together, and you have someone that can take down anyone if they put their mind to it. You all have ADHD, right? Naruto asked, confusing the four demigods. Uh, yeah, we have ADHD. It's our battle reflexes to help us stay alive in fights, replied Annabeth, confused at the random question. It also explains a lot. Bianca muttered looking at her brother dryly, having learned from the orientation film that demigods have ADHD and dyslexia, which helped explain why Naiko could hardly sit still for more than five minutes, and always kept finding new hobbies or interests. That's right. It helps you predict and see where an opponent will strike by how they tense their muscles. Now combine that with audio kinesis to be able also hear things like their breathing, where they're stepping, even just the slightest sound they're making, which would also be very good if you can't see them. Add in being able to strategize and create plans in the middle of combat, as well as being able to analyze their fighting style. You could be ready to react and counter their next move before they even do it. Naruto explained before looking at Annabeth. That is what makes you dangerous. Maybe you won't ever have the raw power that some demigods have, but the most dangerous weapon you have is right here, said Naruto, tapping the side of her head. As long as you use it the right way, and make sure to not let your pride get in the way, then you won't need raw power, Naruto said, with the daughter of Athena smiling at this. You really know how to make someone motivated, stated Annabeth, liking the idea of being able to show how brains can triumph over brawn. Hey Whiskers, when you asked us if we had ADHD, you sounded like you don't have it. Aren't you dyslexic and ADHD too? Thalia asked, frowning at the Yuzumaki, which also got the other demigods' interest. No, I'm not. My brain isn't hardwired to any language, I can read and understand English, and all the ones I've learned just fine. And my battle reflexes are ones I've trained and honed through combat, replied Naruto, much to Annabeth's intrigue and Thalia's annoyance, that he didn't have to worry about either dyslexia or ADHD. What about where Norse demigods go to train? Do you have a camp or are they all taken to Asgard to be trained? Annabeth asked, with Naruto shrugging in response. I don't know, I've never met another Norse demigod before. If there are any others, then they're probably left on their own. And no, I doubt there'd be a camp to train at, replied Naruto. Not sure what any of the other Iser or Vanner did with any demigods they had. All right, any other questions before we begin? Naruto said, looking at them to see if they wanted to ask anything else. What kind of powers would we have inherited from our dad? Bianca asked, with Naiko also being curious about this. The powers you'd get from Hades. The most noticeable ones would be Umbra Kinesis to control and manipulate darkness and shadows, as well as necromancy to summon control and destroy the dead, with osteokinesis being part of that to control and summon bones. But there's also geokinesis since being the god of the underworld, he has control over the earth. Ferrokinesis, which can be used to summon precious metals and jewels from underground and control them. Some other abilities you could have inherited are pyrokinesis to use hellfire, hypnokinesis to manipulate dreams and put people to sleep, and phobokinesis to manipulate and radiate fear. Naruto explained, much to their surprise and amazement, before Naiko grinned in excitement. That's awesome said Naiko, excited and eager to learn which of those powers he had, and what he'll be able to do with them. That is really a lot, Bianca said, having expected the necromancy and number kinesis given their father's position, but all those other powers surprised her, with the brunette unable to deny feeling a little excited to see what she can do as well. Yeah, some demigods can inherit more abilities than others, depending on the domains their godly parent has control of, but it just means that much more training to learn and master them. And even then there's always room for improvement and learning new ways to use your powers, replied Naruto. Like you, you learned how to do all kinds of things with electricity and lightning. But what else can you do? Questioned Thalia, wanting to know what else Naruto is capable of, eager to do everything he can. In response, Naruto held his hands behind his back before walking towards a tree, confusing the demigods for a moment, until they were shocked when he placed his foot on the tree and began walking up it as if it was solid ground. What the Tartarus Annabeth muttered in disbelief as they kept looking higher and higher at Naruto, until he walked out onto a branch, leaving him upside down. 
Electrostatic adhesion, by channeling electricity to any part of your body you can stick to anything it touches, like being able to walk up a vertical surface, Naruto said, making the demigods look at his feet, being able to see sparks of electricity coming off of the bottom of them. Before Naruto cut off the flow of electricity, making him fall to the ground only for the demigods to be further shocked as a sphere of electricity formed around him, keeping him floating in midair, with the whiskered redeed rotating until he was right side up again. You can also manipulate electromagnetic fields to be able to fly and create a shield around yourself to deflect projectiles, said Naruto, causing Naiko to grab a rock and throw it at him, only for it to bounce off the shield. Don't just throw rocks at someone, Naiko Bianca said, smacking him on the head. Ah oh, come on Bianca he said it'd deflect it, and I wanted to see what would happen, said Naiko, rubbing his head, while Naruto floated back to the ground. Just be glad I only used enough power to deflect objects, only. Creating a stronger shield would make anything that hits it be sent flying back at whoever threw it faster than a bullet, warned Naruto, making the demigods pale slightly, especially Naiko at what could have happened. WH what else can you do? Annabeth asked, nervous that he could do something like that without even attacking. I can also do this, Naruto said, holding his hand out and gathering electricity in it, until soon he was holding a small ball of electricity. Naruto then threw the ball of electricity up into the air. The demigods once again were shocked when the ball exploded in a burst of electricity. I call it my shock grenade. It's done by collecting a good amount of electricity using a magnetic field before throwing it, with it exploding like you just saw, and if it hits someone or something it can stick to them. It can be weak enough to temporarily paralyze a person or a group of people standing together, or strong enough to fry them. I can also make it where once it explodes, it disperses into multiple other ones to hit a larger area, said Naruto before holding out his hands as lightning spark between them. Another ability is being able to chain lightning in between enemies, by hitting one I can manipulate the lightning to jump towards any enemy, repeating it until they're all connected, that way I can take them down all at once. Naruto explained with him then clenching his fists and pulling his arms apart causing the lightning to suddenly solidify around his fists and elongate into blades. Whoa Bianca said in shock, looking at the blades of pure lightning that were now wrapped around Naruto's arms and hands. And there's this, my gigawatt blades for some extra damage with hand-to-hand -hand combat, said Naruto while smirking at their expressions before he dispersed the electric blades. I never stood a chance against you. Did I Thalia stated, willing to admit that she really had no chance of beating Naruto at all no matter how much it hurt her pride. No, not really. But don't take it personally that I didn't really go all out against you. Like I said, it was just a spar, and I didn't want to seriously hurt you, even if you do like it rough, said Naruto, smirking in amusement at the ravenette. If you can teach me to do all of that and whatever else you can do, then be as rough as you want with me. Thalia said eagerly, wanting to do everything she just saw, except the flying part while she'll happily learn to create a shield of lightning around herself to deflect projectiles, she'll stick with keeping her feet firmly on the ground. You can be rough with me, too. Don't hold anything back, Bianca said while looking at Thalia in annoyance, along with blushing at what she just said. Don't worry, I wasn't planning on holding back for any of you. I'm going to make sure that when you're out in the world, monsters will be the ones running, not you, said Naruto, much to their excitement. Uh, one more question. How exactly do you think of doing things like that with your powers? Annabeth asked, curious of where he'd get ideas to use his powers like this. Video games, movies, comics, anime, manga. Naruto replied, much to their disbelief. Wait, seriously, said Thalia, not expecting him to get ideas from things like that. Yes, you'd be surprised by the inspiration you can get from those things especially in new ways to control an element. A lot of my techniques I got from games, and I'm comics, and manga, things like that. Learning new and creative ways lightning and electricity can be used, said Naruto, much to Anabits and Thalia's disbelief. Does that include ways we could use our powers? Naiko asked, liking the idea of learning new ways to use his powers from comics, and I'm manga, and video games. Definitely you and Bianca would get plenty of inspiration for ways to use your powers, even more so with how many you could potentially have. Naruto replied, making the younger boy grin in excitement, while Bianca looked interested. And would I be able to learn anything from them? Said Annabeth with a raised brow, still skeptical, but was willing to give it a chance if they'd prove helpful. Probably. While you wouldn't find it useful in learning about any powers, you could focus on the way characters act plan and strategize, learning how to think of unexpected and surprising ways to fight. 
becoming unpredictable for opponents, said Naruto, with the daughter of Athena humming in thought. Now, I think that's enough questions, and we still need to get started on training, so let's begin, said Naruto, with the demigods nodding in response as they began training. Later, Naruto had the four demigods start with basic exercises, starting with some stretching before then running 20 laps around the perimeter of the forest, with them then moving on to 80 push-ups, pull-ups, jumping jacks, and sit-ups, all the while he'd shoot low-powered bolts of electricity at them, not strong enough to really hurt them, but enough to knock them down if they're hit, which also forced them to be able to dodge the blasts, or else he'd have them do the exercises all over again. With the demigods being relieved when it came time for lunch as well as Bianca's and Nico's lessons with Annabeth, allowing them time to rest and recover after having to repeat the exercises again and again, given at least one of them failed to dodge the electric bolts. Thankfully, once their lessons ended and they went back to training, rather than repeat the exercises again, Naruto had them begin working on their powers. Having them start small with Thalia working on sticking to a tree, by channeling electricity to the bottom of her feet. The Di Angelo siblings had started working on manipulating shadows and being able to shadow travel through them, telling them to only try traveling short distances within camp. And Annabeth had been told to try and land a hit on the whiskered redeed, using whatever means necessary. Ah, this is impossible, Thalia said as she fell to the ground, glaring at the tree in annoyance, having barely managed to stick one of her feet to it and only for a few seconds. You've already seen me do it. So yes it is possible, said Naruto, looking down at Thalia, making the ravenette glare at him. Yeah and I thought it'd be easy with how you did it, so why can't I? Said Thalia, not liking how something that looked easy could be so difficult to do. And I've trained to master it, while you are only just starting out. But your problem is you aren't in control, Naruto said, which only annoyed Thalia further as she got up. I'm perfectly in control, Thalia retorted, only for them to hear a crack of lightning in the sky, making the Yuzumaki look at her with a raised brow. Clearly, stated Naruto, with Thalia crossing her arms and huffing in annoyance. I don't even see why I need to learn this first. Wouldn't an attack be better to learn, like that shot grenade? Or better yet those gigawatt blades? Thalia asked, preferring if she learned how to use those rather than sticking to trees. If you can't do something as simple as electrostatic adhesion, then you'll never be able to use those attacks. Naruto said, raising a hand to stop the daughter of Zeus from speaking when she opened her mouth. It's not just about sticking to any surface, it's about control. Until yesterday, you only saw lightning as a weapon to be used, never seeing any reason to hold back with your attacks, giving it your all in a fight, and as we saw with the Manticur, that usually just means running straight at the enemy, said Naruto, with Thalia scowling in annoyance as she gained a faint embarrassed blush. Never gonna drop that, are you? Thalia stated, annoyed that he'd brought that up again. I will once you give me a reason to not bring it up. Anyway, you saw how I used lightning and electricity during our fight, and then being able to use it to heal, how I could shape it however I liked. That's because I learned to control the output of it. Like with my shock grenade, if I used too little power, it'd either disperse before it can detonate, or, at most, all the person hit with it would feel is a weak tingle. But if I use too much or I can't contain it correctly, then it's likely to blow up early, possibly in my face. That's the purpose of learning electrostatic adhesion. Not only is it a useful ability to stick to any surface, but it teaches you to control the amount of electricity you use in it. As if you use too much the electricity will explode the moment it touches the surface, and using too little only lets you stick for a few moments before it ends. Naruto explained, the Ravenette frowned, but slowly nodded in understanding. So I need to give it more juice so I can stick, but not enough to the point I end up shooting lightning out my feet, said Thalia, with Naruto nodding in response. That's right. So far you're using a good amount to stick for a short while, just slowly add more energy, and make sure you stay focused. If you lose your focus you'll either fall or be blown back. But once you do have the right amount, it'll be easier to eventually learn to do it instinctually. Naruto said, Thalia nodded at this. All right, fine, I'll keep trying to climb the stupid tree, said Thalia, grunting in annoyance when Naruto flicked her forehead. Don't worry, once you can do that, you'll be able to start learning all the new ways to blast and or blow things up, said Naruto, making Thalia smirk eagerly at this. Before their attention turned to Bianca when she suddenly rose from some shadows, with the brunette panting lightly as she leaned against a tree. How far did you go? Naruto asked, 
I, I go to, um, I ended up on the beach like I don't know, maybe a mile away from camp. Then when I ended up at the big house and I needed to rest there for a while before coming back here, replied Bianca, feeling completely drained from shadow traveling. Are you feeling alright? Thalia asked while looking at her cousin, not expecting her to be this tired. Yeah yeah I'm fine, just didn't think it'd be this exhausting, Bianca said, pushing off the tree once she was sure she could stand on her own. That's to be expected, shadow travel can be an exhausting ability, even monsters like hellhounds can be tired out from it. It's why I wanted you and Nico to only shadow travel short distances around camp, otherwise if you went too far, you'd likely pass out once you arrived at wherever you ended up. But the more you do it, the easier it'll become. Just make sure you don't spend too much time in the shadows, said Naruto, with the daughter of Hades nodding in response. Out of curiosity, what's that like, anyway? Moving through the shadows? Asked Thalia, making Bianca frown in thought. Dark for starters, but at the same time you can see where you're going at the end. It's like going down a really long tunnel, as you still need to travel to where you're going. You don't just go in and suddenly come out. The best comparison would be like taking a train with your head sticking out the window. Bianca replied, with Thalia nodding slowly at this. The trio's attention then turned to Nico when he suddenly came running out of a shadow, falling to his hands and knees, panting heavily while looking around wildly, only feeling relieved when he saw where he was and collapsed to the ground. Cool, I got away from the ants, Nico said, rolling onto his back, much to Bianca's concern. What ants? Bianca asked, wondering what happened to her brother. These giant ants huge crazy things in a giant anthill I ended up in another part of the forest, and there they were, moving around I tried shadow traveling, but I was too tired, so I had to run I was nearly grabbed by them, but I managed to jump into the shadows in time, and got back here, replied Nico, much to Bianca's and Thalia's shock. There's a Myrmikis lair in the forest? Thalia exclaimed, not expecting a Myrmikis lair to be here. What's a Myrmiki? Questioned Bianca, only able to guess they must some kind of monster that look like giant ants. Monsters that resemble ants, only being the size of a full-grown German shepherd, along with having a love of shiny things, like gold. They make their lairs in giant anthills, that are filled with their collections of stolen shiny stuff. They can spray acid, have pretty tough back armor, mandibles that can rip your limbs off if they catch you, and they can call the rest of the hive to aid them if they're threatened, making them mostly dangerous by being able to swarm you, if you aren't careful. Naruto explained, making Bianca pale and shiver at those monsters actually being here in the forest. Good job Naiko, you managed to find some good practice targets, said Naruto, smiling at the son of Hades, while Thalia and Bianca looked at him in disbelief. You can't be serious, Thalia said, knowing how easily Myrmikis can swarm and take down even the most skilled fighters. While she and Anabit might have a chance, and that's if they can ensure they don't get swarmed and surrounded, Bianca and Naiko wouldn't stand a chance. Oh, I'm very serious, but I'm not crazy. You won't be fighting the Myrmikis, not yet anyway. But once you all are trained up, you will be. It seems like the perfect test to see how far you've come and what improvements are needed to your training. Naruto replied, believing that clearing out the Myrmikis lair will be good to see how far they've come. Are you sure about that? Couldn't we have something easier to go against? Bianca asked, not wanting to go against a swarm of giant ants, when they've only just started their training. You can't simply hope to always fight something easy, there will be times you encounter monsters much stronger than Myrmikis. At least this time, you'll know what you're going against and what they can do, so you know what to expect and prepare accordingly. And by the time you do go after them, you'll also have your own weapons. I'll also be there and step in. But only if I see any of you are in danger of dying, as it'll still be up to you four to kill them. Besides, once you've killed them all, anything they have in their horde will be free for you to take, said Naruto, making Thalia and Bianca frown, but reluctantly not an understanding. Fine, but if I end up being turned into a tree again or actually dying this time, I will haunt your ass, whiskers. Thalia warned, with the Yuzumaki smirking at her, before he looked down at Naiko to see he'd fallen asleep from exhaustion. Well I suppose we can stop training for the day. But first said Naruto as he punched the tree beside him, with the three awake demigods hearing a scream as Anabit fell out, with Naruto catching her before she hit the ground. Were you planning on staying up there all day? Naruto asked rhetorically, while the daughter of Athena blushed lightly upon seeing she was being carried in his arms, before she scowled at him. I was working out a plan to hit you Anabit retorted, having already failed several previous attempts at hitting him. 
having tried attacking from behind, the sides, even charging at him from the front when he least expected it. But each of her attempts failed as he'd block her attacks, and then toss her aside, forcing her to try again, leading to Annabeth hiding in the bushes or behind trees, waiting until his guard was dropped to strike, only to once again fail. Even when she tried distracting him, she still couldn't land a single hit on the whiskered redeed. Before the daughter of Athena decided to try striking from above, having gone and climbed up a tree, moving into a position where she could tackle him from above, only to grow worried that her attempt would fail again, leading to her trying to think of a plan to succeed. But each plan she thought of was discarded, doubting any would work. Annabeth was a little embarrassed that she'd been so deep in thought trying to make a plan, she forgot she was even in the tree until it started shaking and she fell out, her annoyance only growing at realizing Naruto was the one who made her fall. And that's your problem. You got worried none of your plans would work after all your other failed attempts and began overthinking it, losing focus on what you were supposed to be doing and instead trying to make a plan, said Naruto while setting Annabeth down, with Thalia and Bianca looking at her in annoyance with how she was carried by the Yuzumaki. Well how am I supposed to get a hit on you, when everything I've tried hasn't worked? Annabeth retorted, knowing it impossible for her to actually hit Naruto. Then try something you wouldn't normally do, be unexpected and shocking. All of your attempts have been expected and predictable, which won't always work. A surprise attack won't work if an enemy is already expecting it. So, don't go for the surprise attack, go for something that will shock them so you can get in close and attack before they can react. Naruto replied, making the blonde demigod frown thoughtfully. Naruto then grabbed Naiko and lifted him over his shoulder, before looking at the three female demigods. Training's done for today. Rest up and meet back here tomorrow. And prepared since we won't always be doing the same training every day, said Naruto, with the three nodding before they left the forest. Time skip one day. The next day, Thalia, Annabeth, Bianca and Naiko returned to the forest with Naruto already there waiting for them. The demigods immediately noticed several targets set up, either being attached to trees, hanging from them by ropes, and some even hidden behind bushes and boulders. I'm guessing we'll be working on target practice today, Annabeth stated, before quickly catching two pouches Naruto tossed at her. You'll be working on target practice today since you're the only one without a means of long-range attacks, while Bianca and Naiko will be learning to use swords, said Naruto, tossing two training swords at the siblings. Sweet Naiko said smiling excitedly at learning to use a sword, while Bianca looked unsurely at the weapon. Are you sure? There aren't any other weapons we could try, like something easier and less dangerous, Bianca asked preferring if they started with something smaller, like a dagger or even a bow. Once you get a good grasp of using a sword, then we'll move on to other weapons before settling one whichever one you feel most comfortable with. Naruto replied, making the brunette sigh before nodding in response. Does that mean I'll still be working on walking up a tree? Said Thalia only for the Yuzumaki to smirk at her. No, you're gonna be sparring with me in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Naruto said, making the daughter of Zeus smirk as well. Now we're speaking my language, Thalia stated, eager to see how he fights without any weapon or powers. Though when Naruto's smirk widened and he began chuckling darkly, Thalia wasn't sure if she should be nervous or excited. Say that again once we get started. And just some friendly advice, my father is also the god of wrestling, said Naruto, causing the ravenette to gulp a little. Why am I using these? Annabeth asked, making the other turn to her, only to see her holding the pouches in one hand while in her other. She was holding a kunai and shuriken. Shouldn't I try using a bow? Said Annabeth, not expecting him to have her use kunai and shuriken. No, as that'd be expected. Well, these would be a surprise, since it's unlikely anyone would expect a demigod to use kunai and shuriken. Plus, they're a lot more useful than a bow and arrows. Replied Naruto, while the other demigods looked at Annabeth's weapons curiously. How? Annabeth said, not seeing how they were better than a bow. For starters you save time drawing an arrow and aiming it, while with these you just grab them and throw. You can also use the kunai as close range weapons, and with shuriken, they can do this. Naruto said, grabbing some shuriken out of the pouch. The demigods then watched as Naruto threw each of the shuriken through the air, surprised when they all curved and stabbed right through one target for each shuriken. Even more amazing was that he didn't even look at where they were. With a bow, you need a direct line of sight to a target to hit them. With a shuriken you just need to know where they are, 
and get the right angle to hit them. Which I'm sure you'll be able to figure out how to get the right angle and trajectory, said Naruto, with Annabeth looking at the weapons in renewed interest before her eyes widened in surprise when she saw the shuriken pouch was refilled. Are these magic? Questioned Annabeth, looking at the targets he hit, only to see the shuriken disappeared from them. Enchanted, anytime you throw them they'll return to the pouches instantly. They'll also never lose their edge, so no worries of needing to keep them sharp. And yes, they do work on monsters. Naruto replied, much to the blonde's amazement before she smiled gratefully. Thank you. These will really come in handy, said Annabeth before strapping the kunai pouch to her right thigh and the shuriken pouch to the back of her pants. Can we get started now? Bianca asked, while giving Annabeth an annoyed side glare at being given something like that. Yes, Annabeth stand here and don't move, you're going to try and hit as many bullseyes as you can without moving from this spot, said Naruto, motioning to where the daughter of Athena would stand. Moving to the spot, Annabeth frowned as she looked around to all the targets, only to see she couldn't see where all of them were. Knowing that she'll need to curve the shuriken through the air if she wanted to hit them, Annabeth began going through all the target locations, and how she'll need to hit them. Now, let's get started on you two, Naruto said, turning to Bianca and Naiko, before grabbing his own training sword to show them how to use it. Later, after showing Bianca and Naiko the basics of wielding a sword, as well as some beginner moves, Naruto had them spar against each other, knowing it'll help them start building experience in fighting with a sword, along with how they'll know everything the other did they'd need to improvise and change how they fight to gain an advantage. Naruto then went to spar against Thalia in hand-to-hand -hand combat, with them being allowed to use any means of attacking to win, as long as they didn't use weapons or powers. With the Ravenette soon learning the whiskered redeed was just as skilled with his fists as he was with a weapon. Again said Thalia, grunting as she stood up after getting knocked to the ground, again. You sure you don't want to take a Naruto said before raising his hand, and grabbed Thalia's fist when she charged him and threw a punch. Not stopping there, Thalia thrust her other fist at Naruto, only for it to be grabbed as well before she could punch him, only for the daughter of Zeus to then lift her knee up, slamming it into his abdomen, making the Yuzumaki grunt. With this giving Thalia the chance to rear her head back and immediately headbutt Naruto, knocking them both away from each other. Ah oh, gods damn it why would anyone do that? Thalia said while holding her head in pain, not expecting it to hurt that much, feeling like she just headbutted a brick wall. Though this cost Thalia, with the Yuzumaki recovering faster and immediately rushed her, slamming his elbow into her head, further dazing the Ravenette. Before Naruto then grabbed Thalia by her shoulders, before spinning around and throwing her towards a tree. With Thalia gritting her teeth when she slammed into the tree and fell to the ground, before forcing herself back to her feet. Doing so just in time to raise her arms to block Naruto's punch, gritting her teeth again at the impact, with her then quickly grabbing his arm. The Ravenette moving quickly as she moved behind the Yuzumaki, twisting his arm as she do so. Before she grabbed his other arm and twisted it as well, followed by slamming her feet into the back of his knees, knocking him to the ground. Ha, I finally got Thalia said with a pleased smirk at bringing him down to his knees, only for her to be cut off when Naruto managed to twist his hands around and grab her arms as well before kicking one of his legs and knocking her feet out from under her. With Thalia having no time to react as she was flipped through the air and slamming into the ground, knocking the wind out of her. The female demigod then finding herself pinned when Naruto rolled on top of her, pinning her arms and legs. Next time you have an enemy on their knees and their arms pulled behind them, don't gloat. Keep pushing the advantage and either break their arms or kick them hard enough to fracture their spine. Either way they'll be crippled and helpless. If an enemy can still fight, then the fight isn't over. Naruto said, making Thalia grunt in annoyance while trying to break free, only for his grip to remain firm. Noted can you get off of me now? Thalia asked, with Naruto smirking at her. I don't know, I rather like seeing you underneath me, said Naruto. The daughter of Zeus smirked slyly up at him. Oh, do you imagine being on top of me a lot? Said Thalia with a flirting tone. Do you imagine getting me on my knees? You certainly seemed excited when you did. Naruto replied with his smirk turning into a teasing one. What can I say? I like the idea of having you at my mercy. Thalia said, only to gulp when Naruto's smirk grew. Maybe I'd be at your mercy Thalia, but rest assured you'd be the one begging, said Naruto, with the Ravenette's eyes widening, while a faint blush appeared on her cheeks. That's hot, thought Thalia, shamelessly. Are you two done? Bianca asked with an annoyed expression, really not liking the position Naruto and Thalia were in or how they were talking. Uh, Bianca said Naiko nervously, seeing how the shadows were beginning to lash out around them. Not now, Naiko said Bianca, turning to her brother, 
her eyes turning a sulfuric golden yellow with black sclera, making the son of Hades instantly backing away, ready to shadow travel to escape if he needed to. While Naruto chuckled in amusement at Bianca's behavior before getting off of Thalia, much to the Ravenette's hidden disappointment. Don't worry Bianca, we'll be doing hand-to-hand -hand combat training too, eventually. Maybe you'll get me on my knees, or I'll get you on yours, said Naruto, making Bianca blush brightly. Or someone will be on their back, Bianca muttered, which only made her blush intensify. The same goes for Annie, if you're fine with it getting rough, Naruto said to the daughter of Athena, making Annabeth stumble slightly and miss her throw. What? Annabeth said, looking at him with white eyes and a faint blush, having been completely focused on her throws to notice anything else. Well, I don't want you to feel left out. Thalia already got me on my knees, but I put her on her back soon after, and Bianca was getting jealous at being left out but I made sure she knows she'll get her turn soon. But I'll make sure you get your turn as well, unless you'd want to try together with Thalia or Bianca, said Naruto, with Annabeth's blush getting brighter with each word. What? said Annabeth, not believing what she's hearing, while glancing at Bianca and Thalia, both of whom were also blushing, though Thalia also had a smirk on her face. Sparring Annie, sparring. I want to make sure you and Bianca know I'll be sparring with both of you in hand-to-hand -hand combat as well, not just with Thalia. Naruto clarified with a smirk, while Annabeth's eyes widened before she glared at him. You Annabeth said, feeling sorely tempted to throw a kunai at him. What else did you think I was talking about? Could little Annie not be so innocent, after all? Naruto asked teasingly, making the daughter of Athena growl. You knew exactly what you were doing said Annabeth, making the Yuzumaki chuckle. What can I say, you three look cute being all flustered like that, Naruto said, which made the girls blush again. Dad, if you can hear me help Naiko thought, mentally praying to his father to get him out of the situation. But in all seriousness, all of you will be sparring with me, against each other, and together, both with weapons, powers, or hand to hand. That way you'll also work on being able to coordinate with each other to take down your opponent, said Naruto. Looking at them, with the four demigods nodding in response, while Thalia smirked. You sure you could handle all three of us together? Whiskers, we might be too much for you to handle. Thalia said, making Annabeth and Bianca blush at the double meaning behind her words. Then you three will need to try really hard if you want to beat me. Because unless I can't get back up, then you won't win. Replied Naruto. Then get on your back and stay there. Someone said, with Naruto suddenly feel the urge to fall down to his back before shaking his head and looked around. You'll need to do better than that Naruto said while looking for who did that, before the demigods heard giggling and saw Selina leaning against a tree. Can't blame a girl for trying to get you on the ground, Foxy, said Selina, surprised and impressed he was able to resist her charm speak. If you want me on the ground that much, you'll need to do a lot more than ask nicely, Naruto said, smirking at Selina, making her smile suggestively. I'm sure I can think of a few ideas, Selina replied while walking up to them. How long were you standing there? Annabeth asked while feeling some slight annoyance at Selina's appearance, with Bianca and Thalia feeling the same. Long enough to see how all of you have been training. I was also here, yesterday, since I was curious of the training Naruto would be giving you all. And it's certainly impressive, especially that you managed to resist my charm speak. How do you do that anyway? Selina asked, knowing her charm speak was the strongest of all her mother's demigod children, even Drew's wasn't as strong as hers. And she knew the only way someone could resist charm speak is if they're incredibly strong-willed, and even then they'd still feel some effect before shaking it off. Yet it looked like Naruto wasn't affected at all. You shouldn't have expected it to work at all, someone said, making the demigods turn to see who it was, only to see Artemis stepping out from behind a tree. Finally decided to stop hiding, kid too, said Naruto, frowning at the moon goddess, while the other demigods turned to him. You knew she was there? Bianca asked, with Naruto nodding in response. Yes, along with no she was there yesterday. Any particular reason you feel the need to spy on us? Naruto said, with Artemis frowning that he knew she was here. It is my responsibility to watch you, as well as ensuring nothing untoward happens while you're with three young maidens, said Artemis, having made sure to watch Naruto, both since that's the reason she's here, and she wanted to make sure he didn't try anything with Bianca Thalia, or Annabeth. This made Bianca Thalia, and Annabeth frown that she thought Naruto would actually try something with them, only to look at Naruto, when he began chuckling and smiled in amusement at Artemis. I'm sure it must be such a shock to you, kid too. What with your whole men are evil spiel, but I'm helping them train because they're my friends, 
and I want to make sure they can take care of themselves, Naruto said, making the demigod smile while Anabeth and Thalia were happy, though slightly annoyed, to hear he considered them as friends. Yet you come out into the forest to train rather than remaining in the camp, itself. Despite knowing the dangers of what's in here, it instead makes you look rather reckless and uncaring if something happens to them. Artemis retorted, with Naruto's smile never wavering, and yet nothing has happened and nothing will happen. Given that Thalia and Annabeth are more than capable of dealing with any monsters in the forest, while Bianca and Naiko can at least shadow travel away back to camp. Perhaps if you thought more about that, rather than jumping to conclusions, you'd actually see none of them are in any danger. But then again you are a kid. So I guess you're used to only seeing what's right in front of you, Naruto said, much to Artemis's annoyance. The only thing I see right now is an arrogant, patronizing boy said Artemis, causing Naruto's smile to turn into a smirk. If by patronizing you mean helping a child understand why she shouldn't jump to conclusions, then yes I'm very patronizing, kid too. And do you really want to talk to me about arrogance? Aren't you the ones that live on top of a mountain? just so you can physically and metaphorically look down on everyone, replied Naruto, with Artemis narrowing her eyes at him. Though before she could say anything, the son of Thor turned towards Selina, with her and the other demigods, having been watching everything silently with white eyes, wondering how he could talk back against a goddess like Artemis without any fear or concern. But I suppose Kid 2 is right about one thing, charm speak won't work that easily on me, since my mind is just as strong as the rest of me. I'm also no stranger to illusions and know how to resist them, said Naruto, much to their curiosity at how he's dealt with illusions before. Charm speak is more like hypnotism than an illusion, said Selina, only for Naruto to shrug. Hypnotism is just another form of illusions, you make someone do what you want against their will or them even realizing what's happening. But that's rather basic, you could have it be much more powerful than simply giving a command. You could say something and make a person believe they're nothing but a helpless infant, or that they're at the bottom of the ocean. If you can target a person's mind, then you can make them see, hear, smell, taste, or feel anything, and the only limit is your own imagination. Naruto explained, with the demigods being amazed, especially Selina at the potential ways she could use charm speak before she smiled at Naruto. Is that your own way of offering to train me, as well? Selina asked, causing Bianca, Thalia, and Annabit to gain annoyed expressions that she would join their training. Besides charm speak what else can you do? Naruto asked, wanting to know what other abilities she had. I'm an expert Pegasus writer, and I have some knowledge of magic, along with knowing how to use a dagger. As for the abilities I inherited from my mom, I can alter my appearance, but it's limited to just changing my hair and eye color. I can control and alter clothes, jewelry, and makeup, and I have minor skills in love magic. And all of Aphrodite's children can speak French, since it's the language of love. Selena replied, with Naruto nodding at this. You certainly do have potential. Even just changing your hair and eye color is good to be able to vanish in a crowd, allowing you to either escape pursuers or get the drop on them. Even more so, if you use your charm speak to make them forget what you look like at all. And having control over clothes and jewelry can be very dangerous, said Naruto, only to look at Thalia when she laughed lightly. Uh, no offense Selina, but how is that a dangerous ability? Thalia asked only to fall silent at Naruto's unamused expression. Imagine those necklaces you wear suddenly becoming a garret wire, a bracelet wrapping around your arm, and preventing you from reaching for a weapon, or your clothes shrinking and becoming too tight to where you can't even move. Just because a power doesn't seem like it'd be useful doesn't mean it's useless. Naruto said, making Thalia frown while Selina smiled at hearing her abilities being praised even if they weren't the most combat-oriented ones. Right, muttered Thalia before looking at Naruto when he put a hand on her shoulder. This is so you don't underestimate any enemy, regardless of what powers they have. You never know if a seemingly useless power can prove more dangerous than controlling an element, said Naruto, with the daughter of Zeus nodding in response. Now though, we'll be taking a break, as it's almost time for lunch, as well as Bianca's and Naiko's lessons. Selina, if you want to join the training then meet us back here after their lessons are over. Naruto, making the demigods nod before they left the forest. With Artemis watching the son of Thor with narrowed eyes, before leaving as well. Later, thou art progressing well, Andromeda, Zoe stated, watching with a pleased expression at how Andromeda was progressing with using a bow with the daughter of Poseidon smiling and thanks the lieutenant. Thanks Zo. I really thought it'd take me a lot longer to even get close to hitting a target, but now it just feels completely natural using a bow, said Andromeda shooting another arrow, which hit just outside of the bullseye. 
It's like that for a lot of the hunters, especially the newer ones. Most of them have never even picked up a bow, let alone learned to use one. But the moment they received Lady Artemis's blessing, they were shooting like they've been doing it for years, all in less than a month. Phoebe said, knowing it can be surprising for new hunters to suddenly gain skill over a weapon they've never used before. Indeed. But it's important that you all keep training, as my blessing only gets you so far before you grow stagnate. While you may be skilled now shooting at stationary targets, aiming at moving prey is far more difficult, said Artemis, with several hunters nodding in agreement with their mistress. I understand, Lady Artemis, though it'll be nice to actually have something to hit monsters from a longer distance, rather than waiting for them to reach me. Andromeda said, preferring the chance to be able to kill monsters from a distance, than always fighting up close. Not that it'd matter if you're too slow. Someone said, causing multiple hunters to immediately aim their bows at who spoke with a few releasing their arrows when they saw it was Naruto leaning against a tree, only for the arrows to bounce off his lightning shield. Like I said, too slow, said Naruto, making Artemis and her hunters scowl at him. What are you doing here? Artemis demanded, not liking that he's watching her hunters train. Well, since you were watching my own training, I figured you wouldn't mind me watching yours. Naruto said, pushing off the tree and approaching the hunters, only for Artemis to stand in front of him. Yes, I do mind, now leave, said Artemis, refusing to let him continue watching her hunters. All right, I understand if you don't want me around, Naruto said before purposefully walking around the goddess, much to her growing annoyance. Why aren't you leaving? demanded Artemis, having thought he'd leave now. Oh, I said, I understand you don't want me around, but I didn't say I'd leave, because I don't listen to kids, kid too, replied Naruto, annoying and angering Artemis even more, only to stop again when Zo held one of her knives to his throat. 